Teresa of Avila, The Book of My Life. Prologue. If only someone would invite me to make a detailed list of all the things I have done wrong in my life. Instead, I have been asked to freely describe my spiritual practice and to record all the blessings my Lord has showered on me. I would be so much more comfortable disclosing my imperfections, but I have taken a vow of obedience that forces me to keep those things to myself. All I can do is to beg you who are reading this account of my life to please, for the love of God, bear in mind that it has been much more wicked than I am at liberty to say. In fact, I keep searching among all the saints, studying the stories of their awakenings, looking for even one who can serve as a role model for me. But no, once God called them, they never turned away from him again. I, on the other hand, grew even worse. I seem to have made it my personal mission to do whatever I could to deny every blessing he has bestowed on me. I knew that I should strive to serve him better. But I also knew that I myself was powerless to offer my beloved what he deserved. May he, who has waited so long for me, be forever blessed. I ask him now with the whole of my heart to give me the grace of absolute clarity and perfect truth so that I may write this account of my life as I have been asked to do. I have felt for a long time that my Lord wanted me to write this, but I have not dared to begin until now. May this writing be an offering of praise and glory to my Lord. May it help my spiritual guides to know me better and so to better support my spiritual development. May I find the strength now to give back even a fraction of the great gifts I have received from God. And may he be adored by all things forever. Amen. Part 1. My Turbulent Youth Chapter 1. A Child's Passion for God There was no valid reason for me to be so wicked. My parents were righteous people who revered God, and God granted me the option of being good as well. I had all the help I needed to curtail my negative tendencies, but I was incorrigible. My father loved good books. He had some that were written in Spanish so his children could read them, and they had a positive influence on me. My mother made sure that we all said our prayers and offered devotion to Our Lady and to certain saints. When I was around six or seven years old, Exposure to these holy things began to stir something in me. It helped that I never saw either of my parents act with anything other than integrity. They were both blessed with many virtues. My father, for instance, had great compassion for the poor and sympathy for the sick. He was kind to his servants and could not bear to keep slaves. In fact, when one of his brother's Moorish slaves was staying at our house, my father treated her like one of his own children. He couldn't stand it that she was not free, he said. My father spoke only the truth. Nobody ever heard him swear or gossip. He was a profoundly decent man. My mother, too, was a deeply virtuous woman and absolutely honest. She struggled with illness throughout her life. Even though she was incredibly beautiful, she never paid attention to her looks. In fact, by the time she died at age 33, she was already dressing with the dignity of a much more mature woman. My mother was deeply serene and exceptionally intelligent. She endured terrible trials during her time on this earth, but she died in the fullness of Christ's love. We were a family of three sisters and nine brothers, and by the grace of God, all were as virtuous as our parents, except for me. Even so, I was my father's favorite. There actually might have been some reason for this at one time. Before I started rebelling against God, I believed that God had given me some very good inclinations. It causes me such pain now to remember how I took these blessings for granted and did not make use of them. I loved all my brothers and sisters, and they loved me. They certainly never stood in my way or prevented me from serving God. I had one brother close to my own age whom I loved best of all. 
We used to read the lives of the saints together. When I read about certain women saints who endured martyrdom for the sake of God, I concluded that death was a small price to pay for the utter joy they were given in return when they were whisked away to heaven. I desperately wanted to die like this. Not out of holy devotion, at least not that I was aware of, but from sheer urgency to get a hold of the sublime fruits that my books promised were stored up for me. My brother and I would discuss how we could best make martyrs of ourselves. We decided to head off to the country of the Moors, begging bread along the way, and ask them to please, for the love of God, chop off our heads. I believe that our Lord had given us, even at such a tender age, the courage to follow up on our plan. The only thing stopping us was the fact that we had parents. You know how it is said that both pain and glory are eternal? My brother and I used to spend hours pondering this together. Forever, we would say, forever, forever. It seemed that my frequent repetition of this phrase knocked on God's door and offered me a lasting glimpse of the way of truth when I was only a small child. When I finally accepted that there was nowhere I could go where I could convince them to kill me for the sake of God, my brother and I decided to become holy hermits. In the small orchard behind our house, we would pile up stones to build our hermitages. But they immediately came tumbling down, thwarting our project over and over again. Even now, as I remember how young I was, when God gave me the precious gift of devotion, I am filled with sadness to see how I lost it along the way through my own carelessness. As much as I could, which was not much at all, I gave alms to the poor. I tried to be alone whenever I said my prayers, and I prayed often. My mother had a disciplined practice of saying the rosary, and she inspired the same commitment in us. When I played with other little girls, I loved to pretend that we were building convents to live in. I think I always wanted to be a nun, but unfortunately I wanted other things more. When I was around 12 years old, my mother died. When it began to dawn on me what I had lost, I was overcome by grief. Weeping uncontrollably, I threw myself at the feet of an image of Our Lady and pleaded with her to be my mother now. It seems to me that even though I made this prayer with naive simplicity, she answered me. I have found that whenever I have placed myself in her circle of mercy, the Blessed Mother has turned to unfold me. It disturbs me deeply now to see that somewhere along the way, I abandoned so many of the good impulses I had begun to cultivate. Oh, my beloved, it appears that you are determined to save me. May it please you to do it. You have already poured such a bounty of blessings upon me. What I don't understand is why you have allowed this dwelling of my soul where you have chosen to live, to remain in such a terrible mess. It's not for my own advantage that I ask, but for your honor and glory. Why am I even saying this? I already know it's my own fault. You did everything you could possibly do from the time I was very young to make me fully yours. I can't blame my parents either, since all I ever saw in them was pure goodness and concern for my well-being. As I passed through childhood, I began to become aware of the many natural graces my Lord had bestowed on me. Instead of giving thanks for these gifts, I started to use them against him, as I will now explain. Chapter 2 Falling Dangerously in Love What I am about to disclose is a reflection of the period, it seems to me, when I began to do myself harm. Sometimes I think it is negligent for parents not to set up every possible obstacle in the lives of their children to prevent them from being exposed to anything but virtue. My mother, as I mentioned, was a very good woman herself, but as I grew older, I did very little, almost nothing, in fact, to emulate her goodness. Instead, I seemed to be inexorably drawn toward bad things, which started to do damage to my soul. My mother was very fond of romance novels, and so was I. But they did not have the negative effects on her they had on me. For one thing, she never allowed them to interfere with her work. 
Her children, on the other hand, were always stealing time to read. My mother allowed this indulgence partly because it kept us occupied and so lightened her own load a little, and partly because she herself found sweet escape from the many trials she suffered in the pages of those books. This pastime of ours annoyed my father to such a degree that we went to great lengths to make sure that he did not catch us doing it. But what was for my mother a harmless habit became a raging addiction for me. Any impulse I had toward goodness began to cool, and I started looking for trouble. I didn't think there was anything wrong with my wasting long hours, day and night, in such a useless enterprise as devouring these insipid tales, even though I had to hide it from my father. I became so intensely immersed in reading romances that unless I had a new book lined up behind the last one, I was not happy. Then I started taking inordinate pride in my appearance. I dressed in the latest fashions, doused myself with perfumes, pampered my hands, and fussed with my hair. I was fastidious and vain, grasping for all the trinkets I could find to enhance my beauty. My intentions were not dishonorable in the sense that I would never have wanted anyone to offend God because of me, but I was overly concerned about how I looked and smelled and seemed. These things did not feel sinful to me, and so I spent years preoccupied with them. My father was very careful about who was allowed into our house, but we had some questionable cousins who visited often. Oh, if only he had been careful about those cousins as well. In retrospect, I see how dangerous it is to allow children to be exposed to certain influences just at the time when the seeds of their virtues are starting to germinate. It's not that such people are wicked in themselves, but they have a way of arousing wicked desires in others. Like me. The cousins were around my age, some a little older. We spent most of our time together. They adored me, and I made it my project to amuse with my conversation and offer my rapt attention whenever they recounted their own inane escapades. There was nothing worthwhile in these exchanges. In fact, even worse, I began to feel my soul being pulled into a vortex of evil. If I were to offer some advice to parents, it would be this. Pay attention to who it is that your children are associating with. Bad company can do a great deal of damage. And young people are naturally inclined to follow what is worse for them rather than what is best. This was certainly the case for me. My sister Maria was much older than I was. Even though she was honest and kind and pure of heart, I learned nothing from her. Instead, I studied every kind of wickedness from an older relative of mine who was often in our house. This cousin was so frivolous and superficial that it irritated my mother to have her around. Really, I think my mother must have had some idea of what a negative effect this girl was having on me. But there were so many reasons for her to be there that it was no use trying to keep her away. We gossiped constantly and confided our deepest secrets to one another. She accompanied me in all the things I'd like to do and introduced me to activities I had never dreamed of. When I was around 14, I began to grow even closer to this cousin. I had never before committed a mortal sin, not so much out of fear of God as from concern about my own reputation. This obsession with my image is what prevented me from losing my honor altogether. To tell the truth, I don't think there was anything or anyone I loved enough in the whole world to justify surrendering my virtue. My innate attachment to my own honor probably would have kept me from going against the honor of God in any case. What I didn't realize was all the subtle ways in which I was sacrificing my honor every day. I couldn't have cared less about the deeper meanings of virtue and integrity, but I did go to great lengths to make sure that my image and reputation remained intact. All I really cared about was that I not pass the point of no return. My father and my older sister were not at all pleased by my association with this cousin of mine, and they made no secret of their disapproval. But since there was nothing they could do to stop her from coming over, their protesting my friendship with her did no good at all. Besides, when it came to figuring out ways to do bad things, I was extremely clever. If I had not experienced it myself, I would not believe how seriously one person can poison another's soul. This is particularly problematic when a person is young. 
Listen to me, parents, and beware. My connection with this young woman changed me completely. I lost almost all of my motivation to do good in the world. Plus, the relationship opened the door for me to associate with another person who influenced me to do even more dangerous things. If only I had associated with worthy companions at that age. If only I had been around peers who modeled devotion to God. Then I might have retained my virtue. Then my soul might have grown strong enough not to stumble and fall. Finally, all fear of God drained out of me, and what was left was this vain concern for my worldly reputation, which tortured me. But as long as I thought no one noticed, this worry did not prevent me from doing all kinds of things to risk offending God and shaming myself. My behavior began to take on a self-destructive quality. I cannot blame my cousins for this. It was my own fault. After a while, my own wicked inclinations were more than enough to lead me into trouble. Our servants did little to protect me from myself. In fact, they seemed to encourage my wild antics. If any of them had attempted to guide me back on track, I might have paid attention to them and avoided all kinds of grief. But they were as blinded by their own interests as I was by desire. Still, something in me always prevented me from falling into utter disgrace. The truth is, I was an essentially modest girl who preferred the company of wholesome people. Whenever an opportunity came along to do something truly deceitful, I worried about the effect it might have on my father and my brothers. God, it seems, did not want to lose me. Against my will, he delivered me from danger, but not before I did grave damage to my coveted reputation. My private escapades were turning out to be not as private as I believed. Not even three months had gone by since I began to experiment with these rebellious behaviors. When my father began to suspect what I had been doing, he sent me off to Our Lady of Grace, a nearby Augustinian convent. It was a place where young people like me, though far less extreme in their misdeeds, could stay out of trouble and receive an education. We managed to keep the real reason for my leaving concealed from almost everyone except a few close relatives. They had been looking for an excuse to send me away, and finally they found one. My sister had married and moved away. I had no mother. And a girl in my position could not be expected to live alone without the care of an older woman. The convent was deemed the only proper place for me. My father's love for me was so unconditional and my skills of deception so refined that he never accepted that my behavior had been anything other than harmless. And so, though I deserved it, I never fell out of my father's favor. It had not been going on long enough for me to arouse too much suspicion. I had made such an effort to conceal my sins and preserve my good name that although my relatives had some idea of what was going on, nothing could be proven. What I forgot to take into consideration is that nothing is secret from the one who sees all things. Oh, my beloved. We do such harm in this world when we forget this. Such harm when we believe that there is anything we can do to dishonor you that you will not notice. I'm sure we would avoid a great deal of suffering if we could just remain mindful of you at all times and protect ourselves, not from other human beings, but from our own negative impulses which lead us to neglect you. For my first week at Our Lady of Grace, I was miserable. It wasn't the place that upset me, but the fear that everyone suspected what a shallow girl I was. You see, I was already growing weary of the superficial values I had been embracing. And I had never really stopped holding God in my heart. The minute I missed the mark, I was always rushing to atone for it. In the beginning of my time in the convent, I was terribly restless. But soon I found myself happier than I had ever been at my father's house. My beloved gave me the grace to delight people wherever I went, and so it was not long before I became a favorite of the nuns. I still had absolutely no desire to be a nun myself. In fact, I felt a tremendous aversion to the prospect. But I was pleased to see such goodness in the nuns who lived in that house. They all seemed to be pure of heart and utterly devoted to a life of prayer. 
But in spite of this excellent buffer against worldly temptation, the spirit of evil managed to continue taunting me for a while. My friends on the outside unsettled me with a flurry of secret messages. This kind of communication was forbidden, however, which finally allowed me to settle into the rhythms of monastic life, undistracted. The holy inclinations of my early childhood began to return. I could see what a great gift God gives us when He places us in the company of good souls. It seems to me that His Majesty was searching high and low for ways to bring me to Himself. Blessed are you, O Lord, who have put up with me for so long. Amen. There is one thing that may serve as a partial excuse for my many faults. I believe that my intimacy with that unsavory cousin of mine would come to a natural end with her imminent marriage. My spiritual director and other people have assured me that I never did anything to truly set myself against God. Soon, God sent his light in the form of a certain nun who oversaw the dormitory where the secular girls slept to begin showing me the way. Chapter 3 our Lady of Grace. I began to enjoy talking with that nun I mentioned. Our conversations felt sacred. I loved listening to her speak about God. She was simultaneously witty and wise. She never failed to hold my interest. Simply reading that part in the Gospel where the evangelist says, Many are called, but few are chosen, is what drew me into monastic life, she told me. She described the great treasure the Lord shares with those who leave everything for Him. This excellent friendship started to displace the bad habits that had been forming in me. My thoughts drifted back toward God, and my desire for eternal things was returning. I no longer felt that terrible aversion toward the notion of becoming a nun, a feeling I had been convinced would never leave me. Whenever I witness one of the sisters weeping as she prayed or any other overtly spiritual demonstration, I would suffer a wave of envy. To my unending dismay, my own heart was so hardened that even if I read the entire story of Christ's crucifixion, I could not manage to squeeze out a single holy tear. I stayed at Our Lady of Grace for a year and a half, and it did me a great deal of good. I learned to recite some beautiful prayers. I asked the nuns to intercede with God on my behalf, asking Him to transform me in such a way that I would be inclined to give over my life in service to Him. He had not yet blessed me with this desire. Still, while I was resistant to the idea of becoming a nun, the prospect of marriage repelled me even more. By the time I left the convent, I had reconciled myself to becoming a nun. But I had decided not to join that particular house. Their spiritual practices were a little too extreme for me. At least, some of the younger girls impressed me this way. If all of the nuns had behaved consistently, it would have been easier for me to find my way. Plus, I had a close friend named Juana Suarez, who lived in another convent, the Incarnation. This gave me the idea that if I was going to live as a nun, I might as well do it with her. As you can see, I was more motivated by sensual gratification and vanity than by any genuine inclination to perfect my soul. In fact, though monastic urges arose in me now and then, I couldn't persuade myself to follow through with them. Around this time, God decided to prepare me for the life that was best for me. It's not that I had been neglecting my spiritual growth, but I obviously needed a little push. He sent me such a serious illness that I was forced to go home to my father's house. When I began to feel better, they took me to see my sister Maria, who lived in a nearby village. My sister loved me so much that if she could have had her way, I never would have left her home. Maria's husband was also very fond of me. At least he treated me with great tenderness. This is my beloved's grace. I am appreciated and treated beautifully wherever I go. I do nothing to earn this except to simply be who I am. My uncle Pedro lived partway between my father's house and my sister's. He was a sensible, virtuous man 
whose soul God seemed to be making ready for himself. Uncle Pedro's wife had died, and in the last part of his life, he decided to give up everything and become a monk. I believe he left this world in such a way that he is now basking in the joy of God. Uncle Pedro wanted me to spend a few days with him and read to him. All he ever wanted to talk about and read about was the glory of God and the vacuity of the world. Even though I was not interested in his books, I pretended to like them just to please him. All my life, I have labored to please people. In others, this might be a virtue, but in me, it has been a serious shortcoming because I have not been discriminating about it. Oh God, save me. In how many ways did you gradually cultivate my soul to be of use to you? And in how many ways did you hold me back against my will until I could learn to hold myself back? May you be blessed forever. Amen. I only stayed with Uncle Pedro for a short time, but the teachings he exposed me to burned an impression on my heart. The Word of God, both written and spoken, blended with my uncle's excellent company to remind me of what I had known as a small child. Everything is nothing. The world is temporary. All things change and pass away. I came to grips with the reality that my recent illness had almost killed me. This brush with death scared me. I wondered if I would have gone to hell for the things I had done. And so, even though I still did not have an authentic desire to be a nun, I concluded that I would be better off as one. Little by little, I forced myself to embrace that path. This struggle went on for three months. I tried to talk myself into it by arguing that the trials and tribulations of monastic life could not possibly be any more difficult than the miseries of purgatory. As it is, I deserved to go straight to hell. Therefore, I reasoned, it was not such a big deal to spend my time in this world as if I were in purgatory if it guaranteed my undisputed entrance into heaven, which is all I had ever really wanted. This important decision, then, turned out to be motivated more by humble terror than by sublime love. A spirit of evil suggested to me that because I had been raised with wealth and comfort, I would not be able to bear the hardships of religious life. But this just made me think about all that Christ had to go through, and I decided that the least I could do would be to endure a few hardships for his sake. Maybe I believed that Christ would help me to bear those things. I can't remember. I was constantly buffeted by doubts in those days. I started suffering high fevers and fainting spells. My health had always been precarious. It was my love of good books that sustained me. The epistles of St. Jerome filled me with the courage to tell my father about my decision to become a nun. Such a confrontation was as significant to me as actually putting on the habit. I was such an earnest person that once I had given my word, nothing could have persuaded me to go back on it. My father was so attached to me that I was never successful in getting him to agree to my plan. Not even the various people I begged to talk to him were able to convince my father to let me go. The best we could get out of him was a reluctant concession that I could do whatever I wanted after he was dead. But I had no faith in my own ability to persevere. I knew that if I did not act quickly, I would lose my resolve. So I found another way to achieve my goal, as I will now describe. Chapter 4 Taking the Habit During the time that I was trying to convince myself to become a nun, I managed to convince my brother Antonio to become a monk. We were in agreement that the world is nothing but an illusion. We decided to take a trip to visit my friend Juana at the Incarnation, and we arranged to meet very early one morning and set out on our journey. I had already surrendered to entering any convent in which I could best serve God. Finally, the scale had tipped, and I was more interested in the good of my soul than in being comfortable. But my primary concern was for my father. 
I wanted so much for him to approve of my decision, and he didn't. I remember that when I left my father's house that day, my distress was so intense that I believed it couldn't be greater if I were actually dying. I still really believe this. It felt like every bone in my body was being wrenched apart. Since my love of God did not compare to the intensity of my love for my family, the strain on my heart was almost more than I could bear. Nothing I could tell myself was enough to keep me on course. I was going to require divine assistance, which I did receive. The Lord gave me the fortitude to fight against myself, and I was able to follow through with my plan. The moment I took the habit, the Beloved demonstrated to me the great rewards He grants to those who wage war against their small selves in service to Him. But my inner battles were invisible to everyone else. No one guessed that my taking vows was motivated by anything less than pure desire. As it turned out, entering this new life filled me with a joy so complete that it has never left me. God transmuted the aridity of my soul into the deepest tenderness. Everything about the religious life delighted me. I would be perfectly content merely sweeping the floors. All of a sudden, it would occur to me that the time I was spending on these simple tasks was the same time I used to waste indulging and decorating myself. When I realized that I was now free of these things, a new wave of joy rose in my heart. I was shocked by its intensity and could not imagine where it came from. All I have to do is remember moments like these and I realize that there is nothing, no matter how difficult, that I would hesitate to do for my beloved if it were put before me. Experience has shown me that if I bolster my determination for his sake alone, he will bless me, not with increased certainty, but with deeper doubt. Then when I achieve my goal, the reward is all the sweeter. Not in the world to come, but in this very lifetime. Only those who have tasted these joys can understand what I mean. I have had many such experiences. Some involved very serious matters. And so if I were asked for my advice, I would say this. If a worthy inspiration arises in you, never hesitate to manifest it. Do not let fear rule your actions. If you give yourself over to God and practice detachment, there is no reason to be afraid that things won't turn out. God is all-powerful. May He be blessed forever. Amen. Enough. Oh, supreme good. Oh, my refuge. All the blessings you have given me up till now should be enough for me. After all, your mercy and your magnificence have guided me through so many winding paths to this place of safety. I am surrounded by those who live only to serve you, who inspire me to grow in greater service to you. When I remember the profound determination with which I made my vows and the sweet satisfaction I felt when I gave myself to you, my beloved, in holy matrimony, I can barely go on. I cannot speak of this without crying. And my tears should be tears of blood. My heart should shatter. Even that would not be enough to demonstrate the sorrow I feel for the terrible ways I have treated you since that day so long ago. Now I think that maybe I was right to have resisted such an honor since I have taken it for granted so badly. But you, my beloved, were willing to wait almost twenty years for me, during which time I made poor use of your many blessings, because you knew that eventually I would come around. It seems as if I made a point of breaking every promise I made to you, although that was never my conscious intention. Actually, when I look back on all this, I have no idea what my intentions were. All it does is prove the difference between your nature and mine, my spouse. My only solace in the face of this shame is the knowledge that I have served as a living example to the multitudes of your tender mercies. I can't think of anyone to better illustrate the radiance of your compassion than myself, I who buried the blessings you had begun to give to me under the shroud of my bad deeds. 
Oh, my creator. It would be useless for me to try to make excuses. I have no one but myself to blame. I could never repay you even a fraction of the boundless love you have shown me. Maybe if I had tried, my effort would have remedied this broken situation. But I did not deserve a remedy, nor have I been lucky enough to receive one. And so, my beloved, may you take mercy on me now. My new life brought many changes, including in my diet, which affected my health. Although I was exceedingly happy, this was not enough to cure me. I kept fainting all the time, and the frequent pains in my heart alarmed everyone who witnessed them. I spent my entire first year at the Incarnation suffering from innumerable mysterious ailments. At least my poor health did not leave me with much energy left over to offend God. I began to spend more time unconscious than awake. My condition grew so serious that my father was absolutely determined to find me a cure. Our local doctors were out of ideas, and so my father arranged to take me to a healer who lived in my sister's village and had a reputation for successfully treating difficult diseases. The incarnation was not cloistered, so Juana, who was senior nun there, was able to accompany me to Maria's house, where I was to stay during my course of treatment. The healing was supposed to begin in early summer, but I left the incarnation to go to my sister's in late fall so that I would not have to keep coming and going. During the year that I was there, I spent three months undergoing treatments so drastic that they nearly killed me. I don't know how I survived. Actually, my constitution took such a beating from these so-called cures that their effects did permanent damage, as you will see. On the way to my sister's village, we stopped in to see my Uncle Pedro. He gave me a copy of The Third Spiritual Alphabet by Francisco de Osuna. This book is all about the prayer of recollection. In the past year, I had realized what harm my appetite for romance novels had done to my soul, and I had begun to develop a tremendous appreciation for spiritual books. Since I did not know a thing about the practice of contemplative prayer or how to go about recollecting my senses and my thoughts, I was thrilled to find a book that told me exactly what to do. I set out on the path of contemplation with all my might. By now, God had begun to give me the gift of tears, and I would spend hours in solitude, reading and crying. I went to confession frequently. With only my book to guide me, I did the best I could. I couldn't find a spiritual master who understood me, though I spent the next twenty years searching for one. This lack of guidance hurt me. I was constantly backsliding and almost lost my way completely. It would have been helpful if there had been someone who could have at least prevented me from offending God. During these nine months of isolation, His Majesty began to bless me with so many spiritual gifts that I managed to navigate my soul to safety, though not as skillfully as I thought I should. My book indicated that by this point in my practice of prayer, I ought to have gone beyond any opportunity for missing the mark. But it seemed to me that this degree of consciousness was impossible. I was especially reluctant to commit grave errors during this period. Oh, if only I had always been so mindful. But I was careless about avoiding minor transgressions, and this complacency is what ruined me. Still, the Beloved was so generous to me along my way that he actually led me to the prayer of quiet. Once, I even entered the prayer of union. At the time, I had no idea what either of these states meant or how deeply I should cherish them. If I had understood these blessings, it would have done me a great deal more good. It's true that my experience of union may not have lasted any longer than it takes to recite a single Ave Maria, but the effects were so powerful and lingered for so long that I was convinced that I had succeeded in rising above the world altogether, even though I was barely twenty years old. I remember pitying those who were still attached to earthly things, even things that were righteous. When I was in prayer, I would try to keep Jesus Christ our Lord and our good present within me. I would think about a scene in his life, and then try to picture it with my mind's eye. 
But what I liked best was to read good books. This is because God did not give me much talent for figuring things out with my intellect or making good use of my imagination. In fact, my imagination was so clumsy that no matter how hard I tried to meditate on the Lord's humanity, I could never quite succeed. Some people try to harness this conceptual emptiness as a way of attaining the contemplative state. Maybe if they persevere in this practice, they get there quicker. But it's an arduous and painful path. If the will has nothing to occupy it and the heart has no object to engage it, the soul is left with neither support nor motivation. Her solitude and aridity are excruciating, and her thoughts fall into utter turmoil. People with this sort of disposition need to have a purer conscience than those who are capable of working things out conceptually. A person who ponders the nature of the world and reflects on how much he owes to the one who loves him, who suffered for his sake, will find himself equipped with the tools he needs to defend himself against his own dangerous thoughts and to avoid occasions for error. A person who is incapable of formulating concepts in prayer is at much higher risk and should compensate for this by reading more, since he has no other source of guidance. The non-conceptual path is so harrowing that any spiritual director who compels a person to practice contemplative prayer and yet forbids such a person to support himself by reading is placing him in great peril. Even just a small amount of reading will help substitute for the mental prayer he can't seem to practice. Good books are an aid in recollection. What I mean is that, if a person is incapable of engaging his intellect or imagination in prayer and is not allowed to read holy books, he will be unable to sustain his practice for very long and will probably endanger his very health and well-being. Looking back, I can see that it was a blessing that God did not send me a spiritual teacher during that time. If he had, I don't think I would have been willing to endure this internal aridity and this inability to meditate for 18 years. During all that time, I never dared to sit down to pray unless I had a book close at hand. My soul was as terrified of praying without a book as it would have been if thrown unarmed into a raging battlefield. Books were my companions, my consolation, my shield against the explosion of thoughts. If I didn't have a book, I would suffer from terrible aridity. The minute I find myself without something to read, my soul would become immediately agitated and my mind would start to wander. But as soon as I started reading, the words acted like bait to lure my soul and my thoughts began to collect themselves again. Sometimes it was enough just to know that I had a book beside me. I didn't even have to open it. Sometimes I read just a little, sometimes a lot, depending on the mercy of God. It seems to me that as long as I could be alone with my books in those days, there was no danger of being deprived of that blessing. Actually, by the grace of God, I would probably have done just as well with the guidance of an actual teacher or some other person who could have advised me about how to flee from opportunities for error and, if I stumbled into them, how to get back out. In those days, if the spirit of evil had attacked me head-on, I believe I would never have missed the mark again. As it is, the spirit of evil was so subtle and I was so weak that my loftiest resolutions did me almost no good. Later, as I began to dedicate myself to serving God, He rewarded me for this same determination with the patience I needed to endure serious illnesses. Again and again, I find myself in awe of God's great goodness. Again and again, my soul has rejoiced in His magnificence and His mercy. May He be blessed for everything. I have clearly seen that He has never failed to reward me, even in this lifetime, for any of my good intentions. No matter how flawed or how feeble my deeds may have been, this beloved of mine has taken them and perfected them, polishing and giving them worth. The minute I commit any errors, he hides them. Even if someone does witness my transgressions, His Majesty renders that person blind and wipes her memories clean. 
he sugarcoats my imperfections and makes some small virtue of mine, which he himself gave to me in the first place, practically forcing me to accept. Absolutely resplendent. I'd like to get back to what I have been ordered to do, but first, I must mention again that I lack the intelligence to offer any accurate description of how my beloved handled me in those days. I forget to reflect on what I owe him. I forget to acknowledge my own ingratitude and weakness. May he be forever blessed who has put up with me for so long. Amen. Chapter 5 Illness and Patience I forgot to mention that during the year of my monastic initiation, I suffered terrible anxiety about insignificant incidents. For instance, people would often blame me for things that were not my fault. I did not handle this well. In fact, it caused me deep distress. The only reason I was able to endure being unjustly accused was because I was generally so happy being a nun. Sometimes the others would catch me praying alone and weeping over my sins. They would jump to the conclusion that I was discontented, and they would say so. This was not true. I loved everything about religious life. I craved admiration, and I could not bear to be misunderstood. I was meticulous about everything I did, and I considered this to be a virtuous trait. Not that my impeccable behavior should have gotten me off the hook. Believe me, I knew how to find something to please me in any situation. Nor is ignorance any excuse for my shortcomings. It is true that the Incarnation was not exactly strict. I suppose I could place some of the blame on that. But being flawed... I had a tendency to go after what I knew to be bad and neglect what was good. There was a nun in our community at the time who was suffering from a very serious and agonizing ailment. Intestinal obstructions had created open sores in her stomach. She couldn't keep any food down. Her health rapidly deteriorated, and soon she was dead. I noticed that the other sisters were terrified of this disease, but I found myself envying the nun's incredible patience. I begged God to send me whatever illness he chose, as long as it would instill that kind of patience in me. I don't think I was afraid of being sick. I was so hungry for heavenly blessings that I was willing to obtain them by any means necessary. It surprises me to recall this. Although I had not yet fallen as deeply in love with God as I have since I embarked on a life of prayer, there was enough light for me to see that temporary things are trivial and pass away. Somehow I knew that the blessings that come from letting these things go last forever. His Majesty was listening to me. Less than two years later, I became seriously ill. It was not the same disease that had killed the nun, but I believe it was just as painful and difficult to bear. I will now tell you about something that happened during the three-year period I was suffering from this illness. As I said, I stayed with my sister while I was waiting for my treatment to begin. When the time came, my father, my sister, and my friend Juana, with the utmost care and concern for my comfort, took me away. Juana was that nun who had accompanied me when I first left the convent and stayed by my side because she loved me so much. It was during this time that the spirit of evil began to really agitate my soul. But, as you will see, God turned the whole thing into a great blessing. There was a young priest who lived in the village where I went for my treatment. He was from a good family and was an extremely intelligent man. He was well-educated, but not overly so. I began to go to him for confession. Men of learning have always attracted me. But half-learned men have done great harm to my soul. I never seem to find any men who are as learned as I would like them to be. Experience has taught me that men with no knowledge at all are less dangerous than those with only a little. If they lead virtuous and holy lives, they are better off not knowing anything. Such men are not inclined to trust themselves, nor would I trust them myself, until they have checked in with men of real learning. A real man of learning has never led me astray. Not that the half-learned men meant to deceive me. They simply didn't know any better. 
But I thought they did, and that my only obligation was to believe them. They spoke ambiguously and gave me no boundaries. Of course, I see now that if they had been strict with me, I would have just ignored them and looked for others who told me what I wanted to hear. That's how wicked I am. These spiritual teachers would tell me that my minor sins were no sins at all, and that my major ones were only minor. This did me such harm that I feel compelled to take this opportunity to warn other seekers to avoid such relationships. But I had no excuse before God. I was well aware that I was doing things that were wrong, and this knowledge alone should have been sufficient to keep me from doing them. I believe that God allowed these men to misguide me and lead me astray as a consequence of my own transgressions. I, in turn, led many others astray, repeating what my teachers had told me. I blundered through this blindness for more than seventeen years until a Dominican friar named Vicente Barron disabused me of my illusions. Father Vicente was an extremely learned man. He and certain Jesuit priests scared me by convincing me that I was building my life on seriously faulty principles. I'll say more about this later. When I started making my confessions to that priest I mentioned, he developed an extreme affection for me. Maybe this is because ever since I had become a nun, I had very little to repent, especially in comparison with what I had later. It's not that there was really anything wrong with his fondness for me. The problem was that there was just too much of it. Not only do I understand that there is nothing I could do to persuade you to commit any grave offense against God, he assured me, but I would never dream of trying. We spoke a great deal about this, but I was so madly in love with God at this time that all I ever wanted to talk about was Him. My passion for God was childlike, and it mystified my friend. Because of his great desire for me, he began to confide in me. His was no small problem. It turns out that this priest had been intimately involved for a number of years with a local woman. Everyone in the village knew about the affair, but he continued to celebrate the Mass anyway. Even though he had lost his honor and his good name, no one dared to denounce him. I felt sorry for this man because I was so fond of him. I was so superficial and blind in those days that I thought it was a virtue to be loyal and grateful to anyone who liked me. Damn such loyalty when it distracts a person from her loyalty to God. This is a common mistake people make in this world, and yet it never ceases to baffle me. Even though it is God to whom we owe gratitude for all good things, we do not hesitate to act against Him while we are reluctant to do anything that might strain our human friendships. O oh, blindness of the world! May it serve you, my beloved, to replace my imperfect appreciation for worldly relationships with unmitigated gratitude for you. But I have exhibited the exact opposite behavior. That's how wicked I am. I started asking around about my priest. That's when I began to realize what deep trouble the poor man had gotten himself into and to see that it was not altogether his fault. It turns out that this wretched woman had cast a spell on him. She gave him a little copper amulet and begged him to wear it around his neck as a symbol of their love. No one had the power to persuade him to take the thing off. Now I must say I do not believe in the story of bewitchment. I am simply recounting an incident I witnessed as a warning to you men to be on your guard against women like this. Since women in general are more compelled than men to be honest and true, a woman who is willing to sacrifice her virtue is thoroughly untrustworthy. The devil whispers in her ear, inflaming her desire, and off she goes. Such women are willing to shame themselves before God for the pleasure of following their own will. I know I'm not perfect, but I've never tried to manipulate anyone like that. Even if I had the power to force someone's affection for me, I wouldn't want to. Fortunately, God has kept me from making this kind of mistake. If he had abandoned me to my own impulses, however, I might well have done wrong in this regard, as I have in so many others. I'm simply not to be trusted. When I found out about the spell, I began to show this man greater affection. Although my intentions were good, my actions were bad. Bad means, no matter how small, never justify good ends, no matter how great. I mostly spoke to this priest about God. 
This must have benefited him to some extent, but I believe that his love for me helped him more. To please me, he ended up giving me the copper amulet, and I immediately threw it into the river. After this, the priest was like a man awakening from a dream. As he began to recall everything he had been doing during his years of involvement with that woman, he was shocked and disappointed with himself. He felt loathing for the woman who had led him to his downfall. His intense devotion to the Blessed Mother seemed to have helped him a great deal. The feast day of the Immaculate Conception has always been very important to him. Finally, he cut off the affair once and for all, and he never tired of giving thanks to God for showing him the light. Exactly one year after the day I met the priest, he died. He had spent a lifetime actively serving God. I never thought that there was anything incorrect about his affection for me, although it could have been purer. There were times when, if we had not been so close to God, we might have engaged in some serious offenses. But I would not have allowed myself to do anything I thought might lead to mortal sin. I think he realized this, and it made him love me all the more. I believe that all men are attracted to women whom they perceive as being inclined toward virtue. Even women who have no aspirations beyond this world will get more from men by maintaining their integrity. I'll elaborate on this later. I have no doubt that this priest is now on the road to liberation. He died a very holy death, completely free of the errors he had committed. I guess it was the Lord's will for him to be redeemed in this way. I stayed in that village for three months. With my delicate constitution, I suffered terribly. I barely survived the radical treatment. At the end of the two months, the cure had almost killed me. That pain in my heart, which was the reason I had gone there in the first place, was much worse. Sometimes it felt as if sharp teeth were biting into me. My pain was so intense that the people taking care of me were afraid that I was going to lose my mind. My energy plummeted. I took only liquid because I was nauseated all the time and couldn't bear to eat solid food. I ran a constant fever. They had been giving me purgatives every day for almost a month, and I was wasting away. I was so constricted that my nerves began to shrink, causing me such excruciating pain that I could not sleep day or night. I was utterly miserable. It became apparent to my father that the healer was doing me no good, and he took me away. We went back to the regular doctors, but they had given up on me. They concluded that in addition to all of my other ailments, I was suffering from tuberculosis and there was nothing they could do for me. This diagnosis did not bother me nearly as much as did the constant pain that racked me from head to foot. The doctors themselves admitted that nerve pain is unbearable. And since my nerves had collapsed, I would indeed have been incapable of enduring the suffering if not for the realization that my condition was of my own making. I battled all of these problems at the same time for more than three months. It was excruciating. In retrospect, it seems impossible that I survived. I am equally amazed and also grateful that His Majesty gave me the blessing of great patience. It is clear that this gift came directly from God. Reading the story of Job in the morals of St. Gregory bolstered my patience tremendously. I even slept with them. The Lord used this text to prepare me for the suffering I had to undergo. It also helped that I had begun to cultivate contemplative practice because this enabled me to sit with things as they are. All my conversations were with God. I continually carried the words of Job in my mind. Since we have received good things at the hand of the Lord, shall we not suffer evil things? I repeated this frequently, and it gave me strength. It was time for the August Feast of Our Lady. I had been in agony since April, but the last three months had been the worst. I had always been inclined to go to confession often, but now I was confessing at every opportunity. They all thought that this was because I was afraid of dying, so my father, thinking he was protecting me from mental distress, decided to forbid me from going anymore. Oh, too much earthly love. My father was a good Catholic and a very wise man. 
So it was not a matter of ignorance that prevented him from seeing what good the practice of penance had been doing me. Nevertheless, despite his intention, his stance could have done me great harm. That night I had a seizure that left me unconscious for almost four days. They administered the sacrament of unction, and from hour to hour and moment to moment, they expected me to die. Over and over they recited the creed to me as if I could understand. At one point, they seemed to conclude that I was dead, because I actually found wax on my eyelids when I regained consciousness. My father was terribly distressed about having prevented me from going to confession. Many tears were shed for me, and many prayers were said to God on my behalf. Blessed be the one who heard them. They dug a grave for me back at the Incarnation and were waiting a day and a half for my body. In another monastery of our order, far away, they had already performed the last rites for me. But it pleased the Lord for me to return to consciousness. I immediately wanted to go to confession. When I received communion, I couldn't stop crying. It was not only that. I was moved and distressed by the possibility that I had in any way offended God. That remorse in itself would have been enough to save my soul. No. What upset me most was the realization that the men who had attempted to guide me had misled me and tried to convince me that my sins were minor, when in fact they had been grave. I now saw clearly that I had used this guidance as an excuse for inexcusable acts. My suffering was so unbearable I could hardly form thoughts. Still, I think I managed to offer a complete confession of all the ways I had forsaken my God. There is a certain blessing, among so many others, that His Majesty has given me. Ever since I first began to speak with Him, I have never kept back anything. If I thought I might have committed any error, even a minor one, I confessed it. But I do believe that if I had died back then without having had access to proper confession, my salvation would have been questionable. This is partly because my spiritual guides were only half-learned men, and also because I myself was such a mess. There were many other reasons as well. When I come to this point in my story, I find myself so stunned to remember how my beloved brought me back to life that I am trembling inside. It seems to me that it would be a good thing, my soul, for you to take a look at the danger from which your Lord delivered you. That way, if love is not enough to keep you from offending him, you will at least be motivated by awe. There were a thousand times he might have let you die, and when you were in an even greater state of peril than you found yourself in that day. I do not believe I am exaggerating when I say a thousand although the person who has ordered me to tell my life story has repeatedly urged me to be moderate when I recount my sins. But I have already made my transgressions sound far too innocent. For love of God, I beg this man not to excuse a single one of my faults, because they only serve to reveal the magnificence of God and His willingness to suffer for our souls. May He be blessed forever. And may His Majesty be pleased to know that I would swallow myself whole before I would ever stop loving Him. Chapter 6 St. Joseph's Cure I emerged from that four-day fit in a state of such unbearable torment that only the Lord can know the truth of what I went through. I had bitten my tongue to pieces. Not a morsel of food had passed my lips in so long that I was too weak to swallow, and I choked when I tried to take even a sip of water. It felt like all my limbs were out of joint and my mind was in a total fog. Not only that, but the suffering I had endured during those four days left me all twisted up like a pile of knotted ropes. I had no more ability to move my hand or foot than a dead person has unless someone else moved it for me. Actually, I think I was able to move one finger on my right hand. I was in such a pitiful state that I could not bear for anyone to see me like that. I felt so bruised that my friends and family had to carry me around on a sheet. One person would take up one corner and another person would take up the other. This went on until Easter. Since I couldn't bear to be touched, the only time I had any relief 
was when I was left alone for a little while. After resting in solitude, I began to think that I was getting well. I was very relieved whenever my pain let up, simply because I was beginning to worry that my patience was failing me. I still suffered from terrible bouts of fever and chills and unrelenting nausea. I was desperate to return to the Incarnation, so my family finally relented and took me there. The nuns who had been expecting to receive a dead body were pleased to be welcoming a living woman instead. But I was in such bad shape that I looked worse than a dead person. I was nothing but skin and bones by this time, and I cannot even begin to describe how weak I was. It took eight months for me to recover from this paralysis and the illness that accompanied it. Although I continued to improve, the paralysis lingered for almost three years. When I began to get around by crawling on my hands and knees, I praised God. I accepted all this and eventually came to bear my condition with genuine joy. After all, it was a vast improvement over what I went through at first. I had surrendered to the will of God, even if He were to leave me like that forever. I think my greatest wish was that I could get better just so that I could practice solitary prayer again as I had been taught. It was impossible to be alone in the convent infirmary. I was unwavering in my commitment to confession. I spoke about God constantly and in such a way that Everyone I talked to was uplifted and amazed by the patience the Lord had given me. It was obvious that this was a gift from the Beloved's hand, because without it, I could not possibly have endured such terrible suffering with such pure contentment. In prayer, God granted me the grace of His mercy. This was a wonderful blessing, because it helped me to realize what it is to love Him. I began to feel the holy virtues flowing back into me, although as it turned out, not strongly enough to hold me up in righteousness. I made it my practice to avoid speaking badly of anyone, ever. Whenever I was tempted, I would simply remind myself not to say anything about someone else that I would not want someone to say about me. I was uncompromising in my commitment to this value. Of course I was not perfect, and certain difficult situations came up that strained my resolve to the breaking point. Still, this was my customary way of behaving, and those who spent time with me were so struck by it that they made it their practice to. People realized that when they were with me, they could turn their backs and be perfectly safe. This was true not only for the women I lived with at the Incarnation, but also for my friends, my relatives, and my students. But I have set a very bad example in other areas, and I'm going to have to be accountable to God for those. Please forgive me, Your Majesty, for all the trouble I have caused. Know that my negative actions do not in any way reflect my positive intentions. My longing for solitude continued. I still love to read good books. The only conversation I found worthwhile was conversation about God. Whenever I encountered anyone who wanted to talk about God with me, it gave me more delight and sheer recreation than any worldly pleasures, which are actually empty, ever could. I took communion and made confession as often as possible. I remember that sometimes I avoided prayer because I was afraid of facing my disloyalty to God and the terrible pain this would cause me. The very thought that I might have done anything to offend my beloved was a severe punishment in itself. This anxiety intensified to such a degree that I do not know what to compare it to. It was not a matter of fear, because I was just as likely to suffer from this kind of distress when I considered the blessings the Lord had given me in prayer as when I reflected on the mistakes I had made. If I thought about all He had done for me, I couldn't help but notice how little I had offered in return. I couldn't bear to face this and I would cry over my many faults. But my tears only made me angry with myself. Had my remorse stopped me from falling whenever an opportunity presented itself? Were all my resolutions and effort doing me any good? This weeping of mine struck me as fraudulent. All it did was highlight my imperfection, because tears of repentance are a gift from God, and I was wasting them. 
I always tried to confess my transgressions as soon as I committed them, and I did everything I could to return to a state of grace. But the problem was that I did not know how to cut off my sinful inclinations at their root. Nor were my confessors much help in the matter. If they had told me that these long religious conversations of mine were thinly veiled indulgences, I would have stopped them immediately. I would never have consciously risked missing the mark for even a single day. In prayer, I would be overcome with awe of God. A sign that I was motivated more by love than by fear was that I never thought about retribution. My anxiety was always enfolded by love. The whole time I was sick, I was hypervigilant over my conscience, careful to avoid anything resembling spiritual error. Dear God, how I yearned for good health so that I might serve you better. This desire itself became the cause of my undoing. I was so young when I became seriously paralyzed. As soon as I realized that earthly doctors were unable to cure me, I turned to heaven for healing. Because even though I carried my illness with joy, I still preferred to get better. I sometimes thought that if I were to recover my health only to go out and miss the mark all over again, it would be better to stay sick. But I still believed that I could be of greater service to my God if I were well. This is how we deceive ourselves. We do not surrender entirely to God's will, even though He is the one who knows what is best for us. I began to offer devotions during Mass. I stuck to prescribed prayers because I distrusted alternative expressions of worship. Women, especially, love to invent ceremonies. I could never stand these rituals. It has been confirmed to me since then that such practices are superstitious and inappropriate. I chose the glorious St. Joseph as my master and advocate and entrusted myself to him completely. I found that this great father and lord of mine solved the problem of my health and also delivered me from bigger issues, like the loss of my soul and my honor. He freely gave me greater blessings than I could ever ask of him. Even now, I can't think of a single instance in which he has neglected to give me anything I have asked for. It is amazing to see all the mercy God has shown me and the perils, both physical and spiritual, from which he has rescued me through this blessed saint. The Lord seems to have given other saints the grace to fulfill certain needs, but in my experience, this glorious saint comes to our aid in all areas. When Christ walked this earth, Joseph was his guardian. As a boy, Jesus called him Father and obeyed his commands. It seems to me that Christ wants to know that in heaven he still does everything Joseph asks. Other people I have advised have experienced a similar response when they commended themselves to the saint. I used to observe St. Joseph's feast with great ceremony. I was obsessed with the details. Although my intentions were good, I can see now that I celebrated this holy day with more vanity than spirituality. Another negative trait of mine was that whenever the Lord gave me the grace to do anything well, I would do it imperfectly instead replete with mistakes. I was highly skilled at being finicky and vain. May the Lord forgive me. I wish I could convince everyone to be devoted to this glorious saint. I have experienced the innumerable blessings that come through him from God. I have never known anyone who sincerely revered him and offered particular vows to him who did not make spiritual progress. St. Joseph comes to the aid of those who commend themselves to him. Year after year I have made some request of him on his feast day, and he has always granted it. If my appeal were twisted in any way, he would straighten it out for me. If I were a person with authority to do so, I would not hesitate to describe in great detail the many favors this magnificent saint has given to me and to others. But since I am constrained by my order to write about certain things at great length and to minimize others, I will have to keep this part much more brief than I would like. In other words, I'm going to have to act like someone who has no sense of discrimination and doesn't know what is good. For the love of God, 
I ask anyone who does not believe me to put my claims about St. Joseph to the test. Then you'll see for yourself the great goodness that comes when you offer devotion to this sublime patriarch. How could anyone think about the Queen of Angels and how she suffered for the child Jesus and not give thanks to St. Joseph for the way he helped them both? People of prayer should foster special affection for him. If you cannot find a guide to teach you contemplative practice, appeal to St. Joseph, and I assure you that this wondrous master will not lead you astray. I pray that I have not made a mistake in daring to speak of St. Joseph like this. While I have always made a great display of my devotion to him, I have never managed to successfully imitate and serve him. He cured me of my paralysis and gave me the power to stand up and walk again because of who he is. I, on the other hand, have misused this gift because of who I am. Who could have predicted that I would fall so soon after receiving so many gifts from God? After His Majesty blessed me with the very virtues that awakened my desire to serve Him, after I had found myself almost dead and in grave spiritual danger, after He had raised me up, body and soul, filling everyone with amazement that I had survived, what is this, my Lord? We live a perilous life. Here I am writing this account, and through your grace and mercy I could easily join St. Paul in saying, though I would not say it half as well, for it is not I now who live, but you, my Creator, who lives in me. It has been quite a few years now that, as far as I can understand, you have held me by the hand. In every way, little and big, I have always wanted to place your will before mine, and I have repeatedly resolved to do so. Over the years, you have tested these desires and resolutions of mine. Without even being aware of it, Your Majesty, I must have disappointed you again and again. There is nothing I would not do for love of you. In fact, you have already helped me to accomplish many things. I don't desire this world or worldly things. Nothing seems to make me happy unless it comes from you. Everything else feels like a heavy cross. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't really want what I say I want. But you know, my beloved, that I am not lying. I'm afraid, with good reason, that you may give up on me again. I am well aware how totally dependent I am on your grace to compensate for my lack of strength and virtue and to help me not give up on you. Please, don't abandon me, my beloved. Not now, while I am thinking all these things about myself. I really don't know what makes us want to keep living when life is so uncertain. I used to think, my Lord, that it would be impossible for me to forsake you. And look how many times I have done so. I can't help but be afraid. Because when you withdrew from me, even just a little, I fell flat on my face. May you be forever blessed. Even though I have neglected you, you have continuously offered me your hand and helped me back up. Often, my Lord, I refuse that hand of yours. Often, my Lord, you would call me again, and again I would refuse. This is what I would like to talk about next. Chapter 7 Prisoner of the Parlor this is when I began to indulge in distraction after distraction, conceit on top of conceit, vice compounded by vice. I gave in to so many subtle and destructive temptations during this time, and my soul drifted so far away on the tides of vanity that I was afraid to approach God again. Prayer is an intimate friendship with the divine, and I did not feel worthy of such intimacy. My shame grew in proportion to the abundance of my errors. The more I transgressed, the less comfort and joy I was able to derive from holy things. It was clear to me, my beloved, that my joy was failing me because I was failing you. The spirit of evil, disguised as humility, led me into the most insidious deception of all. Fear of prayer. I felt utterly lost. 
I considered myself to be the most wicked person alive. I concluded that I would be better off giving up on silent contemplation and starting to pray like everybody else. It was time to stop conversing privately with God and instead recite the vocal prayers exactly as I had learned them. After all, any outward display of silent prayer only deceived others into thinking I was good and holy, when in fact I was the opposite. My decline in virtue had nothing to do with the house where I lived. It was not their fault. I managed to manipulate everyone's good opinion of me, but I didn't mean to. I would never dream of pretending to be a good Christian. I have had many faults, but I have never, praise God, been an egomaniac or a hypocrite, as far as I know. The minute I ever felt the stirrings of arrogance inside myself, it would make me so upset that the devil would flee in consternation and I would be left better off. Maybe if God had chosen to tempt me in this area as severely as he has in others, I would have developed an overly inflated concept of my own holiness. But he has kept me from falling into this trap. May he be forever blessed. The truth is, I was much more troubled by the notion that people would be fooled by my outward appearance of goodness than that they would see me for who I knew myself to be inside. There were several reasons why nobody noticed how bad I was. What they observed was that even though I was very young and vulnerable to countless opportunities for missing the mark, I frequently removed myself from the group to pray in solitude. I read a lot and spoke exclusively about God. I like to have pictures of Christ everywhere, and I requested a chapel of my own that I could fill with sacred objects. I refused to ever speak badly about another person. I did many other things that made me appear to be virtuous. The truth was, I was vain and worldly. I liked it when people held me in high esteem. Because of my spiritual conduct, they gave me as much freedom as they gave to the older nuns, even more. They had a great deal of confidence in me because I never took liberties. I asked permission for everything. I did not sneak out at night to talk to outsiders through crevices in the wall or to hold private discussions with other nuns. I don't think I could ever have brought myself to participate in such secret exchanges. Nor did I try, because the Lord held me by the hand. I try to consider the ramifications of things. It seemed to me that it would be wrong for me to do anything that would compromise anyone's reputation by engaging in clandestine encounters. After all, they were the ones who were good and I was the bad one. As if any of those other things I was doing were so virtuous. The truth is, though I often acted inappropriately in different areas, it was never as intentional as that kind of misbehavior would have been. It was probably inappropriate for me to live in a convent that was not cloistered. The lives of those who have not taken a vow of enclosure are less circumscribed than those of cloistered nuns. Most women are good, and enjoying more freedom would not make them any less good. But I am bad. And the only reason this latitude did not lead me straight to hell was that the Lord used his own special ways and remedies to save me from peril. It seems to me that the more autonomy people are given in spiritual community, the greater their risk of missing the mark. For those who are inclined to be wicked, broad liberty is not an antidote for their weakness, but rather a further step on the path to hell. This is not the case in the convent where I live now. There are many women here who serve the Lord in a completely genuine manner. His Majesty cannot fail to help them on their way. Ours is not one of those open convents either. We practice rigorous spiritual discipline here. I'm talking about other religious houses I have been familiar with. This kind of thing breaks my heart. When a spiritual community engages in the activities of the world, the residents tend to forget their religious obligations. Then the Lord has to call to each of them in a particular way, not once, but over and over, until each remembers why she is there. May God save them and not let them confuse virtue with sin, as I have done so many times. This is not an easy thing for people to see. The Lord has to take the matter into his own hands, 
If parents would heed my advice, they would think twice about sending their daughters to a convent, assuming the girls will automatically walk in the way of God, when in fact they are likely to get into more trouble than they would out in the world. They should at least look out for their daughters' reputations. Parents would be better off letting their children marry someone of a lower status than they would be sending them to convents of this kind. If the young women are genuinely inclined toward devotion, then may God lead them away from what is dangerous and toward all that is good. Otherwise, they might as well stay home. If they want to be wicked there, they cannot hide it for long. In a monastic setting, such behaviors can be concealed for a very long time until, eventually, the Lord himself reveals them. These girls not only hurt themselves, but their actions have a negative effect on others. Often, though, it's not their fault. The poor creatures are simply trying to fit in. Some girls join a spiritual community hoping to escape this cycle. They think that by withdrawing from the world, they will avoid worldly pitfalls and so be able to serve God undistracted. But the next thing they know, they find themselves in ten worlds combined and they don't have any idea how to get out and remedy the situation. Youth, sensuality, and the spirit of evil conspire to incline these young women toward worldly attachments and to convince them that these things are somehow acceptable. They remind me of those poor atheists who blind themselves to the sacred and then try to convince everyone else that the path they are following is the correct one. But all along, a voice deep inside them is whispering the truth. Oh, what terrible harm! What terrible harm comes to religious people who do not live what they profess? I am speaking now as much of men as of women. There are two paths available to those who enter a religious life. The way of virtue and devotion, and the opposite of virtue and devotion. Unfortunately, both paths seem to be trodden equally. No, I'm wrong. They are not trodden equally. Many more people walk the irreligious path because it is the broader road and much easier to navigate for those of us inclined to miss the mark. The true spiritual life is so rare that those who hear the call and begin to follow it ought to be more afraid of the members of their own community than of all the demonic forces that exist. They should carefully conceal their true desire for friendship with God. It is safer to discuss the false connections that the spirit of evil stirs up in religious houses. I don't know why we're so shocked to hear about all the bad things that happened in spiritual communities. After all, those who are supposed to be modeling virtue to the rest of us have generally drifted so far away from the ancient wisdom that the spirits of the saints have abandoned us. May His Divine Majesty be pleased to remedy the situation as He sees fit. And so I was misled into thinking that it was harmless for me to indulge in the pseudo-spiritual conversations I enjoyed so much. It was only later that I discovered that this kind of companionship could be dangerously distracting. I didn't see why such an ordinary custom as receiving visitors at the convent and discussing so-called religious things with them should do my soul any more harm than it did other nuns who were perfectly decent people. I failed to consider that they were better people than I was, and what was safe for them was not safe for me. Still, I have no doubt that there is an element of trouble for everyone in this practice, because even if it does not cause damage, it is at least a waste of time. Once, in the early stages of my acquaintance with someone, the Lord chose to show me that these kinds of relationships were not good for me. He broke through the core of my thick blindness to teach me and show me the way. Christ himself appeared before me, fierce and direct, to tell me exactly what it was that troubled him about these interactions. I saw him more clearly through the eyes of my soul than I ever could have with my physical eyes. This vision had such a powerful impact on me that even now, 26 years later, I can still seem to see him standing here. I was so stunned and disturbed by this experience that I never again wanted to see the person who triggered it. 
It did me no good to maintain the belief that it was impossible to see with any eyes other than those of the body. It was the spirit of evil that made me think such a thing. It made me wonder if my vision of Christ was a figment of my imagination or, worse, a demonic phenomenon. But I couldn't shake the conviction that this vision came from God, and I had not imagined it. Since the stern form in which Christ had appeared was not pleasing to me, however, I forced myself to lie to myself, and I didn't dare discuss the matter with anyone. The spirit of evil returned full force, convincing me that there was no harm in my relationship with that person, and that far from damaging my reputation, our interactions could only enhance it. So I started having these intimate spiritual conversations with him again, and later I received other visitors in the same way. I wasted years in this insidious diversion. When I was doing it, it never seemed to me to be as bad as it really was, although I sometimes had a clear sense that I was doing something wrong. Still, no one ever distracted me quite as badly as the person I've been speaking about. I was excessively fond of him. There was another time when I was with the same person, and we saw something like a large toad coming toward us, but moving much more swiftly than toads generally do. Other people who were there saw it too. I could not imagine where such a creature could have been hiding and how it could have emerged like that in broad daylight. None of us had ever seen anything like it before. This incident had such a powerful effect on me that it must have concealed a deeper meaning. I have never forgotten this experience either. Oh, great God, you warned me in so many little ways and with such tender compassion. And how much did I benefit from your efforts? Hardly at all. There was an older nun in the house where I lived, a distant relative of mine who had been there a long time, whose spiritual practice was extremely disciplined. These parlor discourses of yours are not healthy, she would warn me sometimes. Not only did I refuse to listen to her, but I became annoyed that she was making something innocent into some kind of scandal. I mention all this to demonstrate how bad I was and how great God is, since I fully deserve to be punished for my outrageous ingratitude. This way, if it is God's will and pleasure that anyone read this book, they can take it as a warning and not have to make the same mistakes I made. I beg you, for the love of the Lord. Don't get caught up in this noxious kind of recreation. May His Majesty be pleased to allow me to make up here for the many people I have led astray in the past. In the midst of danger, I would assure them that there was nothing wrong. Of course, I would never willingly deceive anyone. My faulty guidance was nothing but an artifact of my own blindness. Without ever dreaming that I was doing so, I was setting a terrible example and causing a great deal of harm. It is a very common temptation among beginners to try to help other people before they have learned how to take care of themselves. In those early days when I was still very sick, I fell into that trap. Luckily, the outcome was positive. Because I loved my father so much, I wanted him to benefit from the blessings that I was enjoying from the practice of prayer. There seemed to me no greater gift to share. So I did my best, by indirect means, to persuade him to pray. I gave him books on the subject. As I've said, my father was a very good man, and this practice captured his heart. Within a few short years, he had made so much progress that all I could do was praise God for it. I was very much encouraged by this. It's not that my father did not suffer great trials along his path, but he handled them with tremendous patience and perseverance. He visited me often because it comforted him to discuss divine things. Meanwhile, I was becoming more and more of a wreck. I was no longer praying. I couldn't bear to see that my father still thought I was practicing what I preached. I had somehow convinced myself that refraining from prayer was more truly humble than praying. This became a serious temptation for me and almost caused my ruin. At least when I was practicing prayer, I might offend God one day, but the next day I had the opportunity to recollect myself and turn away from other occasions for missing the mark. 
A year had passed since I last prayed, and I finally decided it was time to tell my father the truth about my own practice. When that blessed man came to visit me, it broke my heart to see him laboring under the illusion that I was communing with God as I had before. I admitted that I was not practicing prayer anymore, but I did not tell him the real reason why. I used my ill health as an excuse. Although I had recovered from the worst of my ailments, I have suffered from various maladies, some quite serious, ever since. Lately, my problems have not been quite as severe, but they still bother me. For instance, I have suffered from nausea and vomiting every morning for twenty years. I cannot eat a thing until afternoon, sometimes even later. Ever since I began taking communion more regularly, I have had to make myself throw up at night before I go to sleep using feathers or some other trigger, which is terribly uncomfortable. But if I let the nausea go on, I feel even worse. Nor am I ever entirely free from aches and pains, especially in my heart. Sometimes they're quite intense. The fainting spells, which used to be continuous, are now more rare. And it's been eight years since I was cured of that mysterious paralysis and the high fevers that accompanied it. These illnesses seem so insignificant to me now that I've begun to rejoice in them, thinking that maybe they have served my beloved in some way. Since my father never lied himself, he believed me when I told him that I had quit practicing prayer because of my health. By this time, in light of the nature of the things we discussed, I shouldn't have been lying either. I knew quite well that there is no excuse for giving up prayer. But to make my story more convincing, I added that it was all I could do to keep up with my regular religious duties. Not that one needs much physical strength for a practice that demands nothing more than showing up with a loving and constant heart. Our Lord always provides opportunities for prayer if we choose to take them. I say always because even though sickness and other troubles may sometimes hinder our free access to hours of solitude, there are plenty of other times when we are healthy and can make up for that. We can also pray in the midst of our ordinary activities, and we can even harness our pain itself as a genuine opportunity for prayer by offering up the very thing from which we are suffering and remembering the one for whom we suffer it. All we need to do is accept our ill health and the thousand other things that happen to us. Prayer is an exercise of love. It is a mistake to believe that if we have no time alone, we cannot practice prayer or, for that matter, that when we do have time alone, we will use it to pray. With a little care, we can draw great blessings from the occasions when the Beloved sends us trials that deprive us of time we had set aside for prayer. When my conscience was clear, I had no trouble uncovering these blessings. Because my Father loved and respected me, He believed everything I said. In fact, he felt sorry for me. But he had reached such a high state of prayer that he began to spend less and less time visiting me. He would leave shortly after arriving. He felt that to linger was a waste of time. Since I was busy wasting time on various vanities, I did not take this very seriously. My father was not the only person I tried to lead into a life of contemplative prayer even though I myself was more interested in trivial matters. When I noticed certain nuns reciting vocal prayers, I taught them how to practice silent prayer. I would help them along and share my books with them. As I have mentioned, ever since I first began to pray, I have had this desire for others to serve God. It seemed to me that since I was no longer serving my beloved as I knew I should, the least I could do was to not waste the knowledge His Majesty had given me and help others to serve Him through me. Look how blind I was. I was trying to save others while letting myself get completely lost. Around this time, my father became very ill and eventually died. I went home to take care of him. Vanity had rendered my soul sicker than disease had rendered my father's body. However, I must say that during the entire period when I was wasting time showing off in the convent parlor, I never, to my knowledge, committed any grave error. 
If I had believed I was in any way offending God, I would have stopped immediately. My father's illness was deeply distressing to me. I hoped that I repaid him a small part of all he did for me when I was sick. In spite of my grief, I forced myself to stay busy. Even though in losing him, I was losing all the goodness and comfort in my life. I was determined not to let my anguish show. And so I behaved as if I didn't have a care in the world until the day he died. I love that man so much that as I saw his death approaching, I felt like my own soul was being ripped from my body. I cannot help but praise the Lord for the good death my father died. He welcomed death. After receiving extreme unction, he offered us final words of wisdom. Please, my children, pray for God to have mercy on my soul, he said. And serve God always. All things come to an end, he reminded us. Then he began to weep. I would have liked to have been a friar, he said. I regret not having served God in that way. I see now that God gave my father a glimpse of his impending death a full two weeks before he died. Until that time, while he was certainly not feeling well, I don't think he believed that he was dying. But afterward, even though he felt much better and his doctors assured him that he was going to be fine, he ignored them and got to work putting his soul in order. My father's primary affliction was a severe and unrelenting pain in his spine. Sometimes it was so acute it was like torture. Since the image of Christ carrying the cross on his back was so meaningful to my father, I suggested to him that maybe his majesty wanted him to share some of the pain that Jesus endured. He took such comfort in this notion that I never heard him complain again. For the last three days of his life, my father was mostly unconscious. But on the last day, the Lord brought him to full consciousness. We were amazed. We began to recite the creed aloud with him. He remained alert until halfway through. And then he just quietly slipped away. There he lay, looking like an angel. It seems to me that my father had a truly angelic character and soul. I'm not sure why I've told you all this, except that maybe I still feel guilty. With the legacy of goodness my father left in terms of the quality of both his life and his death, I should have made more of an effort to improve myself. There is no doubt that your father went directly to heaven, the highly educated Dominican father Vicente Barron said. He had been my father's confessor for many years, and he praised the purity of my father's conscience. Father Barron was a very good man, a man in awe of God. I went to him for confession, and he was a real help to me. He took great care to point out to me the dangerous spiritual waters I was heading for and set my soul back on track. He had me meet with him every two weeks, and gradually I began to open up to him and tell him about my path of prayer. Never give up this practice, because it can do you nothing but good, he told me. So I began to engage in prayer again, and I have never ceased this did not stop me, however, from continuing to miss the mark. My life felt very heavy to me because prayer illumined all my faults. God was calling to me in one ear and the world beckoned in the other. All the things of God filled me with joy, but the things of the world held me captive. It seems to me now that I was struggling to reconcile two fundamental opposites, the life of the Spirit and the pleasures and distractions of the senses. It was very difficult for me to practice prayer, because my spirit was not the master but the slave. I was not able to shut myself inside myself, which was my whole method of prayer, without shutting a thousand follies in with me. I spent many years engaged in this struggle. Looking back, I'm amazed at how I could have put up with this and never given up one mode in favor of the other. Well, what I do know is that by this time, there was no turning back. The power to abandon prayer was no longer in my hands, 
because he who desired me and wished to bless me with great mercies was holding me in his. Oh, God, help me. If only I could recount all the times you rescued me from myself over the years and how I kept going right back into opportunities for error. If only I could describe how you preserved my reputation when I was in danger of completely ruining it. Through my actions, I continued to demonstrate what kind of person I really was. But the Lord kept covering up my faults and uncovering some small virtues, as if I had any, and magnifying it in the eyes of others, causing them to hold me in high esteem. Even though my mischief was sometimes blatantly obvious, nobody took it seriously. They focus on the good things instead. This is because the knower of all things saw that later, when I would speak about serving him, I would require some credibility. And in his supreme generosity, my beloved chose not to look upon my sins, but instead on my constant desire to serve him and the sorrow I suffered in lacking the strength to manifest it. O Lord of my soul, how could I ever pay tribute to the mercy you bestowed on me during those years? How could I ever express my gratitude for the moments when I turned against you and you swiftly brought me back through the most extraordinary repentance to taste your sublime gifts? Truly, my King, you chose the most delicate and painful punishment I could possibly have endured. You knew exactly what would break my heart open. You chastised my faults with great favors. I do not believe I am speaking nonsense here, although when I recall how ungrateful I was in those days, I almost wish that I could lose my mind and not have to reflect on how wicked I was. In my condition, it was far more painful to receive divine favors when I had committed some grave offense than it would have been to be castigated. A single favor of this kind troubled and bewildered and exhausted me more than a dozen illnesses and ordeals put together. Even though I made more mistakes than I could ever atone for, it still seemed to me that when I was suffering, I deserved it. And at least it gave me the opportunity to pay a little something for my bad behavior. But to see myself receiving fresh blessings after failing to appreciate the grace I had already been given was a kind of torture to me. I think anyone who has any knowledge and love of God must feel this way. All we have to do is reflect on the ultimate good and we can't help but notice how far we are from it. As I took stock of my feelings, I saw that I was always on the brink of falling into error. This awareness triggered tears of anger. At the same time, I knew that my desire was strong and my resolve was firm. It is a terrible thing for a soul to be alone in the midst of such danger. It seems to me that it would have been very helpful to me to have had someone to talk to about all of this. If I lack sufficient shame before God, maybe I would have felt ashamed enough in front of another human being to adjust my behavior and avoid falling into error again. This is why I would advise anyone who practices prayer, at least in the beginning, to cultivate connection and companionship with like-minded souls. This is very important, because we can help each other make progress on the path of prayer and bring each other even greater benefits. After all, in ordinary human friendships, people seek each other out to relax and indulge in idle chatter, which may not be very good, and they find mutual sympathy and comfort in these attachments. So I don't see why we would ever discourage people who are beginning to love and serve God from getting together to discuss the trials and joys of the spiritual path. There are certainly plenty of both. If the friendship you desire to have with His Majesty is authentic, I don't think you need to worry about ego. When you notice the first egotistical stirrings, disclose them, and you will emerge victorious. I believe that when you discuss the trials and joys of the spiritual life for the sake of your friendship with God, you will benefit yourself and whomever you are sharing them with. Your own wisdom will increase, and without even knowing how you did it, you will contribute to the wisdom of your friends. If you have detected spiritual arrogance in yourself, you are likely to notice it coming up not only in these conversations about the practice of prayer— but also during any religious ritual that moves you to deep devotion in front of other people. This does not mean you should refrain from all spiritual practices for fear of being egotistical. 
Nothing should ever tempt you to abandon your path. I cannot overemphasize how important these friendships are, especially for souls whose virtue is not yet fully ripened, since there is no lack of either enemies or friends to incite them to do wrong. This vigilance about spiritual pride seems to me to be an invention of the spirit of evil, who finds our anxiety very valuable. The spirit of evil takes this concern and twists it so that those of us who truly love and serve God try to hide our spiritual inclinations while less righteous souls are encouraged to proclaim their wicked ways far and wide. These days, offenses against God are so common that people not only find them easy to justify, but actually seem to revel in them. Maybe what I am writing sounds foolish. If this is the case, I would invite you to tear it up right now. But if what I have to say rings true, then I beg you to augment my simple understanding with your deeper knowledge. People are so lazy regarding the things of God that those of us who love and serve Him need to back each other up if any of us are going to make any progress on the path. It is generally considered to be a fine thing to buy into the vanities and comforts of the world, and nobody thinks twice about these indulgences. On the other hand, the minute someone gives herself to God, she has no shortage of critics. We need companions to defend us against this kind of persecution until we grow strong enough to protect ourselves and not become discouraged by suffering. Without this companionship, we find ourselves in deep difficulty. I think this must be why some holy men and women used to withdraw to the desert. There is a kind of humility in not trusting exclusively in ourselves but in turning to others in the hope that God will help us all. Charity increases when it is shared. A thousand blessings flower from this kind of sharing. If I had not directly experienced the benefits of this type of exchange, I would not dare advocate it. It is true that I am the weakest and most wicked of anyone ever born. But I believe that someone who humbles herself, no matter how strong she might be, and trusts another who has more experience than she in these matters has nothing to lose. I know that if the Beloved had not revealed this truth to me and provided me with access to other people who were practicing prayer, I might have continued rising and falling until I plunged into hell. Believe me, I had plenty of friends to help me fall. But when it came to rising, I found myself so completely alone it's a wonder I did not remain stuck where I had fallen. I praise the mercy of God, for He is the one who gave me His hand. May He be blessed forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 8 Twenty Years of Turbulence I realize that it must make my readers uncomfortable to hear me go on and on about a person as wretched as I was, but it is not without reason that I have lingered so long on this period of my life. How could you not disdain me for being so obstinate and ungrateful to the one who bestowed so many blessings on me? If only I were allowed to tell you about all the times I disappointed my beloved by failing to lean on the pillar of prayer. I spent almost twenty years on this turbulent sea, falling and rising only to fall again. My life was so far from perfection that I barely took any notice of my minor spiritual mistakes. I was concerned about committing grave errors, but not enough to remove myself from the temptation that might lead to them. You cannot imagine what a painful way of life this was. I found neither joy in God nor gratification in the world. In the midst of enjoying worldly pleasures, I would feel sorrow remembering all I owed to God. Yet when I was trying to be with God, my worldly attachments would agitate me. This battle was so painful that I don't know how I managed to endure it for a single month, let alone for so many years. I can clearly see, however, the great mercy the Lord showed me during this time. Even while I was busy consorting with the world, He gave me the courage to keep practicing prayer. I say courage because I cannot think of a thing that requires more courage in the whole world than to betray the king. 
knowing that he knows what you're up to the entire time, and yet never removing yourself from his presence. Of course, we are all in the presence of God all the time, but it seems to me that those who practice prayer are present with him in a special way. They are continually aware of him. For others, several days may go by without any awareness that God sees them. It is true that there were times during those years when I gave myself entirely to prayer and sometimes went for many months, once even a whole year, I think, without offending God. Since I am obligated to tell the whole truth here, I must admit that I did make a sincere effort not to commit any transgressions against him. But since I have few memories of the good days, there must not have been very many of them. Still, not many days went by without my devoting long hours to prayer, unless I was very sick or very busy. Actually, I felt closer to God when I was ill. I tried to get the people who took care of me to draw nearer to Him, too. I spoke to them constantly about God and beseeched Him on their behalf. And so, except for that one good year I mentioned, I spent the first 18 of the past 28 years in this inner strife. The conflict was between yearning for God and attraction to the world. The war has not exactly subsided during the remainder of those years, as you will see, but the causes have been different. Also, since these other battles have been fought in the service of God and with greater understanding of the emptiness of the world, everything has gone smoothly. I will tell you about that later. The other reason I have gone into all this at such length, besides to point out how merciful God has been to such an ungrateful wretch as I, is so that my readers may see what great blessings God showers on souls who devote themselves to a life of prayer, even if their discipline is less than perfect. If they persevere through failures and temptations and the thousand obstacles that the spirit of evil throws in their path, I have no doubt whatsoever that the Beloved will lead them into safe harbor, as he has done for me, at least so far. May it please His Majesty that I never lose my way again. Many holy men have written and spoken about the good that comes from practicing prayer. By the way, when I say prayer, I'm talking about contemplative prayer. Glory be to God for such goodness. I know that I am far from humble, but even I would not be presumptuous enough to deal with this subject unless these saintly souls had already opened the door. I can only share what I have experienced. And what I know is that however sinful a person may be, once she has begun to practice prayer, she must never give it up. Prayer is the means by which we can repair all that is broken. Without prayer, it is almost impossible to make amends. Oh, may the spirit of evil not tempt you, as it has tempted me to give up prayer out of false humility. Instead. Let's believe the words of the One who told us that if we sincerely regret our mistakes and return our full attention to God, He will meet us with the fullness of His friendship and grant us again the blessing He gave us before, maybe even more generously than ever if our repentance warrants it. If you have not yet begun to practice prayer, I beg you, for the love of God, not to pass up such a great blessing. Fear has no place at this table. Only love. Even if you don't make much progress, and even if you don't expend the level of effort that would seem to merit the gifts and delights God lavishes on those who do, you will still begin to glimpse the road that leads to paradise. And if you persevere, I believe with all my heart that God, who never fails to reward those who take Him as their friend, will have mercy on you. As I see it, contemplative prayer is simply an intimate sharing between friends. It's about frequently taking time to be alone with the one we know loves us. If the friendship is to endure, the love must be honored and tended. The will of the two friends needs to be in harmony. The Lord, of course, is perfect, and He loves us perfectly. But our human nature is still sensual and selfish and we are not yet capable of fully contributing to this excellent friendship. 
we may endure deep pain when we realize how different we are from the one we love. Oh, how infinitely good you are, my God. It seems that in our encounter I see both you and myself. Oh, delight of the angels, when I think of you, I long to be completely consumed by you. How true it is that you graciously suffer the one who suffers to be with you. Oh, what a good friend you make, my Lord. How you bear us and comfort us. You patiently wait for us to rise to our true nature. And in the meantime, you accept us as we are. You take into account, my Lord, all the times we have loved you. And in one moment of atonement, you let all our transgressions go. This is so clear in my case. I cannot fathom, my Creator, why everyone does not try to connect with you in this bond of friendship. Why won't the wicked come to you so that you can make them good? All they need to do is to invite you to be with them for at least two hours a day. It doesn't even matter if they're incapable of being with you but are caught up in a thousand revolving thoughts and distractions, as I used to be. Simply making the effort to be in your company may be all they can do at the beginning, sometimes even later on. You, beloved, defend us against the onslaught of evil spirits, diminishing their strength every day. Finally, you give us sweet victory. And so, O life of all that lives, you do not sacrifice anyone who trusts in you and longs to be your friend. You sustain the health of our bodies and give vitality to our souls. Why are some people afraid to practice contemplative prayer? I don't understand what it is that scares them. The spirit of evil benefits from our fear by making the truth seem like an evil thing. The spirit of evil wants to frighten us away from reflecting on the sacred qualities of suffering and glory, on the ways we have lapsed and how we might rectify our relationship with God on the trials and the sorrows Christ endured for us? These are the things I will dwell on when I was praying. During the whole time I was navigating those dangerous waters I've been telling you about, this remained my focus in prayer. But I had trouble keeping my attention on God. I was more interested in when the hour I had allotted myself for prayer would be over than I was in abiding in quietude with my Beloved. I spend more time listening for the clock to strike than I did with lofty thoughts. I often would have preferred to take any heavy penance laid on me than do what was necessary to recollect myself and practice prayer. They say I am an exceptionally brave woman, far braver than most, but sometimes I had to gather all the courage God gave me to show up and pray. I'm not sure if the force of resistance was a technique used against me by the spirit of evil or if it was just a consequence of my own bad habits. But sometimes I felt such overwhelming sadness when I entered the chapel that I could hardly bear it. But once I made the effort, the Beloved helped me. After meditations like these, I was filled with a deeper sense of peace and delight than when I prayed because I wanted to. Prayer has been the remedy for all of my troubles. If the Lord has put up with someone as flawed as I am, why should you be afraid, no matter how wicked you think you may be? I don't care how bad you are. You could not possibly stay bad for as many years as I did after receiving so many blessings from God. The only reason the Lord tolerated me for so long was because I yearned for Him and strove to set aside some time and place for Him to be with me. I did not always feel like praying, but either because of the power of my struggle or the grace of God, I persevered and have derived indescribable benefits from it. Seeing me, how could you despair? If someone like me, who has made it a habit not to serve God but to offend Him, has found prayer to be such a worthy and necessary practice, then why would those of you who are truly inclined to serve God hesitate to engage in it? It can do no harm. It can only bring positive results. Do you want to add more trials to those you must already suffer in this life? Do you want to close the door on God's face, preventing Him from gifting you with the joy of contemplative prayer? If so, I feel sorry for you. You may well be serving God, but you're doing so at a terrible cost to yourself. Don't you know that God Himself pays the price for those who practice prayer? 
In exchange for our small effort, God rewards us with serenity and delight, giving us the energy to bear whatever trials may come our way. Later, I will tell you much more about the sweet blessings the Beloved gives to those who persevere in prayer. All I can say for now is that prayer is the doorway to the kinds of exquisite gifts He has given me. If we keep that door closed, how can He give us what we need? He may be wanting to grace the soul with delight and take His delight in her, but He can't get in. Unless He finds the soul solitary, empty, and longing for His love, there is nothing He can do. We put all these obstacles in His way and make no effort to remove them, and we want God to do us favors. To demonstrate God's mercy and to highlight the good it did me not to give up prayer and reading, I will tell you about the violence with which the spirit of evil waged war on my soul and the loving kindness the Beloved used to win it back. It's important that my readers understand this and make every effort to avoid the perils I unwittingly fell into. For the love of God and for the great love He has for us, protect yourself against opportunities for error. Once we are caught, we are besieged by enemies and are too weak to defend ourselves. If only I could describe to you the captivity my soul suffered in those days. I fully understood that I was a prisoner, but I didn't know why. I found myself unable to trust my guides when they made light of things that I felt in my soul to be wrong. When I went to a particular confessor to discuss a certain scruple that was bothering me regarding the conversations I was having with guests in the convent parlor, he dismissed it. This man insisted that even if I were brought into the highest contemplative state, such things would not be inappropriate. But by this time, I was already starting to withdraw from these dangers, even though I still had not given up the activities that led to them. Because of my devotion to the practice of prayer and the desire for God that my spiritual guides witnessed in me, they thought I was doing exceedingly well. But my soul understood that she was not fulfilling her debt to the One who had done everything for her. Looking back, I feel sorry for the suffering my poor soul had to endure with little help from anyone other than God. Encouraged by my confessors to indulge in my own pleasures and distractions, my soul stumbled into all kinds of trouble. Sermons were no small torment to me because I loved them too much. Whenever I heard someone preach with passion and skill, I felt a wave of affection rise up in me that I was powerless to suppress. Very few sermons were so bad that I did not listen to them with eager pleasure, even when other people said that the preaching was inept. But if the preaching was good, it gave me inordinate satisfaction. Once I had embarked on the contemplative path, I never grew tired of speaking about God or hearing others speak about Him. Still. Even though I drew deep comfort from a good sermon and a skillful preacher, it also tormented me because it made me see how far I was from where I wished to be. I beseeched the Beloved to help me, but I failed to put the whole of my trust in God and relinquish all traces of trust in myself. I searched earnestly for a remedy. I tried everything but without the fundamental realization that I was powerless and that the only thing I could rely on was God, my efforts were useless. I wanted life. I could clearly see that what I was doing was not living, but wrestling with the shadow of death. There was no one to give me life except God, and He had already brought me back to Himself so many times, only to have me forsake Him all over again that he finally seemed to be giving up on me. Who could blame him? Chapter 9 Tears of Conversion By now, my poor soul had grown weary, but no matter how much she wished she could rest, the bad habits I had developed would not let her. Until one day, when something happened that changed everything. I was about to walk into the chapel when I noticed a statue the Incarnation had borrowed for an upcoming festival. Someone had set it aside in preparation for the celebration. It was an image of Christ, scourged at the pillar. 
The sight of it was so moving that it shook me to the root of my being and stirred the depths of devotion in me. I became acutely aware of what Christ had suffered for us and how little gratitude I had ever offered Him in return. Suddenly, it felt like my heart was breaking. In a flood of tears, I threw myself down at His feet, beseeching Him to give me the strength to adore Him and never to forsake Him again. I have always felt a very special bond with the glorious Magdalene. Often when I was taking communion, I would reflect on her conversion. This is when I knew for certain that the Lord was inside me. Resting in this, I would place myself at His feet, confident that He would never reject my tears. I didn't know what I was talking about, but He was gracious and He allowed my tears to flow. How quickly I would then forget the feeling that prompted them, and I would implore that glorious saint to intervene with the Beloved on my behalf. But that day, when I encountered the statue outside the chapel, it went much deeper. I had lost all trust in myself and had placed myself unconditionally in God's hands. I think I told him then that I would not get up again until he gave me what I wanted. I am convinced that this surrender did me great good, because from then on I made dramatic progress. This was the method I used in prayer. Since I was no good at intellectual meditation, I would strive to picture Christ within me. It worked best for me to visualize Him in those moments when He was most alone. It seemed to me that when He was lonely and forsaken, He would be, like anyone in great need, more open to receive me. I had many simple thoughts of this kind. The scene of Christ praying in solitude in the garden was a special comfort to me. I would go there with him to keep him company. I would think about the anguish he experienced, and I would wish with all my heart that I could wipe the sweat from his face and alleviate his pain. But awareness of my own transgressions prevented me from actually doing it. I stayed with him as long as my thoughts would let me, but a thousand distractions tormented me. For many years before going to bed, after I had commended myself to God so that I would sleep well, I would spend a little while pondering Christ's prayer in the garden. Actually, I started this habit before I even became a nun, because someone had told me that it was a good way to atone for my transgressions. I see now that this custom was a great benefit to me, because without my even realizing what was happening, it was preparing me for the practice of prayer. Just as I could never forget to make the sign of the cross before bed, I became totally used to picturing this episode in Christ's life. Now, to get back to what I was saying about the way my distracting thoughts used to torment me. The wandering mind is a hazard of non-vocal prayer. Without the support of the discursive intellect, we can either make great progress or become utterly lost. The soul who does advance goes far because she is carried by love. But there is a high price to pay for this kind of progress, except for those souls whom the Lord decides to bring very quickly to the prayer of quiet. I have known some souls like these. For those who walk the path of silent prayer, a book can be a useful device to prompt recollection. I have also found it helpful to gaze at meadows, flowers, and water. Creation reflects the Creator. These things have awakened me and brought me back to recollection, as a book would. They also remind me to be grateful and good. My mind was so dense that I could never imagine sublime things until the Beloved showed them to me in a way I could understand. My ability to picture things in my mind was so poor that I could never engage my imagination unless I had seen the thing I was trying to visualize. Other people are able to use their imaginations to recollect themselves in prayer, but mine is of no use to me. I could think of Christ as a man, but I couldn't really see him. No matter how much I read about Christ's beauty or how many pictures I saw of him, I was like a blind person or someone sitting in the dark. If such a person is speaking with another and feeling him beside her, this is enough to convince her that he is actually there even if she can't see him. This is what I experienced when I thought about our Lord. That's why I have always been so fond of pictures. I really feel sorry for people who purposely abandon images. 
Obviously, they do not love the Lord, because if they did, they would enjoy looking at his picture, just as they would delight in seeing portraits of the ones they deeply love on this earth. Around this time, someone gave me a copy of the new translation of the Confessions of St. Augustine. The Lord must have ordained this, because I never asked for this book, nor had I ever seen it. I have great affection for St. Augustine. Our Lady of Grace, the first convent where I lived when I was still a lay person, belonged to his order, and he was a sinner, like me. I drew great comfort from saints who once were sinners before God brought them back to himself. I thought they could help me on my way. If the Lord forgave them, there was hope that he would forgive me. The thing that left me inconsolable was that God only had to call them once and they returned to him. But I slid back so many times that I was exhausted. Still, when I reflected on his love for me, I would regain my courage. Even though I was plagued by doubts about myself, I never doubted the mercy of God. Oh God, help me. I am astonished to see how unresponsive I was in the face of all the help you gave me. It terrifies me to see how little I could ever accomplish on my own. A thousand attachments prevented me from following through on my intention to give myself entirely to God. As I began to read the Confessions, I perceived my own story written there. I couldn't help but entrust myself to this glorious saint. When I came to the passage about how he heard the voice in the garden and was in that moment converted, I felt in my heart that the Lord was speaking directly to me. Overcome by wordless weariness, I dissolved into tears and remained that way for a long time. Oh God, help me. How a soul suffers when she loses the freedom to be who she truly is. What torment she endures. I am amazed to see that I survived such pain. Praise be to God who gave me life when I was on the brink of such a deadly death. I think that His Divine Majesty must have heard my mournful cries and been moved by my tears. He bolstered my soul with new strength. I started yearning to spend more time alone with him. I lost all my taste for sinful things. The space they left behind filled immediately with new love of God. I was sure that I loved him. At least I thought I did, but I didn't have the slightest notion what that love was truly about. It seems to me that I was not quite ready to surrender myself completely to his service when, all of a sudden, his majesty began to bless me all over again. Without my presuming to ask, the beloved seemed determined to bestow on me the sweet devotional gifts that other souls labor so rigorously to experience. He poured comfort and joy into my soul, while all I ever wanted was forgiveness for my wrongdoing and the grace to honor him. Knowing how seriously I had transgressed, I would never have dared to wish for such favors and consolations. But he showed me abundant mercy and compassion. He drew me into him and allowed me to bask in his presence. I knew that I never could have entered this place unless he himself had brought me there. The only time in my life I remember asking God for relief was once when my soul felt dried up. But as soon as I realized what I was doing, I became deeply distressed at my own lack of humility, and my very shame triggered the grace I was longing for. It's not that I thought there was anything wrong on principle with asking for consolation and prayer. It's just that I felt that only those who are ready, those who have tried with all their might to love God and to do good works, deserve to make such a request. These Tears of mine struck me as girlish and ineffectual, because they did not win me what I desired. But I see now that they were beneficial. After two occasions of being so powerfully moved, overcome by distress over my sins and deep soul weariness, I began to leave my wicked ways behind and to devote myself more constantly to contemplative prayer. I did not give up those harmful old habits completely, but... God helped me to gradually turn away from them. All His Majesty was waiting for was some measure of preparation on my part. Then the spiritual blessings continued to blossom in me, 
as I will now describe. But it is very unusual for our beloved to grant such grace to someone whose conscience is as impure as mine was. Chapter 10 First Favors I need to tell you about my first fleeting yet undeniable tastes of God. Sometimes, when I was visualizing Christ inside of me, or even if I was just reading, the unexpected presence of God would sweep over me in such a dramatic way that I could not possibly doubt that He was within me or that I was enfolded by Him. This was not any kind of vision. I believe they call it a mystical experience. In this state, the soul seems to be suspended totally outside itself. The will still loves. The memory is practically empty. And the intellect, though not completely lost, ceases to function, standing in amazement of all it suddenly understands. It seems that God wants the mind to know that it knows nothing at all of what He is communicating. Before this, I would frequently experience a deep devotional tenderness. This is something we can partly attain, I think, through our own efforts. It is a God-given gift that belongs neither totally to the senses nor completely to the spirit. I have noticed that we can sometimes trigger this state by reflecting on our own insignificance and on the awesome greatness of God. It also helps to think about how much Christ has done for us, about the intense pain of His passion and the sorrows of His life, and to rejoice in the recognition of His good works, His nobility of being, and His boundless love for us. If we really want to make progress on the path, there are many other blessings that we may often stumble upon, even when we are not seeking them. When we engage in spiritual practice with love, our souls are uplifted and our hearts are softened, which may stimulate a gentle upwelling of tears. Sometimes our tears seem forced. Other times, it seems like the Beloved is drawing them out of us and we cannot resist Him. His Majesty appears to reward us for our small efforts by blessing us with the sweet relief of weeping for love of so great a Lord. This does not surprise me. The soul has ample reason to find comfort in a love that surpasses all understanding. Here, the soul finds solace. Here, she finds joy. A comparison comes to mind at this point, and I think it's a good one. The joys of prayer must be something like the joys of heaven. Souls in heaven perceive only as much as the Lord allows them to perceive, in proportion to the merits they earned when they were alive. Realizing how small her virtues are, each soul is content with whatever place is given to her. There is an even greater difference between one heavenly joy and another than there is between various spiritual delights here on earth. Following those moments in which God opens the heart during the early stages of the spiritual path, the soul truly feels that she has been more than compensated for her service to Him and there is nothing left for her to desire. She would be more than correct. Remember, a single instance of these holy tears is so powerful that it cannot be purchased with all the trials in the world. While we seem to play some part in attaining this state of tenderness, we can accomplish nothing without God. And what greater reward is there than to be given evidence that we are in some small way pleasing our Beloved? Let anyone who has come this far recognize our debt of gratitude and praise God. For it seems that God has chosen us for His kingdom, and that if we do not turn back, He will take us into His own house. We should try to avoid false humility, which I'll say more about later. For instance, we may think it's humble to pretend not to notice that the Beloved is bestowing sweet gifts of grace upon us. Let me make something perfectly clear. God is giving us these blessings irrespective of our merits. Let us thank His Majesty for them. If we do not acknowledge what we are receiving, our hearts are not awakened to love. The more we remember our poverty, then the richer these gifts make us feel, rendering our humility more genuine and advancing our spiritual progress. Another mistake the soul makes is to be afraid of grace. 
we assume that we are unworthy of receiving divine favors. Then, when the Beloved begins to grant these blessings, we worry about spiritual pride. We need to trust that the one who gives us these gifts also gives us the grace to discriminate when the spirit of evil tries to tempt us in this way, making us strong enough to resist the temptation. All we need to do is walk in simplicity before God, striving to please Him alone. We seem to love other human beings most when we remember the kindness they have shown us. Now, it is righteous, in fact, it is laudable, for us to remember that we owe our being to God, who created us from nothing and sustains us. It is correct and commendable for us to reflect on Christ's passion and His death, which He suffered for each of us living today, long before we were created. Why, then, would it be wrong for me to notice and understand and frequently ponder that, when all I used to talk about was trivial? Now the Beloved has granted me the desire to speak only of Him. Here is a jewel that has been given to us in love. When we remember that we have it, how can we fail to be aroused to love the one who gave it to us? Love is the fruit of prayer that is grounded in humility. Wait until we receive other, even more precious gifts. Some souls who serve God, for instance, are rewarded with an abiding detachment from the things of the world and even from themselves. Acknowledging God's boundless generosity such people are undoubtedly moved by even deeper gratitude and inspired to be of even greater service. They must be aware that they have nothing to do with any of these blessings. Personally, I would have been more than satisfied to have received a single spiritual jewel. And yet the Beloved chose to bestow more riches than I could ever begin to desire on a soul as undeserving as I. We must be sure to draw from every blessing the fresh strength we need to be of service. And we must always be grateful. For the Lord gives us these treasures on the condition that we make good use of His gifts. If we do not rise to the high state to which He lifts us, He will take it all away again, and we will be left poorer than before. Then His Majesty will give those jewels to someone else, who will display them properly and use them both for her own benefit and for the good of all. How can people make good use of their riches and spend them generously if they don't even realize that they are rich? In my opinion, it is impossible, given human nature, for anyone to have the courage to do great things if he is unaware that he is favored by God. We are pathetically attached to worldly things. Unless we realize that we already have divine things in our possession, how can we succeed in detaching ourselves and walking away from the attractions of the world? By pledging heavenly gifts to us, the Beloved replenishes the strength we ourselves have drained through our transgressions. Until we have some promise of God's love, we will have trouble bearing the universal disapproval and persecution suffered by those of us on fire with living faith. Our nature is so dense that we tend to go after whatever we see dangled in front of us. And so, it is these favors from God that ignite and strengthen our faith. Of course, it may well be that I am erroneously measuring others against myself. Others may find that the truth of perfect faith is enough to inspire them to do perfect things, whereas I'm such a poor wretch that I need much more. In fact, I need everything. Everyone must speak for herself. All I can do is tell you what happened to me, as I have been ordered to do. If the person who is reading this does not approve, he can just tear it up. He knows better than I what is wrong with it, but I implore him, for the love of the Lord, to publish what I have said about my miserable little life up to this point. I hereby grant this permission to him and to all my other confessors. They are welcome to publish this now, in my own lifetime, so that I will no longer be deceiving the ones who believe there is some good in me. Insofar as I understand myself at all, I assure you that this would give me great comfort. I do not, however, authorize the publication of anything I say from this point on. If they show the next part to anyone, please do not tell who it is that wrote it or whose experiences it is describing. This is why I do not mention myself by name and why I have conveyed all this in such a way 
that it would be difficult for most people to identify me. For the love of God, I implore you to honor my privacy. If the Lord gives me the grace to say something good here, in which case, of course, it is His and not mine at all, then the authority of such learned and serious men as you should be sufficient endorsement. I am not learned, nor have I led a good life. I have not even had instruction from learned men, or from anyone else, for that matter. Only those who commanded me to write this know what I am working on, and they are not here to guide me right now. I almost have to steal time to write, and I do so with some reluctance because it gets in the way of my spinning. We are a poor monastery here, and there is so much work to be done. If the Lord had given me greater intellectual capacity and a better memory, I might have benefited from the things I've heard and read. But I have retained very little. And so, if I have said anything right, it is because the Lord has willed it for reasons all His own. If, however, I have said something wrong, the fault is entirely mine and you can simply strike it out. Regardless of the merits of the things I say, there is no advantage to revealing my name. During my lifetime, of course, it would not be appropriate to talk about anything good that I might have done. And after I am dead, there would be no point in mentioning my association with such things, since to do so would only devalue their goodness. Besides, who would ever believe that such a lowly person as I would be involved in such exalted matters? I do have confidence that for the love of God, you and the others who read this manuscript will respect my wishes. That's why I'm expressing myself so freely. Otherwise, I would have terrible qualms about telling anything other than my sins, which I have no hesitation in admitting. As for the rest, just being a woman is enough to make my wings droop, let alone the fact that I am such a wicked one. Since you have insisted that I give some account of the favors God gives to me in prayer, it is up to you to make sure that what I say is in conformity with the truths of our holy Catholic faith. If it is not, I am willing for you to burn this immediately. And I will say what has happened to me so that if it conforms to these truths, it might be of some use to you. If it does not conform, then you will disillusion me. And if it turns out that I am not gaining what I think I am, at least the spirit of evil will not gain it. The Lord knows well that I have always been a seeker of the light. No matter how clearly I wish I could speak about contemplative prayer, it will remain obscure to anyone who has not experienced it. What I will do is describe certain obstacles people commonly encounter along the path and some other dangerous things the Lord has shown me through experience. Recently, I have been discussing these things with men of great learning and other people who have spent years living spiritual lives. They acknowledge that although I may have navigated my path poorly and often stumbled, His Majesty has given me more experience in 27 years of practicing prayer than most people receive in 37 or even 47. Of course, their progress is probably the result of regular penance and consistent virtue. May he be blessed for everything, and may he make good use of me. My Lord well knows that all I want is for people to praise him and magnify his name when they see that he has planted a garden of sweet flowers on such a dirty, stinky pile of manure. And may he grant that I not pull these beauties back up by their roots through my own unconsciousness and fall right back into being the way I used to be. I beseech you, for the love of our Lord, to pray for me, since you know me far better than you have allowed me to reveal myself here. Part 2. The Four Waters Chapter 11. The Garden Let's talk now about the ones who are beginning to become servants of love. This is exactly what happens to us, I think when we take up the path of prayer with determination and follow He who has loved us so much. This is such a high station that the very thought of attaining it transports me with a strange exaltation. If we conduct ourselves correctly during this early stage, 
all insipid fears vanish. O Lord of my soul and my good, there are souls so determined to love you that they gladly abandon everything else to focus on nothing but loving you. Why don't you want them to immediately ascend to a place where they may receive the joyful gift of perfect love? Wait, I said that wrong. What I ought to be complaining about is that we ourselves don't want this grace. If we fail to reach for this state of sublime dignity, it's our own fault. Don't we realize that the perfect possession of true love of God brings every blessing with it? We are so slow and so stingy about giving ourselves completely to God. Why should His Majesty desire to give us something so precious as perfect love? We need to pay the price of rigorous self-preparation. It is clear to me that there is nothing on earth with which we could ever purchase such a divine blessing. Yet, if we do all that we can, if we avoid getting attached to worldly things and concentrate exclusively on heavenly things, as the saints have demonstrated, then I believe without a doubt that this great gift would swiftly be given to us. The problem is, we think we're giving all that we have to God when all we are offering Him is the interest or the fruit while withholding the capital or the orchard itself. We may surrender to our poverty, and this is a good thing, but then we often obsess on having enough of what we've given up. Sometimes we even scheme about how we're going to store up some extra or cultivate relationships with people who will ensure that our needs are met. All this does is put us in a greater state of anxiety, and maybe even danger, than we suffered before we freed ourselves from bondage to our possessions. We may also renounce our self-importance when we embark on the spiritual path in pursuit of perfection. Yet the minute someone challenges our good name to the slightest degree, we forget that we have offered up our personal status to God and try to snatch it right back out of His hands, so to speak. Hadn't we just finished appointing Him Lord of our wills? This happens with everything else, too. What a charming way we have of seeking God's love. Our hands are already full of our own attachments. We make no effort to lift our affections above the earth and carry them to fulfillment, and yet we demand spiritual comforts. These two desires, the divine and the personal, strike me as being mutually exclusive. Since we are incapable of giving ourselves up whole, we will not receive the whole of the heavenly treasure. May it please the Lord to give it to us drop by drop even if receiving it cost us all the trials in the world. Whenever God gives a person the grace and the courage to strive for this blessing with all her heart and soul, He is bestowing the greatest mercy. God does not deny Himself to anyone who perseveres. Little by little, He increases her courage, ensuring that she will reach her goal. I keep saying courage, because in the beginning the spirit of evil erects many obstacles to prevent us from setting out on the path. The spirit of evil knows that if it lets this one soul get away, it is sure to lose many others. I truly believe that if a beginner strives, with the help of God, to reach the summit of perfection, she will not reach heaven alone but will bring many souls home with her. Like a good captain, she will deliver everyone in her care to God. The spirit of evil creates so much chaos along the way that if the soul has any hope of not turning back, she will require not a little courage, but a lot, and plenty of help from God as well. Let's take a look at the early stages of the path. For those who are determined to pursue this blessing and emerge from this adventure victorious, the beginning is the most difficult part. The soul struggles and God responds with a flow of grace. In the more advanced degrees of prayer, our primary task is simply to enjoy God. Still, whether we find ourselves at the beginning, middle, or final stage of our path, we all carry our crosses, even though no two crosses are alike. All who follow Christ must walk the path He walked if they don't want to get lost. Blessed be the trials that even in this lifetime are so abundantly rewarded. At this point, I'm going to have to resort to metaphor. Since I am a woman and only writing what I have been ordered to write, I hesitate to speak this way, 
But it is difficult to get the language of the spirit just right, especially for someone like myself who is uneducated. And so, I will have to find some alternative means for expressing myself. It may be that my metaphors are ineffective, in which case you can use my foolishness as the opportunity for a good laugh. It seems to me that I have read or heard of this metaphor somewhere, but since my memory is so poor, I have no idea where it comes from or what it was meant to illustrate. So I am content to borrow it for my own purposes for now. Let the beginner think of herself as a gardener who is preparing to plant a garden for the delight of her beloved. But the soil is barren and full of noxious weeds. His Majesty himself pulls up the weeds and replaces them with good seed. Bear in mind that the minute the soul sets out on the path of prayer and service, God has already begun to cultivate her soil in this way. Like good gardeners, our job is to tend those plants with loving care, striving to get them to grow. We labor to water them so that they will not wither, but instead bud and bloom, emitting the most sublime fragrance and giving this Lord of ours great pleasure. This inspires him to enter often into our garden and enjoy himself amid the array of virtues. Let's see now how this garden needs to be watered. In this way, we will understand what we have to do, the price we have to pay to do it, whether the gain exceeds the cost of labor, and how long we might expect to have to work before our efforts come to fruition. It occurs to me that our garden can be watered in four ways. We can pull water up from a well. This is a lot of work. Or we can turn the crank of a water wheel and draw the water through an aqueduct. I have tried this method, and I know that it is not as labor-intensive and yields more water. Or we can channel the flow of water through irrigation ditches. This results in deeper saturation of the soil and lasts longer, which makes less work for the gardener. Or the water may come directly from an abundant rain. This is when the Lord waters the garden himself, without any effort on our part. And this is by far the most effective method of all. It is important to me to apply these four ways of watering the garden to the four degrees of prayer to which the Lord in His great kindness has sometimes raised my soul. Remember, water is the only way to maintain the garden. Without it, everything will die. May it please His goodness that I manage to speak in such a way that it might be of some use to one of the men in particular who has ordered me to write this. In four months, this man has made more spiritual progress than I have made in 17 years. He has prepared himself better, so without any labor on his part, his garden is watered in all four ways, although he only receives the last kind of water in drops. At this rate, you will soon be submerged. If this man finds my description amusing, he is more than welcome to laugh at me. We might say that beginners in prayer are the ones who draw water from the well. As I have mentioned, this requires a lot of labor. Accustomed to a life of distractions, they exhaust themselves trying to recollect their senses. Beginners need to practice withdrawing their attention from what they see and hear. They should sit in solitude and reflect on their past life. As I will explain later, everyone needs to spend some time thinking about her past but the extent to which each person must do this varies. In the beginning, this kind of reflection is painful. The practitioner is not sure if she genuinely regrets her transgressions. The clearest sign of repentance is her burning desire to serve God. All she needs to do is meditate on the life of Christ, and her intellect will exhaust itself. And so there are certain things we can do to advance on the path but we must always remember that everything we do is with the help of God. Without His support, as everyone knows, we cannot think a good thought. This phase corresponds to fetching water from the well. May God grant that there is water in it. All we can do is our part, dipping our bucket and drawing it up to water the flowers. God is so good that if even the well is dry, He sustains the garden without water and makes our virtues flower anyway. Like good gardeners, we do whatever lies in our power and leave the rest to Him. 
His majesty has a purpose for everything, and this aridity may ultimately be to our advantage. What I mean here by water are tears of love longing, or at least a tenderness of interior devotion. But what happens when many days go by and all the gardener experiences is dryness, distaste, and a total lack of desire to even bother to draw water? Only the thought that what she is doing gives service and pleasure to the Lord of the garden keeps her from giving up. She needs to carefully guard whatever merits she has gained so far from the tedious labor of letting the bucket down into the well shaft and hauling it up empty over and over. Often she will find that she cannot even lift her arms for this work or come up with a single worthy notion. When I speak of trying to draw water from a well, what I mean, of course, is engaging the intellect in meditation. What then? Well, then the gardener rejoices. She is consoled and considers it an incomparable blessing to be able to work in the garden of such a great emperor. Her purpose is to please him, not herself. And knowing that her labor is pleasing to him, she praises God with all her heart. The master has confidence in the gardener because he sees that without any compensation, she so carefully tends what has been entrusted to her. Let her also help Christ to carry his cross. Let her remember that the Lord lived with this cross all his life. Do not let her ever abandon the path of prayer or seek God's kingdom here on earth. Even if this aridity lasts throughout her whole life, let her resolve never to let Christ fall under the weight of his cross. The time will come when the Lord will repay her all at once. She does not need to be afraid that her labor is going to waste. She is serving a good master, and he's keeping his eye on her. She must ignore her negative thoughts, remembering that the spirit of evil tried to use such tricks on St. Jerome in the desert. These trials take their toll. I should know. I endured them for many years, and I know how extraordinary they are. Whenever I was able to squeeze a drop of water from the sacred well, I considered it to be a mercy from God. Such labor seems to me to require more courage than many worldly tasks combined. But I have clearly seen that God does not fail to reward us generously even in this lifetime. A single hour tasting His glory more than compensates me for all the anguish I have suffered in persevering for so long in prayer. I believe that the Lord sends these trials in the beginning and many other temptations later to test His lovers. Before He is willing to lay great treasure inside us, we need to prove that we are capable of drinking from His chalice and carrying His cross. It seems to me that His Majesty puts us through all this to remind us of our insignificance. The blessings He will give to us later are so exalted that he wants us first to experience our own imperfection so that what happened to Lucifer won't happen to us. Is there anything you could possibly do, my beloved, that is not for the greater good of the soul? You know that she is already yours. She places herself in your power. She will follow you wherever you go, even to death on the cross. And she is determined to help you bear that cross and never leave you alone with it. Those who see this kind of determination in themselves have absolutely nothing to fear. Spiritual people, do not be distressed. Once you have been placed in such a high state that all you really want is to leave the cares of the world behind and commune in solitude with your God, the majority of your work is done. Praise the Lord for this and trust in His goodness. He never fails His friends. Cover the eyes of your mind and banished thoughts such as, why has God given that person an experience of devotion after only a few days of practicing prayer and nothing to me when I have been hard at work for so many years? Let us trust that it's all for our own good. Let His Majesty lead the way along the path He chooses. We do not belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to God. He grants us an immeasurable blessing when he gives us the desire to dig in his garden and be in the presence of the Lord of the garden 
who is certainly present within us. What difference does it make if he gives me water from the well to nurture some of these plants and flowers, while others thrive without it? Your will be done, O Lord. Help me never to forsake you. Whatever virtues you have in your great kindness bestowed on me, let them not be lost now. Since you suffered, my beloved, I am willing to suffer. Manifest your will in me in every way, and do not give anything as precious as your love to anyone who only serves you expecting to get something in return. I know from experience that those whose souls progress are the ones who set out on the path of contemplative prayer with determination and persuade themselves to ignore whether the Beloved is giving them the blessing of tenderness and devotion or is withholding it from them. If they succeed in detaching from self-gratification, neither rejoicing when the Lord gives them these favors nor becoming discouraged when they are taken away, they should have no fear of falling back, even when they stumble. The foundation of their building rests on solid ground. They understand that the love of God is not about tears or tenderness or relief, but serving Him with humility, fortitude, and righteousness. Otherwise, all they do is take without giving anything in return. Poor women like me, on the other hand, are weak lacking fortitude. It seems appropriate to me that we would be led with holy favors. These gifts are leading me even now, instilling me with the strength I need to endure some of the trials God has given me to suffer. But it appalls me to see prominent, well-educated, and highly intelligent men making such a fuss because God has not given them devotional experience. I don't mean that if God does choose to grant them this consolation, they should not accept it and cherish it. Because if this happens, it is God's will. But if they are not moved by devotion, they should not wear themselves out trying to conjure it up. They should understand that if His Majesty is not giving it to them, they don't need it. They should take control of themselves and move on. They need to see their desire for consolations and prayer as a fault. Not only have I witnessed this, but I have proved it true. Such cravings are the artifact of imperfection. They reflect the lack of both freedom of spirit and the courage to overcome adversity. I am emphasizing this because it is very important to cultivate such freedom and determination. This is less of an issue for beginners than it is for those who have made some progress. Many people start on the spiritual path, but never reach the end. I think this is because they refuse to embrace the cross at the onset. Believing they are accomplishing nothing, they become despondent. They cannot bear it when the intellect ceases to function. They do not realize that when the mind is stilled, the will is growing strong and robust. We need to realize that the Lord does not care about the things we worry about. They may seem like faults to us, but they are not. His Majesty already knows our misery and our inadequacy better than we could ever know ourselves. He also knows that all we really want is to think of Him and love Him always. It is our determination that He desires. The suffering we create for ourselves has no other purpose than to disquiet our souls. Then if we fail to profit from an hour of prayer, we waste four more hours fretting over it. Sometimes the problem actually stems from a physical condition. I have a great deal of personal experience in this matter, and having carefully analyzed it and discussed it with spiritual people, have confirmed that what I say is true. We feel so miserable that our poor little imprisoned souls end up sharing in the misery of the body. Changes in the weather and our natural body cycles prevent us from doing what we really want to do and causes all kinds of suffering. This is not our fault. The more we try to force ourselves at times like these, the worse our condition becomes and the longer it lasts. We need to use discernment and take care not to smother the poor soul. We need to acknowledge when we are sick. Then our spiritual practice may have to be adjusted. Sometimes these changes will be necessary for several days. Let us suffer our exile as best we can. It is a sad thing. When a soul in love with God realizes that she is a host to such a wretched guest as the body, 
which prevents her from doing what she really wants. The reason I mention the need for discernment is that sometimes it is the spirit of evil that is causing the problem. Just as it is not always a good idea to torture the soul into doing what she is incapable of doing, it is not always appropriate to give up on prayer the minute we encounter severe turmoil and distraction. We do have alternatives. We can engage in certain external activities, such as works of charity or spiritual reading. Sometimes, of course, we are not even well enough for these. In that case, let us serve our body out of love for God, remembering all the times the body has served the soul. A genuinely holy conversation can function as an authentic spiritual practice. Our guides might also recommend that we spend some time in nature. Experience is a great teacher because it helps us to see what is best for us and to realize that God can be served by everything we do. His yoke is easy. It is of the utmost importance that we do not drag our souls, as they say, but lead them gently. In this way, we will make much better progress. I don't care how many times I repeat myself. I must return to this essential advice. Do not let feelings of emptiness or distracting thoughts distress you or disquiet your soul. Do you desire liberation? Do you wish you weren't always so troubled? Then do not be afraid of the cross. You will see how the Lord helps you to carry it. Then you will make joyful progress and find blessings everywhere you look. It is clear that if the well is dry, we cannot put water in it. Still, it is equally true that we should never stop dipping our buckets, because when there is water there, God uses it to multiply our virtues. Chapter 12 Lifting the Bucket I know that I digressed quite a bit in the previous chapter, but that's because I felt that what I had to say was very necessary. What I have been trying to explain is that we can accomplish a great deal through our own efforts and help ourselves to experience deep devotion during this initial phase of the spiritual path. When we think and reflect on what Christ suffered for us, we are moved by compassion. The sorrow that arises may bring tears, and there is an inexplicable sweetness in this. Thinking about the glory we are hoping for, the love Christ demonstrated for us, and the miracle of His resurrection, we are filled with a joy that is neither wholly spiritual nor entirely sensory. But it is a virtuous joy, and the corresponding sorrow is equally worthy. There is virtue and worth in everything that awakens devotion, even if it comes in part through the labor of the intellect. Of course, this devotional blessing cannot be earned or obtained unless the Beloved chooses to bestow it. If God has not yet raised a soul higher than this, it is best for her not to strive to elevate herself. All she will do is thwart her own progress and suffer harm. Please take special note of this danger. There are many things the soul can do in this state to awaken love. She can make resolutions to serve God and engage in other acts that stimulate the growth of virtue. There is a book called The Art of Serving God, which does a fine job of explaining these things. It is appropriate reading for those who are at this stage in which the intellect is still an active participant in spiritual practice. The soul can picture herself in the presence of Christ in all His sacred humanity and build up the fire of love. She can keep Him close to her always, talking to Him, asking Him for the things she needs, and confiding her troubles. When she feels joy, she can rejoice with Him, but she must never let the good times make her forget Him. She should try to communicate with Him, not through prescribed prayers, but with the words of her own heart that express her desires and needs. This is an excellent way to make rapid progress. Any soul who strives to remain in Christ's precious company, who is sincerely grateful for this intimacy, and who truly finds herself in love with this Lord, who has done so much for us, is the soul I consider to be evolved. This is why we should not be distressed when we are not moved by devotion. 
we should simply thank God, who allows us to want only to please Him, even if our efforts seem less than successful. This practice of carrying Christ in our consciousness is beneficial at all phases of the spiritual path, especially in these first degrees of prayer, and it quickly advances us to the second. It also safeguards us against the perils with which the spirit of evil may confront us in the later stages. So, this is what we can do for ourselves. Anyone who tries to do more than this, struggling to elevate the spirit to obtain a taste of a divine sweetness that is not freely given, risks losing everything he has gained so far and jeopardizing future growth. These blessings belong to the realm of the supernatural. If he puts the intellect to sleep prematurely, he finds his soul desolate in a dry desert. Since the entire edifice is built on humility, the nearer we draw to God, the more we must cultivate this virtue. If we don't, everything will be ruined. Our Lord is already doing too much for us by drawing us into His presence, considering how imperfect we are. I see that it is arrogant for us to desire to ascend higher. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't raise our consciousness by reflecting on sublime things, such as the wonders of heaven and the great wisdom of God. Personally, I never had the ability to reflect in this way, as I have mentioned, and besides, I was too wretched to try. God gave me the grace early on to recognize how much courage it requires for me to even reason my way through worldly things, let alone ponder divine things. But other people can benefit from this practice, especially if they are educated. Education, in my opinion, is like a treasure that can only enhance this practice, as long as the learning is grounded in humility. I witnessed this phenomenon only a few days ago among some educated men who have only recently begun to practice prayer and have already made remarkable progress. This only reinforces my conviction that educated men should become spiritual men. I will say more about this later. When I say that we should not raise ourselves up to God until He raises us Himself, I am speaking the language of the Spirit. Anyone who has experience will understand me. If I'm not making myself understood, I don't know what more I can say about it. In mystical experience, the intellect ceases to function because God suspends it. If God gives me the grace and the help to explain it better, I will elaborate on this later. For now, please understand that we should not take it upon ourselves to shut down the mind. If we stop using the intellect, we will be left frozen and stupid, accomplishing nothing. When the Lord suspends the intellect and stems the flow of thoughts, He Himself gives it something to astonish and occupy it. Without any thought, the mind understands more in the length of time it takes to recite the creed than we could possibly learn in an entire lifetime through our own human efforts. To presume that we can keep the faculties of the soul busy and the mind quiet at the same time is ridiculous. Even if I am misunderstood, I will say it again. This effort to suspend the intellect is not very humble. It may not constitute a terrible mistake, but it is certainly a waste of time and energy, and it's an exercise in frustration. The soul is left like a person who is about to leap forward and is suddenly pulled back by someone else. She feels like she has depleted all her strength and has not achieved what she set out to achieve with it. Anyone who wishes to take a look at this will detect that small lack of humility I mentioned reflected in the small spiritual progress made here. Humility has this excellent quality. When it is present in any act, the act never leaves the soul with that sense of frustration. I think I have explained this clearly, but maybe I have only clarified it for myself. May the Lord open the eyes of the ones who are reading this. May He give them the experience they need to understand it, even if just a little. For many years, I read a lot of things and didn't understand anything I read. Even though God was blessing me, for a long time I couldn't come up with the words to describe His blessings. This was no small trial. Then, in a single moment, His Majesty amazed me by teaching me everything all at once. There is one thing I can say for sure. I spoke with many spiritual people about my experiences, 
and they tried their best to explain what the Lord was giving to me so that I would be able to talk about it. But I was too dense to understand them. Or maybe, since His Majesty has always been my greatest teacher, it was the Lord's wish that I had only Him to thank for my understanding. May He be blessed for everything. It upsets me to confess the truth about all that He has given to me. I neither requested nor desired these things. In fact, I have never even been curious about their significance, although I would have been a virtue to try and understand them. As it was, I was far more interested in trivial matters. And yet God gave me a moment of such dazzling clarity that I suddenly understood everything that had happened to me and was able to explain it all in a way that astonished me even more than it did my spiritual directors, since I was far more aware of my own stupidity than they were. Since this happened only a short time ago, I will not try to understand beyond what he has already taught me, unless it is a matter of conscience. I repeat my warning one more time. It is very important for the Spirit not to ascend unless the Lord raises it up. If he does, we will know it instantly. This effort is especially damaging for women because the spirit of evil can more readily delude us. Still. I am certain that the Lord would not allow any harm to come to someone who was humbly striving to reach Him. Instead, she is more likely to profit from the very experience the spirit of evil used to throw her off course. Many people travel the path of beginners, and the advice I have offered is exceedingly important. This is why I have elaborated to such an extreme. I admit that other writers have explained all this much better. In fact, it has embarrassed me to attempt this at all, although not as much as it probably should have. May the Lord be blessed for everything who wills and consents for such a creature as I to speak about his lofty and sublime graces. Chapter 13 Joyful Abandon It occurs to me now to mention certain temptations that I have noticed tend to assail beginners. I myself have grappled with many of these, and I think I have some important advice to offer. As you embark on the spiritual path, try to remember to walk with joyful abandon. Some people think that if they relax a little, their devotion will fall apart. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being self-aware so that you avoid letting arrogance lead you into habitual patterns that dishonor God. There aren't many people who are so perfect that they can afford to let down their guard against the snares of human nature altogether. So, until we are wholly virtuous, some vigilance is necessary. Throughout our lives, it is important to be mindful of our own insignificance, because this hones our humility. But there are many good reasons to engage in recreation, as I have said. For one thing, it enables us to return to prayer reinvigorated. We just need to use a little discretion in everything we do. Be confident. Don't hold back your heart's desires. Believe in the power of God. With His help, we will gradually reach the station that the saints attained. We just need to keep striving. If the saints had not been singular in their desire and steadfast in their determination, applying themselves little by little, they would never have risen to such a high state. His Majesty is the friend and lover of courageous souls as long as they walk with humility and shed self-importance. I have never seen such a soul hanging back on the path, nor have I ever noticed a cowardly soul, especially one who hides behind a facade of false humility, make a fraction of the progress in many years that courageous souls make in only a few. I am amazed by how much can be accomplished on this path by being bold and striving for great things. Even if the soul is not quite strong enough yet, she can still lift off and take flight. She can soar to great heights. But like a fledgling bird, she may tire herself out and need to perch for a while. I used to reflect often on the words of St. Paul, who said that all things could be done through God. It was clear that I could accomplish nothing by myself. This understanding was very helpful to me. So were the words of St. Augustine, who said, Give me, Lord, what you ordain, and ordain what you will. 
I've always thought that St. Peter didn't lose a thing by throwing himself into the sea, even though he became afraid as soon as he had done it. This initial determination is crucial. It's also important in the early phase to move slowly, use discretion, and follow the advice of a spiritual guide. Just make sure that your guide doesn't see your soul as a toad capable of only pursuing small lizards. And always be humble, remembering that this strength arises from a power beyond our own. It's important to pay attention to the quality of this humility. One of the ways I believe that the spirit of evil hurts people who practice prayer and prevents them from making progress is by deceiving them about the true nature of humility. It makes us worry that our desire to imitate the saints is delusional and that our longing for self-denial is self-serving. Then it tries to convince us that since we ourselves are sinners, we should look to the saints for inspiration, not imitation. I do agree that it is wise to be discriminating about which deeds of the saints we should imitate and which we are meant to simply admire. It would do no good for a weak or sickly person to take on severe fasts or harsh penances or to go off alone to the desert where she could find no place to sleep and nothing to eat. But we should remember that with God's help we are fully capable of detaching from the world, turning away from personal honor, and releasing our tight grasp on possessions. Our hearts are so stingy that we're afraid we'll lose the earth beneath our feet if we turn our attention away from the body for a single moment and shift our focus to the spirit. We convince ourselves that because our meditations are frequently disturbed by concerns about the necessities of life, all we need to do is secure our material things, and then we will be able to get on with the practice of prayer. It makes me sad that we have so little trust in God and so much regard for ourselves that worries like these so easily throw us off course. The truth is, when we are not evolving on the path, a few petty annoyances are as upsetting as numerous severe trials would be to a more mature practitioner. And we presume to call ourselves spiritual? It seems to me that people in this state are trying to reconcile body and soul in such a way that they obtain maximum comfort here on earth and ensure their entrance to heaven at the same time. If we walk in righteousness and hold fast to virtue, this method is fine. But we will advance at the pace of a chicken. We will never reach spiritual liberation this way. This is a good balance for householders who need to put their worldly obligations first. As for me, there is no way I would be satisfied with that rate of progress, nor could anyone convince me of its value. Believe me, I have tried this kind of compromise, and I would not have moved forward an inch if the Beloved in His mercy had not taught me a shortcut. I have always had strong desires, but as I mentioned, I have attempted to practice prayer and live for my own pleasure at the same time. If only there had been someone to encourage me to soar to greater heights, I might have been able to manifest these desires. But such a guide is very rare. Most spiritual directors are excessively cautious in these matters. I believe that is one of the primary reasons that beginners do not generally make more rapid progress toward perfection. It's not the Lord's fault. He never fails. It's our own lower nature that impedes us. One thing we can do is imitate the saints by seeking solitude and silence. Contrary to what we might believe, cultivating virtues like these does not endanger the well-being of the body. Sometimes the physical seems bent on thwarting the spiritual, and the minute the spirit of evil detects a little apprehension, it joins forces with these wretched bodies of ours to confound our minds. The spirit of evil would like nothing better than to make us think that our devotional practices are going to kill us, or at least do damage to our health. It even suggests that crying will make us go blind. I have been through all of this, and I know. But what higher health or deeper sight could we desire than to lose them both for such a cause? Since I have always been so sickly, I have had a tendency to allow my health to tie me down and keep me from engaging in full devotion. I don't pay so much attention to my body anymore. 
When the spirit of evil put it in my head to worry about compromising my health and prayer, God decided to clear my thinking. So what if I die? I asked myself. And when I wondered if it was all right to feel so tired, I answered myself, I don't need rest. What I need is the cross. I was able to counter many other troubling thoughts in this way. Even though I am chronically ill, I have clearly seen on many occasions that my concerns arose either from the spirit of evil or from my own laziness. Ever since I stopped obsessing about my comfort and ease, my health has radically improved. So it is very important not to be intimidated by our own thoughts in the early stages of the path. You can take my word on this. I know it from experience. It is my hope that simply by reading this litany of my mistakes, you will be able to avoid some of them yourselves. Here is another common temptation. Since we're beginning to enjoy the serenity and growth that comes from prayer, we want everyone else to be on a spiritual path too. There's nothing wrong with this desire. But the attempt to carry it out may backfire unless you use discretion and temper your efforts so it doesn't look like you're trying to teach people. If you hope to do any good in this area, you must always act with integrity. Otherwise, you may end up inadvertently trapping other souls in a snare. I found this out the hard way, so I know what I'm talking about. When I tried to persuade others to practice prayer, they would hear me talking about the wonderful blessings that come from this practice on the one hand, and then observe my own unscrupulous behavior on the other. And I was supposed to be their role model. In fact, I think I served more as a source of temptation and confusion for them. And so they had every reason to miss the mark. Later, they explained to me that they could not find a way to reconcile what I preached and what I practiced. Besides, they actually believed that what was wrong was in fact right, simply because they saw me doing it myself and they respected me. This is a trick of the devil, who tries to twist our virtues to justify his own wicked purposes. No matter how minor our mistakes may be, the devil gains major benefit from them especially if we commit them in spiritual community. Since my wickedness was already excessive, the spirit of evil must have profited all the more. As it turned out, over the course of many years, only three people seemed to have benefited from what I had to say to them. In the two or three years since the Beloved has strengthened me in virtue, however, many people have benefited. This effort of trying to build up other people is a significant drawback. It can detract from our own growth. In the beginning, we need to put ourselves first. The most important thing at this stage is to take care of ourselves. We should pretend that there is no one in the universe but our soul and our God. This is a very useful practice. We all feel a certain zeal for virtue. This may tempt us to judge the sins and failings of other people. The spirit of evil puts it in our minds that the distress we feel over other people's behavior stems only from a desire to protect God from being dishonored. We become so agitated by our desire to remedy the situation that we are unable to practice prayer. The greatest harm lies in our belief that this distress is a mark of our perfect virtue and passion for God. We need to be mindful of this kind of delusion. Genuine concern for the well-being of the community does not disquiet the soul in this way. The safest path for a soul who practices prayer is to pay no attention to anyone or anything else, but to focus instead on knowing herself and pleasing God. This is vitally important. If I were to tell you about all the mistakes I have seen people make in the name of good intentions, I would never be finished talking. Let us always strive to reveal the good qualities in others and let our awareness of our own imperfections conceal their defects. We may not be able to do this perfectly at first, but we will gradually acquire great virtue by seeing everyone else as better than ourselves. Then, by the grace of God, which we always need, since without God's grace nothing is possible, we will begin to grow virtuous. Actually, 
we should beg God to give us these virtues. He never denies anyone who makes a sincere effort. This advice applies to people with very active intellects, who derive a multitude of ideas and concepts from a single thought. For people like me, who don't work well with their minds, my only counsel is to be patient. Eventually, the Lord illuminates us and gives us worthy work to do. Those of us with weak intellects do ourselves more harm than good by trying to think our way to enlightenment. Again, for those of you who are intellectually inclined, I would recommend that you not spend all your time thinking. Even though discursive reason has its place, and it can actually enhance the delight of prayer, intellects forget to observe a Sabbath once in a while and give their minds a rest from all that labor. They think it would be a waste of time. But I consider such waste a tremendous boon. All they need to do, as I have mentioned, is place themselves in the presence of Christ. Instead of wearing themselves out trying to make logical sense of spiritual matters, they should simply speak with Him and delight with Him. They should lay their needs at His feet and acknowledge that He has every right to deny them His company. There is a time for thinking and a time for being. Otherwise, the soul would get tired of always eating the same food. Once we accustom the palate to non-conceptual practices, they become not only delicious, but very helpful. They nourish the soul and give her life, providing all kinds of benefits. I need to keep trying to clarify things, because unless a person has a really masterful spiritual director, these matters are very difficult to understand. For someone with a sharp intellect, like the man who ordered me to write this, just touching on these subjects would be sufficient. But although I wish I could be brief, my own ineptitude prevents me from finding an adequate way to explain such important matters using a minimum of words. I suffered so much myself. I feel sorry for people who only have books to rely on. It's amazing how different what we think we understand is from what we learn later through experience. To come back to what I was saying, Let's begin to think about an episode from the Passion. Let's say when our Lord was bound to the pillar. The intellect gets to work trying to come up with reasons why Christ had to suffer such pain and anguish, struggling to comprehend his loneliness and isolation. If a man is well educated and works hard with his mind, he can glean a great deal of understanding from this kind of exercise. We should all begin, continue, and end with this method of prayer. It's an excellent path to follow, and a safe one, until the Lord leads us in other supernatural directions. I talk about all of us, but there are some souls who do better meditating on other things than the sacred passion. For just as in heaven there are many mansions, so there are many roads that lead there. Some people find it useful to imagine hell. Others benefit from thinking about death. Some have such tender hearts that they cannot bear to stay with the imagery of the passion. They find it comforting and inspiring to dwell on the power and glory of God as manifested in His creatures. They prefer to reflect on His infinite love for us and how this love is revealed in all things. This last way is a very good way, as long as it is balanced by sometimes thinking about the life of Christ and all that He did for our sake. He is the source of all our good, past and present. Beginners on the path require wise counsel to determine what they really need. For this reason, an experienced guide is indispensable. If the spiritual director does not have personal experience, he can be badly mistaken and easily lead souls astray simply because he does not understand them and therefore is incapable of helping them to understand themselves. For their part, Beginners may be so thrilled that they have someone to guide them that they do not deviate from whatever he tells them to do. I have come upon souls so tormented and troubled by the inexperience of their spiritual guides that I felt truly sorry for them. There was one person who had no idea how to act for herself anymore. Ignorant guides do a great deal of damage to body and soul because they do not understand spiritual things. They actually obstruct spiritual progress. One person confided in me 
that her guide had held her in bondage for eight years by refusing to allow her to explore beyond the state of self-knowledge. Since the Beloved had already brought her to the prayer of quiet, this constraint was a great torment to her. We must never neglect this process of self-inquiry. No soul on this path is such a spiritual giant that she doesn't need to return again and again to the divine breast and suckle there. Do not forget this. Since this is so important, I will repeat it often. No stage of prayer is so sublime that the practitioner does not need to come back frequently to the beginning. Self-knowledge is the bread we must feed ourselves along the road of prayer, continuously supplementing the sublime delicacies we are given by God. In fact, without it, we cannot be sustained. Still, we should eat this bread in moderation. We empty ourselves of ourselves. We clearly understand that anything good in us comes not from us, but from God. We remember all that we owe to such a great king, and we feel ashamed of how little we have to repay him. Fine. Do not linger there. It's a waste of time. The Beloved has placed other foods in front of us, and it would be wrong to disregard them. His Majesty knows what foods are best for us to eat at what times. This is why it's so important to work with guides who are well-informed, exhibit good judgment, and have experienced spiritual things themselves. It wouldn't hurt if they had some formal education as well. If they cannot meet all these criteria, they should at least have experience and sound judgment. It's always possible to locate a man of learning and consult with him when particular theological issues come up. Unless a learned man practices prayer himself, all his learning is of little help to beginners on the path. I do not mean to imply that beginners should have nothing to do with educated men. I would rather see a spirit standing on the solid ground of truth without prayer than one who prays but has no knowledge. Learning is a great thing, because learned men teach those of us who know so little and illumine our ignorant minds. When we are exposed to the truths of sacred scripture, we are able to behave the way we should. God saves us from foolish devotions. I should explain myself better, but I keep going off on tangents. I have always been bad at explaining myself. I don't seem to know how to say things without using too many words. All right. A contemplative begins to practice prayer. Her spiritual guide is a fool and he takes it into his head that she should obey him unconditionally. He does not demand this out of malice. If he is not engaged in contemplative practice himself, he will think he is doing the right thing. Maybe she is a householder, and he tells her to ignore the tasks at hand and just pray. This would put a great deal of stress on her marriage and family. Such a spiritual director doesn't know how to arrange things or manage time in a way that conforms to reality. Because he lacks light himself, he is incapable of enlightening anyone else, even though he might sincerely want to. While I do not believe that true knowledge is dependent on education, I do think that every spiritual seeker should make an effort to have conversations with those who have a background in studies. The more educated the person, the better. The more spiritual the one who practices prayer, the greater her need for this kind of input. We should not deceive ourselves by concluding that spiritual directors who do not practice prayer are useless to those of us who do. Over the years, I have increasingly sought the counsel of learned men because I desperately needed it. I have always had educated friends. Even though many of them lack contemplative experience, they certainly do not despise the spirit, nor do they ignore it. After all, the scriptures they study continuously reveal the truth of the good spirit. I believe that the devil will never be able to deceive a soul who practices prayer and consults learned men unless she chooses to be deceived. Real learning, accompanied by humility and virtue, is a terrifying thing to the powers of evil because it finds them out and banishes them. I've emphasized this because there is a popular opinion that unless learned men are also spiritual, there are no help to people who practice prayer. I have already said that I believe it's necessary to have a spiritual director 
and that if he is not a learned man, this lack of learning is a serious drawback. If an educated man has integrity, even if he has not had direct spiritual experience, it can be very useful to consult him. God will help him to explain to us what we need to know. He may even give him the spiritual experience he lacks, and he will benefit us accordingly. I speak from experience. This has happened to me at least twice. I repeat, any contemplative who puts herself in the hands of a single spiritual director without being certain that he possesses all the virtues I have mentioned will be making a big mistake. It is a heavy enough cross to bear when we forge a relationship with a guide who lacks these spiritual qualities. If his understanding is also poor, how can we voluntarily submit to his guidance? I myself have never been able to bring myself to do this, nor do I think that kind of submission is ever a good thing. If the beginner on the path to prayer is not a monastic but a person who lives in the world, she should take advantage of the gift of freedom to choose her own spiritual director and praise God for it. She should take her time in selecting a guide until she finds someone suitable. Meanwhile, she should cultivate her own humility and desire to make spiritual progress. If she does her part in this way, the Beloved will provide the right teacher for her. I praise God with all my heart. All women and other people who have not had the benefit of an education should be infinitely grateful to Him, for He has given us access to men who have labored hard to attain truths that those of us who are ignorant know nothing about. I am frequently amazed that learned men, religious ones in particular, would bother to offer me the fruits of their labors simply because I ask. Imagine, there are people who have no desire to benefit from the work of these scholars. God forbid! I witness these men bearing the intense hardships of monastic life with its many penances, its bad food, its obligation of strict obedience, and it puts me to shame. On top of all of this, they endure a constant lack of sleep. Everything is a trial for them, everything a cross. It seems to me that it would be a terrible waste for anyone to forfeit the benefits of such a life willingly. Those of us who live as we please, free from such burdens, have spiritual food dropped into our mouths, as they say. Because we spend a little more time practicing prayer, we assume that we deserve more than those who have labored long hours to reap the fruits of knowledge. Blessed be you, O Lord, who has made me incompetent and useless, and bless you even more for awakening so many to awaken us. We should pray unceasingly for those who give us light. What will we do without them during these tempestuous times when so many troubles buffet our society? If some of our leaders have gone bad, the good people shine even more brightly. May it please God to hold such souls in His hand and help them to help us. Amen. I certainly have wandered off the subject I meant to speak about. But for those who are embarking on such a lofty journey, Everything can be harnessed to set their feet on the right path. Let's go back to what I was saying about meditating on Christ bound to the pillar. It's good to spend some time thinking and reflecting on the pains he suffered in those moments, why, who he is, and the love with which he bore his suffering. But we should not make a habit of exhausting ourselves in pursuit of these reflections. Rather, we should stay there in his presence with our minds quiet our thoughts at rest. If we can, we should occupy ourselves with simply gazing at He who is gazing at us. We should keep Him company, talk with Him, pray to Him, humble ourselves and delight in Him. Remember what a privilege it is to be near Him. Even if we only start off our prayer in this way, our souls will derive great benefit from this practice. I know mine has. I don't know if I have succeeded in explaining this. You will have to be the judge of that. May it please the Lord that I bring him pleasure forever. Amen. Chapter 14 The Water Wheel 
We have seen how at first we learned to draw water up from the well, sustaining the garden through the labor of our own hands. Now let's explore the second method that the master of the garden teaches us to employ. Turning the crank of a water wheel, the gardener harnesses the forces of nature to pull the water through aqueducts and obtains more water with less effort. She no longer has to work constantly, and she can rest a little. This describes the prayer of quiet, which is what I'd like to discuss next. The prayer of quiet comes when the soul begins to be drawn into a supernatural state of interior recollection. It is not a state of prayer that she can attain through her own efforts, although it is true that it can be tiring to turn the crank that pulls the water through the aqueducts. In this method, we engage the labor of the intellect to fill the bucket of the soul, but the water comes from a higher place now, and so requires much less work than it did to pull it up from the well. What I mean is, the water of grace is much closer now and reveals itself more clearly in the soul. This state is an ingathering of the faculties, allowing the soul to savor the sweetness of prayer more deeply. The other faculties are neither lost nor sleeping, but they are suspended. Only the will is actually occupied. Without knowing how it happened, the will has been taken captive. More than happy to be the prisoner of its beloved, it consents without hesitation. O oh Jesus, O oh Lord of mine, how precious your love is to us in this place. Your love holds our love so closely that we are incapable of loving anything but you. The suspended faculties support the will, expanding its capacity for the enjoyment of so much goodness. Every once in a while, the other faculties can actually make trouble for the soul, even when the will is already united with God. When that happens, the soul should simply ignore them and continue basking in joy and quietude. If the will tries to bring the other faculties along, it risks losing them all. Then the faculties would behave like dissatisfied doves, not content with the food the owner of the dove coat feeds them, food they receive without having to do anything for it, off they go, looking for something better. But discovering that nourishment is scarce out there, they come back. So the wayward faculties go away and then return to see what the will is enjoying so much and if it will share some with them. If the Lord tosses them a handful of food, they stop and eat. If not, they continue their search. The soul who wants to force the faculties of memory and imagination to paint a picture of what she experiences for the benefit of the will may actually be doing more harm than good. The soul needs to treat her faculties with great care, as I will explain. Everything that happens in this state of prayer deeply consoles the soul. Even if the state lasts a long time, it doesn't weary the soul because it costs so little in labor. The intellect works very gently here and extracts much more water than it did from the well. The tears God gives us now flow with joy. Although we cherish them when they come, we do nothing to induce them. This water of bountiful blessings and mercies that the Lord gives us makes our virtues grow more abundantly than the water we drew in the beginning stages of prayer. Now the soul is rising above her misery and glimpsing glory. This not only causes the personal virtues to flower, but it brings the soul much closer to true virtue, that is, God, the source of all goodness. As His Majesty begins to communicate directly to the soul, He wants her to feel this communication in every fiber of her being. Arriving at this place, the soul finds her craving for mundane things falling away. No wonder. She clearly sees that she could never experience a single moment of this sublime glory here on earth. No wealth, no power, no honor or pleasure offers even a fleeting taste of that happiness. For this joy is true joy. It is unconditionally satisfying. It is almost impossible to find satisfaction in our ordinary reality. Earthly things always have a no intertwined with the yes. In a deep state of contemplation, everything is a yes. The no comes later, when the soul realizes that the delight has passed and that she doesn't know how to get it back. 
But even if she were to smash herself to pieces with penances and prayers and all those other practices, it would do no good. It's up to the Lord to decide whether or not to grant her this delight. God, in his greatness, wants the soul to understand now that she doesn't need messengers to communicate with him. She can speak to him herself, and she doesn't need to shout either. He is so near that all she has to do is move her lips, and he will understand her. Maybe it seems silly for me to say this, since obviously God is always with us and he always understands us. There is no doubt about it. But what our emperor and Lord desires is that we know in these moments that he understands us, that we know what his presence means, that we know that he wants to begin working with our soul in a special way. The deep inner and outer satisfaction that washes over us helps us to realize the difference between worldly pleasure and heavenly joy. The void carved out by our transgressions begins to fill up with this sublime sweetness. This joy is bewildering to the soul. It unfolds in her secret depths, and she doesn't know where it comes from or how it happens. She doesn't know what to do, or what to want, or what to ask for. She feels as if she has found everything at once, and yet she has no idea what she has found. Again, I find myself at a loss to explain this. Many things require a framework of learning to be understood properly, and I think this is one of them. It would be helpful, for instance, if I could describe the difference between a general and a particular grace, because many people are ignorant of this distinction. There are many other things I could express more accurately if I had a bit of education. But since this is going to be read by people who will be able to detect any errors in it, I'm going to continue without worrying. I'm well aware that I can be mistaken in both matters of theology and those of the Spirit. Fortunately, since this account will end up in the right hands, I can trust that the learned men who receive it will understand what I'm trying to say and omit anything that's wrong. Still, since we are dealing with the beginning stages of the spiritual path, I feel that it's essential to do my best to explain this experience adequately. When the Beloved first begins to grant the soul these mercies, she doesn't understand what's happening to her or what to do with herself. If God is leading her along a path of fear, as he led me, then her confusion becomes a terrible trial. It's even worse when there is no one around who understands her. That's why it can be such an intense relief to see yourself described in a book. It's affirming to discover that you are on the right path after all. I know how wonderful it is to find out what you need to do to make spiritual progress. I have suffered terribly and wasted so much time not knowing how to proceed. I have tremendous compassion for souls who arrive at this stage only to find themselves alone. Although I have read many spiritual books that touch on these subjects, they don't really explain much. Even if the explanations were ample, an inexperienced soul will have a hard time understanding what is happening to her. I want so much for the Lord to help me convey the effects that these supernatural things begin to have on the soul. By recognizing the effects, the soul may know whether or not the cause is the Spirit of God or something else. I say the soul may know, but I mean only insofar as we can understand heavenly things while we are here on earth. It's always a good thing to walk with caution and restraint, because even though an experience may be the work of God, the spirit of evil can sometimes transform itself into an angel of light, and an inexperienced soul might not be able to tell the difference. In fact, most souls may need to reach the pinnacle of prayer before they develop that degree of discernment. The fact that I have so little time to give to this writing certainly does not help my ability to explain any of this very well. Therefore, His Majesty must come to my rescue. Living in a house that was so recently founded, I am inundated with community duties and other related businesses. I can only write in fits and spurts, and I can never really settle down into it. I wish I had more space to write, because when the Lord gives me inspiration, the words flow with great ease and clarity. Then, writing is just like sketching a model that is sitting right in front of me. But when inspiration is lacking, 
It doesn't matter how many years the person might have spent in prayer. My words make no more sense than if I were speaking Arabic, as the saying goes. And so it seems to me that my only hope is to enter a state of prayer while I am writing. That's when I can clearly see that I am not the one doing the writing. I'm not the one planning out in my mind what I'm going to say, nor do I understand afterward how I managed to say it at all. This happens to me often. Let's return our attention now to our garden. See how the orchard is beginning to bud? Feel how the trees will soon burst into full blossom and then bear fruit? Smell the whiff of carnation and other flowers. This imagery is utterly charming to me. I have always loved the notion of my soul as a garden and the beloved taking his walks in it. When I was beginning on this path, I used to beg His Majesty to intensify the fragrance of those little flowers of virtue that I could see had begun to blossom inside me. I wanted nothing for myself, and so I asked Him to sustain the garden for His own greater glory. Go ahead and cut whatever you please, I said to God. I knew that pruning would only make the flowers bloom with greater vigor. I talk about pruning because there are times when the soul forgets all about the garden. Everything appears to be dry, and it doesn't seem like there will ever be enough water to sustain it. The soul cannot detect a single virtue inside herself. She suffers terrible tribulation because she feels like she has utterly failed to tend and water the garden that has been entrusted to her. This aridity is the will of the Lord. Only when the gardener surrenders her self-importance does God take over. Pulling up the weeds and rooting out every plant that has gone bad no matter how small it may be. She is forced to acknowledge that if God chooses to withhold the water of grace, no amount of effort on her part is going to keep the garden growing. She must see herself as nothing, as less than nothing. Then her humility stimulates the garden to bloom again. O oh my Lord and my greatest good, I cannot say this without crying. My soul rejoices to know the truth that you choose to be fully present with us in the sacrament of Holy Communion. It is our own imperfections that prevent us from being with you all the time, since you have made it clear that you would be happy to be with us, that in fact your greatest delight is to be with the children of the earth. What does this mean? These words have always been deeply consoling to me. Is it possible that there could be a soul, O Lord, who reaches the stage at which you bestow such blessings and mercies on her, and has understood your desire to be with her, and yet goes right back to offending you in spite of all the gifts you have given her? It's not as if she had not received striking demonstrations of your love. The effects of this love are far too obvious to be doubted. Yes, there certainly is such a soul a soul who has done this not once but many times. I am that soul. Please, my beloved, let it be that I am the only one who has been so ungrateful, who has made such terrible mistakes and shown you such flagrant ingratitude. Yet your boundless goodness has drawn out something worthwhile even from my excessive wickedness. The more faithlessly I behaved, the more brilliantly the wonder of your mercy shone. Your blessings are so abundant, I could sing of them forever. Let it be so, my God, I beseech you. Let me sing your praises without end. You have granted your mercies to me so liberally that anyone who witnesses them is awestruck. As for me, your holy compassion transports me beyond myself so that all I can do is glorify you even more. I could not remain inside myself without you in me, Lord. I would be able to do nothing more than cut away the remaining flowers until my garden returned to the state of the dunghill it used to be. Do not let this be, my Lord. Do not give up on the soul you have won through such intense labor. The soul you have rescued again and again from the jaws of the dreaded dragon. Please forgive me. I have wandered off the subject again. Don't be surprised. I'm following a subject of my own. It's just that every time I go inside myself, 
and write about all that I owe my beloved God, something greater than I takes over, triggering a flood of feelings, and I cannot resist continuously proclaiming His glory. I don't think this will displease you very much, since I believe we can sing the same song. Even if the melody is a little different, you and I both know that I owe God even more praise because He has had more reason to grant me forgiveness. Chapter 15 The Prayer of Quiet Now, let's get back to our subject. The satisfaction and serenity the soul experiences at this deeper stage of prayer are signs of the quietude and recollection God has bestowed on her. These feelings are accompanied by a sense of profound contentment and calm, as well as a gentle joy that permeates the faculties. Since this is the furthest the soul has ever traveled, she thinks she has nothing left to strive for. Like St. Peter, she would gladly make her dwelling there. The soul in this state hardly dares to move or stir for fear that this delight will slip through her fingers. Sometimes she is afraid to even breathe. The poor little thing doesn't realize that just as there was nothing she could do to obtain this blessing by her own efforts, she is even less capable of holding on to it longer than the Lord desires her to have it. I have already mentioned that in this initial recollection and quietude, the faculties of the soul do not cease functioning. But the soul is content just to abide with God. So the calm and quietude endure as long as the recollection lasts. The other faculties may be distracted, but the will is in union with God. Gradually, the will draws the intellect and memory back into a state of recollection. Even though the will is not yet totally absorbed, it is so thoroughly engaged with what it doesn't really know that no matter how hard the other faculties may try, they cannot steal its joy and contentment. In fact, with hardly any effort, the will helps keep this tiny spark of love for God from going out. May His Majesty be pleased to give me the grace to explain this clearly, because a multitude of souls enter this state, but few transcend it. I don't know whose fault that is. It certainly isn't God's. What I do know is that once His Majesty has granted a soul the blessing of attaining the prayer of quiet, he will not fail to give her many more favors unless she herself rejects his mercy. It is very important for the soul to realize the immense dignity of this state. The Lord has done her an incredible favor to bring her to the prayer of quiet. She sees that she no longer belongs wholly to this earth because the Beloved, in His great goodness, is about to make her a citizen of heaven. That is, as long as she doesn't try to stop him. Too bad for her if she turns back. If she does, I think she will slide all the way to the bottom. This is where I would have ended up if the Lord hadn't rescued me. Serious transgressions lead the soul into this downward spiral. Only the blindness induced by evil could cause the soul to forfeit such goodness. So if His Majesty has favored you so highly that you have attained this state, I beg you, for the love of God, know yourself. With humble and holy confidence, hold yourself in high esteem. Otherwise, you'll be tempted to return to the slave food of Egypt. But if weakness, wickedness, and misery cause you to fall as I fell, always bear in mind the good you have lost. You would be correct to lose some trust in yourself. Stand in holy awe. If you give up the practice of prayer, you will only go from bad to worse. I consider it a real calamity when people begin to despise the path that has led them to so much good. These are the ones to whom I'm speaking. I'm not saying that they may never again forsake God or commit any transgressions, even though there are plenty of good reasons why those who have begun to receive these blessings should be on their guard against sin. I acknowledge that we are all human. All I am saying is that they should never stop praying. Contemplative prayer teaches us to be mindful of what we are doing. 
It inspires us to seek reconciliation with our God. It helps us draw the strength we need to elevate our souls. We must believe that if we abandon the path of prayer, we are flirting with grave danger. This is just my opinion. I'm not sure if I even understand what I'm saying. All I have to go on is my own experience. The prayer of quiet is a little spark of true love that the Lord begins to ignite in the soul. He wants the soul to understand the joyous nature of this love. Anyone who has experienced the prayer of quiet will immediately agree that this sacred spark is not something we can grasp for ourselves. Human nature tends to be greedy. We cling to any moment of delight. But no matter how desperately we may wish to kindle the blaze and bask in holy delight, all we end up doing is dousing the fire, leaving our souls cold. The deep quietude and recollection that accompanies the prayer of quiet are good indicators that this little spark, no matter how small it may be, is from God and not the spirit of evil, nor is it a delight that we have fabricated for ourselves. As long as we don't extinguish it with our own imperfections, this spark will ignite the great fire, spreading the same flames of passionate God-love that we observe blazing in advanced souls. This little spark is a sign of God's promise that He has chosen the soul for great things. It is her choice whether or not she will prepare herself to receive His gifts. And this state of prayer is a greater gift than I can ever express. It makes me very sad to see how many souls attain this high state and yet how few ever go beyond it. I'm ashamed to mention it. I shouldn't say that there are only a few. There must be many, because God wouldn't sustain us for no reason. I'm only referring to what I've witnessed. For those souls who have reached this state, I have some advice. Take care not to hide your talents. It seems that God has chosen you to be of service to others. This is especially important in times like these, when strong friends of God are needed to support the weak ones. You, who recognize this gift in yourself, may consider yourself to be a friend of God, as long as you abide by the rules that govern a good friendship, even here in the world. If not, watch out. You might bring harm to yourself and, God forbid, to others as well. All the soul needs to do during these times of quietude is be still and make no noise. What I mean by noise is rushing around with the intellect trying to rustle up reflections of gratitude and words of praise for the gift you are being given. It's that impulse of the mind to catalog your transgressions to convince yourself that you do not deserve to receive such grace. It's that commotion the faculties create, the intellect trying to conjure up images and the memory rushing to store them. These faculties wear me out. I may have a poor memory, but sometimes I seem to be incapable of subduing it. The will needs to understand calmly and wisely that we cannot force God to do what we want. Any effort to do so would be like carelessly piling huge logs onto a fire and smothering it. The will ought to acknowledge its powerlessness and simply say, Lord, what is my rightful place here? What does the devotee have to do with the master? What is the relationship of earth to heaven? Or it can speak any other words of love that occur to it in these moments as long as they are rooted in truth. But the will should ignore the intellect. The mind is nothing more than a grinding mill at this time. The will may have an irresistible urge to share the joy it is experiencing with the intellect. It may strive to bring the mind into a sense of recollection. Often during the prayer of quiet, the will is in the serene union with the divine while the mind wanders around aimlessly. It is better for the will to leave the intellect alone than to chase after it. All that the will needs to do now is remain in recollection, like a wise bee, and simply enjoy the gift. For if all the bees were always zipping around trying to bring the others into the hive, no bees would actually be inside the hive doing the important work of making honey. If the soul does not take care in this matter, she risks losing a great deal. The more developed the intellect, 
the bigger the danger. Once the soul launches its search for concepts and starts composing little speeches, she convinces herself that she is doing something important, especially if she comes up with pretty ideas and words to express them. The soul needs to recognize that there is absolutely no reason that God should grant us this mercy other than His great goodness. She should be aware that she is very near His Majesty and take this opportunity to ask for His continued blessing. She should also pray for the whole of the spiritual community and include those who have asked for her prayers and also those who have died. She should not use a lot of noisy words, but quietly express her yearning to be heard. More important things are unfolded in this simple prayer than in a thousand big ideas generated by the intellect. When the will spontaneously realizes its spiritual growth, it quickens with the fire of love. This inspires it to engage in loving acts toward the one to whom it owes so much. It does all this without involving the noisy intellect, which is busy searching for grand concepts. If we place a tiny twig of humility on this fire of love, we are doing far more to intensify the blaze than if we were to feed it a hundred huge logs of discursive reasoning. While we might think we're being erudite, we would only snuff the flame in less time than it takes to recite the creed. This is especially useful advice for the learned men who ordered me to write this. Surely, through the goodness of God, you will attain this high state of prayer at some point. You might be inclined to apply biblical interpretations to spiritual experiences. Your studies may be of tremendous benefit before and afterward. But in the midst of contemplative prayer, education is irrelevant. In fact, all of your theological concepts may only serve to cool the fire of love in the will. At times like these, I find that my intellect is so close to the light that it sees everything with incomparable clarity. And I, though I am what I am, seem to be someone else altogether. Ordinarily, I hardly understand any of the liturgy in Latin, least of all the Psalms. But when I am in this state of quietude, I not only understand the prayers as if they were written in Spanish, but I even go beyond this to rejoice in the meaning that transcends all language. I'm not talking about the occasions when learned men need to preach or teach. In that case, their studies are a good thing because they help poor people like me who have little education of their own. It is always a good thing to offer charity and sustain compassion toward all souls as long as the caring comes from a simple place and is dedicated to God. When the gift of quietude comes to learned men, they should put all learning aside and simply rest in the stillness. The time will come when their knowledge will be useful to the beloved. Then they will value their education so highly that they would not trade it for any treasure. All they will want is to use it in service of His Majesty. Believe me, in the presence of infinite wisdom, a little study of humility and a few humble acts are worth more than all the knowledge in the world. In the prayer of quiet, there's no room for rational argument. All that is required is that we know exactly who we are. We must simply place ourselves in the presence of God. He seems to want to strip us of our reason and render us so utterly foolish. Indeed, His Majesty humbles Himself so radically that he allows fools to come near him. But the intellect is still activated and moved to articulate ardent prayers of gratitude. The will, on the other hand, is very calm, and like the publican, keeps its eyes lowered. In this quiet way, the will expresses its thanks far more clearly and fully than does the intellect with all its fancy rhetoric. There's no reason in this state to renounce all forms of discursive meditation or even vocal prayer. Yet, if the quietude is deep enough, the soul will find herself practically incapable of speaking anyway, at least not without a great deal of painful effort. I believe it is possible for us to discern whether this quietude comes from the Spirit of God or whether we are picking up the devotional impulse God gave us originally and trying to harness it ourselves to achieve the state we desire.
remember, if we struggle to attain the prayer of quiet by our own effort, it doesn't work. What little serenity we eke out dissipates quickly and leaves us feeling dry. I also think that an experienced seeker can tell if the state of quietude comes from the spirit of evil. If that's the case, it will lack the characteristic humility and will leave the soul feeling agitated. It contributes nothing to preparing the soul to receive the effects that the genuine prayer of quiet, given directly by God, engenders. It neither illumines the intellect nor fortifies the will. As long as the soul follows the directive to fix her thoughts and desires on God, directing the goodness and delight she experiences to Him alone, the spirit of evil can do her little or no harm. Not only will the spirit of evil gain nothing in this way, but the joy that God arouses in the soul will be taken away from the spirit of evil in equal measure. Since the soul believes that her delight comes from God, she is filled with longing and motivated to seek Him again and again through contemplative prayer. If she is a humble soul and more curious about the cross than about spiritual rewards, she won't pay attention to the comforts offered by the spirit of evil. But when the consolation comes from the Spirit of God, the soul will be incapable of ignoring it and will hold it in the highest esteem. Once the spirit of evil notices that the soul has humbled herself in every aspect of prayer, it will have to admit that it has lost the game and will stop coming around to bother her. Remember when I was talking about the first water, which represented the first stage of prayer? I pointed out how important it is for beginners on the path to begin cultivating detachment from sensory gratification right from the start. They should enter a life of prayer determined to help Christ carry His cross, like faithful warriors who are dedicated to the task of serving their King with no concern about compensation, secure in the knowledge of their ultimate reward. All they need to do is keep their eyes fixed on the true and everlasting kingdom we are all striving to attain. The same kind of concentration is required here. We always need to hold this kingdom in our minds, at least in the beginning. As we advance on the path, we will not have to strive so hard to remember that all things are impermanent, that everything is nothing, and that any refuge we find here on earth is not real refuge at all. Eventually, we will discover that sometimes we need to forget these things and simply live. Detachment, in and of itself, is a lowly goal. Spiritual adepts would consider it insulting if someone suggested that they give up the pleasures of the world simply because these things all come to an end. Even if such pleasures were to last forever, advanced souls would gladly give them up for God. In fact, the more evolved these souls have become and the more enduring the pleasures they are offering up for God, the happier they are. For souls like these, Love has intensified to such a degree that it takes over everything. Love does all the work. But for beginners, this advice about consciously cultivating detachment is of the utmost importance, and this is why I make such a point of it. Beginners should not dismiss this counsel, but rather trust that following it will lead them to great good. Even souls who have already attained a high state of prayer may sometimes find themselves being tested by God to such an extent that they begin to wonder if His Majesty is giving up on them. When this happens, they will also find this teaching useful. Don't forget, the growth of the soul is not exactly like the growth of the body. I mean, the soul does grow, but it obeys different rules. Once a child has become an adult and developed a strong body, he doesn't shrink and become small again. But the Beloved does allow this to happen to the soul. The only way I know this is that I've seen it myself. I suppose the purpose of this is to humble us for our own greater good and to remind us not to become careless in this state of exile. The higher we ascend, the more closely we must pay attention and the less we must rely on our own devices. The time comes when even the most radically surrendered souls must protect themselves against offending God. 
Their wills are so aligned with the will of God that they would rather be tortured and die a thousand deaths than commit a single imperfection. Still, they are sure to find themselves at some point or another being attacked by temptations and persecutions. When this happens, they need to pull out the first weapon of prayer and remember that everything is impermanent, that all things come to an end, and that there is life after death. In this way, they will avoid spiritual error. Let's review what I've been saying. When we start off determined to follow the way of the cross and refuse to be lured by the craving for consolation, we build a solid foundation and protect ourselves against the tricks the spirit of evil uses to deceive us. After all, the Beloved himself pointed to this way of perfection when he said, Take up your cross and follow me. He is our example. Whoever walks in his footsteps with the sole desire of pleasing him has nothing to fear. Such souls will begin to detect improvement in themselves and will be able to recognize that these positive effects are not the work of the spirit of evil. When these souls fall, they quickly get back up because the Lord is with them. Here are some other signs of God's presence. When it is the Spirit of God that induces the deep quiet, the soul has no need for manufacturing feelings of humility and unworthiness. The Beloved Himself gives this gift of prayer in such a way that it transcends anything we could achieve through our nice little rationalizations. Self-mortification is nothing compared to true humility that springs to light when the Lord shines on us. This produces a revelation that totally undoes us. The sudden awareness that we are nothing is a gift from God. This experience is not uncommon, and the more bountifully we are blessed, the deeper this awareness grows. God fills us with an intense desire for spiritual transformation and the determination not to give up on prayer no matter how severely we may be tested. We are willing to suffer anything that comes our way. While standing in humility and trepidation, we are simultaneously certain that we will be liberated. This Conviction banishes all servile fear and replaces it with holy awe. We have matured and grown in faith. We become conscious of the stirrings of a love for God that is free of self-interest. We crave periods of solitude and silence so that we may more deeply savor this grace. I'm getting tired now, so I will try to wrap this up. The Prayer of Quiet is the beginning of all blessings. The soul clearly sees that the flowers in her garden have been given everything they need to burst into blossom. She is incapable of believing that the Beloved is not with her until she turns back to see the flaws and imperfections in herself, and then she grows afraid. This fear can be a good thing, but some souls benefit more from the simple belief that God is with them always than from any combination of fears that might strike them. If it is a person's nature to be loving and grateful, then merely remembering a blessing she has received will do more to bring her back to God than reflecting on all the possible punishments of hell. At least this was true in my case, wicked though I may be. Later, I will more fully describe the signs of the Good Spirit. For now, it is too difficult for me to explain them adequately. I believe that by the grace of God, I will find a way to convey what He wants me to say. While I trust in my own experience, because I have reflected on it so thoroughly and have understood so much of what it has to teach me, I also have the added benefit of having consulted with some very learned men. These are holy people who are worthy of our respect. With resources like these available, Souls who have reached this stage through the goodness of God may not have to weary themselves to the brink of death, as I did. Chapter 16 The Stream of Holy Madness Let's go on now to speak of the third water that nourishes the garden of the soul, the water that flows through a stream or a spring. This method irrigates the garden with much less labor than it takes to crank a water wheel 
or pull a heavy bucket from a deep well, though it still requires some effort to channel the flow. But the Lord is so eager to help his servant at this stage that he practically becomes the gardener himself. God is the one who does almost everything. In this state of prayer, the faculties are lulled to sleep. They do not entirely cease to function, but they do not understand how they are functioning. The consolation and delight the soul experiences here are incomparably more intense than what she tasted in the previous stage. The water of grace has risen up to her throat, and she is immobilized. She does not know how to move forward, and she is incapable of turning back. All the soul wants is to rejoice in this great glory. She is like a man who is already holding the funeral candle in his hand, on the brink of dying the death he has been longing for. The delight he takes in his agony defies all description. This state of prayer seems to me nothing other than a death. It is the near, total dying to all earthly things, a dying into God, and it is a joyous passing. I don't know how else to explain this. Words fail to describe it. The soul herself doesn't know what to do. Should she speak or be silent? Should she laugh or weep? It is a glorious bewilderment, a heavenly madness. In this blessed foolishness lies all wisdom, and the soul takes great delight in her unlearning. It has been five or six years, as I recall, since the Beloved first blessed me with this state of prayer, and he has given it to me abundantly. I have neither understood it nor have I figured out how to speak of it, and so I decided that when I came to this place in the account of my life, I would say very little about it or maybe even nothing at all. What I have understood is that the prayer of quiet is not yet a complete union of the soul's faculties with the divine. I also recognized that it was a higher state of prayer than the previous one, but I confess that I could not begin to discern or describe what the difference was. In having asked for guidance from such a simple person as myself, you have demonstrated true humility. Perhaps that is why the Lord granted me the gift of this prayer today after communion. There I was, offering thanks to God, when His Majesty interrupted me to suggest certain spiritual metaphors and then taught me how to explain what the soul needs to do at this stage. I understood everything in a flash, and I was amazed. How often have I been mystified and intoxicated with love, but incapable of understanding what was happening to me? I knew very well that it was the work of God, but I did not know how He was working. The truth is, while the faculties in this state are almost totally united with the divine, they are not so absorbed that they cease to function. I am so happy that today I have understood this at last. Blessed be the Lord who has given me this gift. The only power the faculties retain is the ability to surrender themselves completely to God. Not one of them seems to dare stir. The only way that we can make them move is if we deliberately forced ourselves to shift our attention to some external thing. But frankly, I doubt that we would be able to do this successfully at such a time. The soul utters a stream of praises here without pausing to compose them. It is the Lord who imposes order on the blessed chaos and puts words around the soul's overwhelming gratitude. The intellect is worthless here. The soul cannot contain herself. She yearns to pour out her praises. She is delightfully disquieted. Her flowers are already blooming and beginning to spread their fragrance. The soul wishes that everyone could behold her in this state and, witnessing her glory, join her in singing God's praises. She has a profound need to share her joy. It is too great to bear alone. This reminds me of the woman in the gospel who wanted to gather, or did gather, all her neighbors. This joy must have been what the royal prophet David felt when he played his harp and sang of the glory of God. I am deeply devoted to this glorious king. I wish everyone else would be too.
David is especially good for those of us who tend to be sinners. Oh God, help me. What is a soul like in this state? She wishes she were made all of tongues to do nothing but praise the Lord. She babbles a thousand words of holy madness, trying to find exactly the right way to please the one who has taken her captive. I know a certain person who is no poet, but while taken up in this divine delirium, composed spontaneous stanzas that expressed her anguish with passionate accuracy. Her poetry was not the work of the discursive mind. She was simply complaining directly to her God about her blessed distress. And this outpouring allowed her to experience the glory that accompanied her anguish even more deeply. She wanted her whole being to shatter into pieces to demonstrate the joy she felt in such pain. What torment would the soul in this state refuse to bear? If her beloved offered her trials, she would gladly suffer them for his sake. In fact, it would fill her with delight to do so. I clearly see that when the martyrs suffered persecution, they were not doing so on their own. A greater power gave them the strength to endure all things. But what more terrible pain must the soul bear when she has to return to her senses and step back into the mundane world with all its petty concerns and formalities? I honestly do not believe I have been exaggerating. There are no words potent enough to convey the exquisite joy with which the Beloved blesses the soul in this exile of hers. May you be forever blessed, my Lord. May all things praise you forever. Even as I write this, I am not free from that holy, heavenly madness. This is the gift of your divine goodness and mercy. I have done nothing to deserve such grace. Please, my king, either make it so that everyone I speak to of your love goes crazy with love for you, or else forbid me from speaking at all. Lord, either grant that I have nothing more to do with the affairs of this world, or else take me out of it altogether. This servant of yours can no longer bear the trial of seeing herself without you. If you insist on her living, please, beloved. Do not let her rest. All she wants is to be free. Sleeping tortures her. Eating poisons her. She watches herself wasting precious hours of this life on comforts. But nothing can comfort her anymore except you. Life is empty now. She no longer desires to live in herself, but only to live in you. Oh, my true Lord and glory. The cross you have prepared for those who have attained this state is both unbearably heavy and exceedingly light. It is light because it is so sweet, and it is heavy because there are times when the soul cannot bear to carry it another step. Yet she would never want to be free of it unless being free meant going straight to you. When she reflects that she has done nothing so far to serve you in this life, and that her only hope for serving you lies in staying alive. The soul wishes that she would never die, that her cross would grow even heavier, and that she could carry it to the end of the world. The only rest she finds is the rest that comes with doing you some small service. She doesn't know what she wants. Her only desire is for you. Oh, my son. The man who ordered me to write this account is so humble that he wants me to address him this way. These passages in which I have gotten so carried away should be for your eyes alone. Nothing could persuade me to hold myself back when the Lord transports me beyond myself. Ever since I took communion this morning, I don't even feel like I'm the one speaking. Everything seems like a dream. If only everyone I met were stricken with this sickness I have contracted. I beg you, may we all go mad for love of the one who was called mad for love of us. You claim to love me. Prove it. Prepare yourself to receive this blessed gift from God. Most people are too sober to let themselves go as they ought to. I may well be more guilty of this than anyone. You must not let me be that way. 
I call you Father, and you are like a son to me. You are also my spiritual guide, and I have entrusted my soul to you. Tell me the truth and dispel my illusions. Why is this kind of truth-telling such a rare thing? I wish that the five of us friends who love each other in Christ could make a pact. We would gather together on a regular basis for the purpose of freeing each other from illusion. We would suggest ways in which each of us could improve our relationship with God. No one knows himself as well as someone close to him who observes him with love and concern for his spiritual growth. These days there are groups of heretics that secretly get together just to plot wicked deeds against His Majesty. We would also have to meet in secret, because the kind of holy conversation I am proposing is not popular anymore. Even preachers are composing sermons so carefully that they will not risk displeasing anyone. Their intentions are fine, their deeds are fine. But do they convince anyone to mend their lives? No! Why doesn't the average sermon inspire people to renounce whatever stands between them and their God? Do you want to know what I think? I think those who preach at the pulpit are too circumspect. They are nothing like the apostles on fire with the love of God, casting aside all restraint. Their meager flames offer little warmth. I'm not suggesting that their fire should burn as intensely as the blaze in the hearts of the apostles but it could be a little hotter than what I see. Do you know what I think our greatest concern should be? Becoming detached from our lives and relinquishing our self-importance. All we need to do is tell the truth and hold it up for the greater glory of God. Fame and blame should be equally meaningless to us. In fact, those who risk everything for God will find that they have both lost it all and gained it all. I'm not claiming to have achieved this kind of equanimity myself, but I'm working on it. Oh, what freedom it is to consider it captivity to live in the world and abide by its rules. This freedom is a gift from God. What slaves wouldn't risk everything to earn their ransom and return to their homeland? This is the true path. Why linger along the roadside? The treasure we seek is so vast that unless we keep walking, we will not attain it until the end of our lives. May the Lord help us on our way. Tear up what I have just written if you think it would be best. Consider it to be a private letter from me to you. And if I have been too bold, please forgive me. Chapter 17 The Fragrance of Virtue I think I have offered a reasonable account of the third water of prayer. I have told you what the soul needs to do and, more importantly, what she needs to let God do inside of her, since it is God who has taken over the job of gardener. He wants the soul to rest for a while. The only task the will has is to yield to the delight of these blessings. It should simply submit to whatever true wisdom wants to do to it at this point. Such surrender requires courage. The soul's joy is so intense that she feels she is about to be catapulted out of the body altogether. And what a glorious death that would be! I think it's a good idea for the soul to abandon herself completely into the arms of God. If he brings her to heaven, then off she goes to heaven. If she is bound for hell, this does not bother her as long as her highest good is with her. If her life comes to an end, so be it. And if she lives for a thousand years, that, too, is fine with her. Let His Majesty treat her as His own. She no longer belongs to herself. She has given the whole of her being to the Beloved. She has relinquished self-interest entirely. The effects of this state of prayer are so powerful that the soul can handle anything that comes to her from God. And without any intellectual involvement, the soul fully understands the power God is giving her. She is simply amazed at what a good gardener her beloved is and in awe of his generosity. 
God wants the soul to do nothing more than rest in the garden and enjoy the sublime fragrance beginning to emanate from the flowers. The keeper of the garden is also, of course, the creator of the water. And in a single visit, no matter how brief, he unleashes a boundless flow. The heavenly gardener accomplishes in one moment the peace the poor soul had been unable to attain in twenty years of exhausting intellectual labor. And so the fruit grows and ripens, so that if it is God's will, the soul can draw her sustenance from it. But God does not give the soul permission to share her fruits until she has eaten enough to grow strong. Otherwise, she would be distributing tastes of this sublime food to everyone else, sustaining them at her own cost. Then the soul would have offered nothing back to the one who has given her everything, and she would be starving to death herself. Learned men will understand exactly what I'm talking about here, and will be able to figure out how to apply it to their own spiritual lives. I am getting tired now, and I can't explain it any better than this. As the prayer of quiet deepens, the virtues grow so strong that the soul cannot ignore them. She sees that she has changed, but she is not sure how this happened. The perfume that has begun to emanate from the flowers inspires the soul to engage in spontaneous acts of greatness. The Beloved wants the buds in the garden of the soul to open, so that the soul would see the virtues that have flowered in her. The soul remains clearly aware that she could never have acquired these virtues on her own in a million years. God knows she has tried. She understands that the heavenly gardener has given them to her all at once. The more profound the prayer of quiet, the deeper the soul's humility. She recognizes that she has done nothing to earn this divine grace except simply to submit to God's blessings and willfully embrace them. This state of prayer strikes me as an unequivocal union of the whole soul with God. Yet, it seems His Majesty has invited the individual faculties to partake of the experience so that they can understand all that He is doing for the soul and can rejoice in His great work. Sometimes, actually quite often, the soul notices that the will seems to be thoroughly enjoying her divine captivity. This used to confuse me. That's why I'm telling you all about it, so that you will be prepared when it happens to you. The will stands alone in a place of deep quiet, while the intellect and memory are free to take care of business and engage in acts of generosity. This state may resemble the prayer of quiet, but it's different. In the prayer of quiet, the soul does not want to shift or stir. She basks in the holy repose of Mary. But in this state, the soul also becomes like Martha. She leaves the active and contemplative life at the same time. She can efficiently conduct business, tend to people in need, or read a good book, but she isn't fully in charge of herself. She understands that her best part is somewhere else altogether. It feels a little like talking to a person on one side, while someone on our other side is talking to us. We wouldn't fully attend to either one. This is a deeply felt state of prayer. It brings with it a profound sense of satisfaction and joy. It is excellent preparation for the soul to attain the depths of quietude later, when she at least has the opportunity to step away from her busy life and sit in solitude and stillness. The soul here is like a person whose appetite has been satisfied, so he doesn't crave anything. But he is not so full that he would refuse some delicious morsel if someone offered it to him. In fact, he would eat it with gusto. This soul finds the pleasures of the world to be entirely unsatisfying now. So she does not hunger for them. Everything she wants is inside of her. All she seeks is an ever-intensifying connection with God, the opportunity to enjoy Him more and more, time and space just to be with Him. God alone satisfies her desires. There is another state of prayer, deeper than the second spiritual water, but not as profound as the third. 
It's not yet total union, but it is approaching it. The Lord may give you all three waters, if he hasn't already. When this happens, you will be happy to find them all written down here so that you can recognize what they are. It's one blessing to receive the grace of God. It's another to understand what kind of grace you're receiving. And it's a third to know how to describe and explain it. Although it may seem like the first blessing is enough, the soul who can understand the gift of grace is at a distinct advantage. Knowledge alleviates fear and confusion. Then the soul can courageously follow the path of the Lord, trampling worldly attachments underfoot. Any one of these blessings is reason enough to praise the Lord with all your heart. Even if you have not received such grace yourself, you still have cause to glorify Him. After all, if His Majesty has bestowed His gift on anyone alive, all the rest of us may benefit from it. There is something special that happens in the advanced degree of union I'm about to describe. If this seems to be particularly true for me, since God often blesses me in this way. In this state, God gathers up the will and also the intellect. Now the soul is incapable of engaging in discursive thought. All she can do is rejoice in Him. The soul here is like someone watching a spectacle. He sees so many different things that he doesn't know where to look first. Now he glances here, now there, and he ends up not really perceiving anything. The memory and the imagination in this state remain free. It is astonishing to witness the havoc these fragmented faculties wreak when they are left alone. They want to turn everything into chaos. Sometimes I detest the memory. It exhausts me. I beg the Lord to please take mine away during these periods of prayer if it is going to insist on disturbing me so much. I say to him, when, my God, will my soul be entirely whole in praise of you, rather than fragmented and useless? Now I understand the harm we do to ourselves when we miss the mark. That's when we become caught up by our attachments and cannot do what we truly want, to focus exclusively on God. As I said, this happens to me frequently. In fact, it just happened to me today, so I vividly recall the nuances of the experience. My soul is torn asunder with longing to be one with the part of myself that is one with God. But this is not possible. Instead, the memory and imagination wage war on the soul, and she is powerless to defend herself. Since the other faculties are suspended, these two cannot do the soul real harm, but they cause plenty of trouble just by agitating her. When I say that the faculties of memory and imagination are incapable of causing active harm, I mean that they are weak and easily distracted. They try to present images to the intellect, but it cannot support them. And so they flit from thing to thing, jumping from one extreme to another, and they never rest. They remind me of little nocturnal moths. This is an apt metaphor, I think, because those moths may be annoying, but they are basically harmless. So far, God has not revealed a remedy to me, so I'm not sure what to recommend. Believe me, I would be thrilled to find a solution myself, since imagination and memory often leave me exhausted and upset. This situation equally demonstrates our profound misery and also the awesome power of God. The unleashed faculties rush around tormenting us, while the suspended faculties rest in His Majesty's loving embrace. I have worn myself out looking for an antidote, and the closest thing I have found is to pay no more attention to the memory than you would pay attention to a crazy person. Just let it go its own way. Only God can stop it. When He does, it becomes His slave. Meanwhile, we must patiently endure it, as Jacob put up with Leah. After all, didn't God bless us immeasurably by allowing us to enjoy Rachel? When I say that the memory becomes God's captive, what I mean is that no matter how hard it tries, it cannot drag the other faculties along with it. On the contrary, without any effort, the other faculties often draw the memory to them. 
Sometimes when God finds the memory so lost and confused, longing to be in the company of the others, he takes pity on it. Then his majesty allows it to ignite in the flame of the same divine candle that has already burned the other faculties to ashes. Their ordinary nature has been replaced by an almost supernatural enjoyment of divine blessings. This third spiritual water bubbles up from an internal spring and bathes the soul in peaceful glory. Her joy is so great that the body tangibly shares in the soul's delightful interlude, and the virtues flower at the taste of such grace. It seems to me that the Beloved has helped me clearly explain the states in which the soul finds herself, at least as clearly as can possibly be understood here on earth. Feel free to discuss this with anyone who has experienced these states and has had some religious education. If a learned person pronounces my explanations valid, know that God gave them to me and please thank His Majesty very much. Remember, even if a person has already been blessed with the delight of these deep states of prayer, he will also be grateful to comprehend what is happening to him over the course of time. If His Majesty has given you the grace to enjoy this prayer but not to understand it, this writing should help you, especially those of you who are fortunate enough to be both intelligent and well-educated. May He be praised for everything through all the ages. Amen. Chapter 18 The Prayer of Union May the Lord give me the right words to explain the fourth spiritual water. I need His help now more than ever. In the previous state of prayer, the soul dies to the things of this world. Yet she can tell that she is not dead altogether. She still has her senses, so she feels her profound aloneness. She makes use of external things to express what she feels, even if they are only symbolic. In every degree of prayer I have described so far, the soul gardener is working. In the more advanced stages, the soul receives so much comfort and delight that she would never want to abandon the cultivation of prayer. So she experiences her labor as glory rather than as toil. In this new state, the ordinary senses are transcended. The soul rejoices without understanding what she's rejoicing in. She recognizes that she is enjoying a good thing, one that encompasses all good things within it, but the goodness defies comprehension. The senses are so occupied with this joy that they are not free to experience anything else, either exterior or interior. In the early stages of prayer, the senses are allowed to give some indication of the tremendous joy they feel. But in the fourth water, the soul's joy is incomparably greater. Yet she is much less capable of expressing it. Both the body and the soul are drained of the power to communicate. At a time like this, anything is perceived as a disturbance, a torment, and an obstacle to the soul's repose. The faculties are all drawn into union. Even if the soul wanted to, she would be unable to convey her delight. If she were able to describe it, she would not be in a state of union. I don't know how to explain this prayer they call union or how it happens. Mystical theologians elucidate it, but I don't know the proper vocabulary. I don't understand what mind is or how it is different from the soul or spirit. It all seems like the same thing to me. I do see that the soul sometimes shoots out of itself like a flame leaping from a blazing fire. You, with all your learning, will understand how the fire and the flame are the same. I don't know how else to say it. I want to talk about how the soul feels when she is in this divine union. We already know what union means. Two separate things become one. Oh, my beloved, you are so good. May you be blessed forever. May all things praise you, my God. You have loved us so much that we are truly able to speak of communion between you and our souls here in our exile. This proves your boundless generosity and magnanimity 
even in the case of souls who are already good. This abundance is who you are, my Lord. You give according to your nature. Oh, infinite bounty, your works are magnificent. Even those of us who are not intellectually engaged with the things of the world find ourselves incapable of understanding divine truths. My intellect stops dead in its tracks when it ponders how you have bestowed such exalted blessings on souls who have offended you so much. I start to think about it, and I can't continue. Where could the intellect possibly go that would not be a backward motion? I cannot find the words to thank you for such precious favors. So I sometimes take comfort in uttering nonsense. In the midst of receiving these divine favors, the soul is powerless to speak. But right after God has blessed me in this way, or else just as he was beginning, I often used to say, Lord, look what you're doing. How quickly you seem to forget my wickedness. Obviously you have forgotten. How else could you have forgiven me? Well, I beg you now to remember it and to place some limits on your mercies. Oh, my Creator, please don't pour such precious liquid into such a broken cup. You have already seen how I tend to spill it. Do not put a treasure like this in a place where the craving for worldly pleasures is not as deadened as it ought to be. Otherwise, you will only squander it. How could you entrust this fortified city and hand over its keys to such a cowardly defender? The minute the enemy attacks, she flings open the gates and lets him in. Do not let your love be so great, O eternal king, that you would jeopardize such priceless jewels. When you place your treasure in the power of such a lowly, wretched, weak, and unworthy creature, gives her the excuse to undervalue it. She may well strive to keep it safe, with your grace, of course, and being what she is, she requires more help than most but she is incapable of making use of the treasure to be of service to anyone else. Why not? She is a woman. She's not even a good woman, but a worthless one. It seems that whatever talent you have given her is wasted by being not only hidden, but actually buried deep in such vile earth. You do not generally bestow such great blessings as these on someone incapable of benefiting many other souls. I have begged you in the past, my God, and I will continue to beseech you with all my heart to grant these blessings to someone who will make better use of them than I for the magnification of your glory. You already know that I would consider it a blessing to lose the greatest good that can be obtained on earth if it meant you would do this. It occurred to me to say things like this, as well as other things, to God. That was until I saw how foolish I was being. What a lack of humility. The Lord knows perfectly well what is right for me. He knows that my soul would not have the strength to become liberated unless His Majesty instilled it in me through His divine blessings. Well, then what are the effects that grace leaves in the soul? Can the soul do anything on her own to lift herself to such a high station? If so, what might that be? Let's take a look at this. Heavenly love elevates the spirit in union, but elevation and union are two different things. To those who may not have experienced this raising of the spirit, this may seem like a false distinction. Even though the two realities are ultimately one, the Lord works a little differently in each case. With the flight of the spirit, the soul experiences greater detachment from worldly things. In my experience, this lifting up of the Spirit is a special mercy. I will admit that it looks almost exactly like union. A little fire is just as much fire as a big one. Yet it takes a long time for a bit of iron to grow red hot in a small flame. In a big fire, the substance of even a large chunk of iron appears to be transformed quickly. This seems to me to be an example of how these two divine favors are different from one another. Anyone who has experienced raptures will understand this perfectly. 
to someone who has not had such an experience, I'm sure my explanation must sound like nonsense. It is a bit ridiculous for someone like me to try and explain something that cannot possibly be put into words. But I have to believe that the Lord is with me here. His Majesty knows that although I have been commanded to write this and am compelled by my vows to obey, my primary motivation is to draw souls into the experience of sublime grace. I would not attempt to speak of things that I have not been through. In fact, this last spiritual water is so hard to explain that when I started to write about it, I was afraid it was going to come out sounding like Greek. So I put down my quill and went to communion. Blessed be the Lord who bestows his mercy on the ignorant. What great things come through the simple virtue of obedience. Just as he did with this previous spiritual waters, God himself illuminated my intellect about this one, giving me just the words I need to explain this divine favor and showing me exactly how to use them. It seems that His Majesty is willing to say for me what I can neither say nor even understand myself. I am telling the whole truth here. So whatever is good is His own teaching. What is bad comes from that sea of wickedness I call myself. There must be many souls who have attained the heights of prayer that the Lord in His mercy has granted to this miserable creature. If such souls are afraid they may have lost their way and want to consult me about it, they can rest secure in the knowledge that the Lord is helping His servants show them the true way. The fourth heavenly water is so abundant that when it falls, it saturates the whole garden. If the Beloved were to send this rain every time the ground became a little dry, the gardener wouldn't have much to do, would she? And if there were no such thing as winter and the weather were always mild, there would be no shortage of flowers and fruit, would there? Obviously, under such circumstances, the gardener would be thrilled. But as long as we're living on earth, this is impossible. When one water fails, we need to seek ways to obtain another. This water from heaven often comes when the gardener least expects it. Yet it is true that in the beginning stages of the spiritual path, the heavenly rain almost always falls after a long period of contemplative prayer. Between successive stages of prayer, the Lord lifts the small bird of the soul and places her in the divine nest to rest. He has watched her flying around for such a long time, striving with all her might to see God and serve Him. She has strained her intellect and pushed her will. He wants to reward her for her hard work, even in this lifetime. And what a reward! A single moment of that grace is more than enough to pay the soul back for all the trials she could ever endure in this life. While the soul is seeking God in this way, she finds herself slipping into a kind of swoon. With a rush of gentle joy, she feels everything begin to fade away. The breath and bodily powers progressively dwindle. It takes tremendous effort just to wiggle the fingers the eyes close of their own accord. Even if a person in this state were able to keep her eyes open, she wouldn't see a thing. She cannot read or sound out words. She can barely recognize letters. If she wanted to read, the intellect would offer no help in turning the alphabet into comprehensible language. She can hear, but she does not understand what she's hearing. The senses do not serve the soul one iota in this state. In fact, there is the danger that they will do her harm by diminishing her sublime pleasure. It is useless for her to try to speak. Even if she could form a word, she lacks the energy to pronounce it. As the power of the body decreases, the strength of the soul increases, compounding the enjoyment of her glory. She experiences a vast and palpable delight. No matter how long it lasts, this prayer, causes no harm. At least, it has never caused me any. In fact, even if I had been ill before the Lord granted me this mercy, I always felt much better afterward. What harm could such a blessing possibly do? The external effects are so obvious, who could doubt that a great thing has happened to the soul? 
What else besides grace could rob us of our bodily strength, fill us with joy, and then revitalize our physical powers? It is true that in the beginning this state of prayer passes so quickly, it did in my case anyway, that the shutting down of the senses and other outward signs are almost imperceptible. But the soul has no trouble recognizing that the sun must have shone with dazzling intensity since it melted her away. It should be noted that even the longest period of time the soul remains in this suspended state is actually very short. If the faculties were suspended for half an hour, that would be a long time. I don't think it has ever lasted that long for me. Of course, since there is no sensory awareness in this state, it's hard to know what's going on. But I do know that very soon one faculty or another recovers and the prayer passes. The will remains captive in the divine web while the other two faculties escape and revert to their mischievous ways. The quietude of the will draws them into suspension again and again, but they always come back to life very quickly. Some people end up spending many hours of prayer in this way. Once the faculties have tasted this wine and become intoxicated, they willingly lose themselves all over again just so they can drink some more. They join the company of the will, and all three celebrate together. Remember. This absorption of the faculties is over in a flash. But their return to ordinary functioning is not abrupt. In fact, they usually linger in a state of bemusement for several hours. Every now and then, God gathers them back to himself. We have come to the place where we need to try and say something about what the soul is feeling inside herself during this experience. Oh, if only I knew how to speak of this. We cannot understand it with our minds, let alone put it into language. I was reflecting on this after receiving communion and being swept up into the very state of prayer I was writing about. How was I going to describe what the soul goes through at this time? Then the Lord spoke to me. The soul utterly dissolves, my daughter, so that I can fully unite with me, he said. It is no longer the soul that lives, but I. Since she cannot comprehend what she understands, she understands by not understanding. What happens in this state is so rarefied that there is no way to explain it any more clearly than this. Only those who have tasted it will know anything of its flavor. All I can say is that the soul sees herself as one with God. There is an abiding sense of certainty that accompanies this encounter. The soul is incapable of doubting the truth of her union with him. The faculties are so radically suspended here that they completely fail to function. If a person in this state has been meditating on some scripture passage, it will vanish from his memory as if he had never been thinking of it at all. If he has been reading, he cannot concentrate or remember a thing he has just read. Nor can he recall the words of prescribed prayers. And so the wings of this restless little moth we call the memory are singed, and it cannot flutter her around anymore. The will is entirely absorbed in loving, but it doesn't understand how it loves. If the intellect understands anything, it can't understand how it understands. The mind can't understand what the soul knows. I don't think the intellect does understand because, as I've already said, it can't be understood. I really can't understand this myself. There was something I was ignorant about in the beginning. I didn't know that God was in everything. Even though he felt so near, I thought this was impossible. But because his presence was so clear to me, I couldn't stop believing that he was there. Certain uneducated men told me that God was only present by grace. I didn't believe them. His presence was so tangible. I was confused. A very learned man from the Order of the Glorious St. Dominic liberated me from this prison of doubt. He reassured me that God was with me and told me all about how God communicates himself to the soul. This was deeply comforting to me. Just remember, this 
heavenly water, this magnificent gift from God, always leaves immense blessings in the soul. This is what I'd like to talk about next. Chapter 19 Divine Rain The prayer of union leaves the soul in a state of great tenderness. She longs to be consumed and is overcome by the urge to weep, not in sorrow, but in joy. She suddenly finds herself bathed in tears without knowing when or how she shed them. She is delighted to discover that the same water that quenches the force of the fire makes it burn with even more intensity. This may sound like nonsense, but it happens. Sometimes in the beginning of my spiritual life, when the experience passed quickly, this prayer would transport me so far beyond myself that I would wonder whether I had been dreaming or if the glory I was feeling was a reality. But when I saw that I was drenched by a water that poured so powerfully and so quickly as if from a heavenly cloud, I realized that my experience was real. The soul is so filled with courage that she would consider it a blessing to be cut into a thousand pieces for her God. This state of prayer triggers sweeping resolutions, heroic promises, and ardent desires. The soul clearly perceives the vanity of the world and begins to develop contempt for it. This prayer refines and elevates the soul far more than any degree of prayer so far. Her humility is deeper, too, because she sees that she had absolutely nothing to do with the generous and magnificent gift she is being given and that she is equally powerless to hold on to it. Her own unworthiness becomes painfully apparent, for cobwebs cannot hide when sunlight floods into a room. She is so far from conceited at this point that she cannot imagine that she ever suffered from false pride. Since the soul barely gave her consent for the blessed state she is in, she sees with her own eyes that she herself is capable of little or nothing. The door to the senses simply closed, and the soul was left to enjoy her Lord in private. Now that she is alone with him, what can she do but love him? It requires inordinate effort just to see and hear any external thing. Afterward, the soul's past life and God's great glory are revealed with perfect clarity. The intellect doesn't have to scavenge for this truth. There it is fully cooked. All the soul needs to do is eat and understand. She realizes that she deserves to be chastised and that she is being punished with glory. She dissolves in praise of God, as I would gladly melt away right now. Blessed be you, O oh my beloved. You have taken the mud that I am and transfigured me into clear water for your own table. May you be praised, O joy of the angels. You have willingly raised up such a vile little worm. The soul continues to make progress. Now that she sees that the fruits are not her own, she begins to distribute them. The more she gives away, the less she seems to need. She is a soul who treasures God's gifts and also wants to share them with others. She begs God not to let her be the only wealthy one. Almost without knowing she is doing it, the soul begins to benefit her neighbors. The fragrance of her flowers has grown so sweet that other souls are attracted to her. They recognize her virtue and want to partake in the holy feast. Few souls reach this state without having suffered innumerable misunderstandings, criticisms, and illnesses. But these trials cultivate the soil of the soul. Detachment from self-interest softens the earth, allowing the water to penetrate it so thoroughly that it almost never becomes arid again. Yet if the ground of the soul is still hard and choked with thorns, as mine used to be, it will soon dry up. If she is not as grateful as she should be for such blessed gifts from God, and if she is still inclined to miss the mark, her garden will wither. If the gardener becomes careless and the Lord in his mercy decides not to send the rain for a while, 
she might as well consider the garden lost. To my great amazement, this has happened to me. If I hadn't experienced it, I would scarcely believe it. I am writing this to console weak souls like myself, so that they will not despair and stop trusting in God's greatness. Even if they fall after the Lord has raised them up so high, they should not allow themselves to become so discouraged that they lose their way. Tears gain all things. One water draws down the other. This is one of the main things that motivated me to obey the order to write this account of my miserable life and the great mercy the Lord has granted me without my deserving it. Being what I am, I have repeatedly offended him. I wish I had real authority so that people would believe what I have to say. Please, Lord, give it to me now. I repeat, let no one who has cultivated the practice of contemplative prayer grow discouraged and say, if I end up reverting to my old ways, it would be better for me to give up prayer altogether. I believe things will get worse if the person abandons prayer and refuses to quit his bad habits. But if he stays the course, prayer will carry him into the harbor of light. This is exactly how the spirit of evil attacked me. As I have mentioned, I wasted precious time worrying that I lacked the humility necessary to be worthy of practicing prayer. And so, for a year and a half, I did not pray at all. Well, for at least a year anyway. I don't quite remember about the other six months. All I succeeded in doing was plunging myself into hell. I didn't need any devils to drag me there. Oh God, save me. What blindness. The spirit of evil is smart to lend its hand in this way, luring the soul away from prayer. The traitor knows that a soul who perseveres in prayer is lost to him. Thanks to the goodness of God, every time the spirit of evil trips such a soul and makes her fall, it is only helping her to leap up again even higher in service of the Lord. No wonder the spirit of evil is so concerned. Oh, my Jesus, what a sight it is to see you reach out your merciful hand and raise a soul who has fallen after she had already attained such an elevated state. Then she clearly perceives the multitude of your blessings and the depth of her own wretchedness. She acknowledges your vast power and dissolves into you. Here, she does not dare lift her eyes. Here, she lifts her eyes. She recognizes her tremendous debt to you. Here, she becomes devoted to the Queen of Heaven and begs her to intercede with you. Here, she invokes the help of the saints who also fell after you had already called them. Here she considers herself unworthy of the very ground she walks on. She cannot believe she deserves all the blessings you have given her. Here she approaches the sacraments with living faith in the power that God has placed in them. She praises you because you have left a healing ointment for our wounds that not only soothes them, but completely eliminates them. The soul is amazed by all this. Who wouldn't be amazed, Lord of my soul, to witness so much mercy? How could anyone fail to be moved by such a huge favor bestowed in exchange for such an ugly betrayal? I am a wicked person. I can't believe that my heart doesn't shatter as I write this. Thank you, my beloved, for this gift of crying. I return these small tears now as some kind of repayment for all the ways I have betrayed you. I know that the well from which I draw them is less than pure, because I have so often refused your divine blessings and chosen evil instead. But please, my Lord, honor my tears. Cleanse this muddy water so that I do not tempt others to judge me as I have so often judged others. I used to wonder why you would ignore some very holy souls who have always worked so hard to serve you, who have been deeply religious their whole lives, and instead bestow your blessings on people like me who are religious in name only. Now I see, my only good, that you withhold their reward to give it to them all at once. 
They are strong enough to serve you without attachment to the fruits of their actions, and so you treat them as brave souls who are free from self-interest. I, on the other hand, am weak, and I need to taste your favors here on earth. Still, my beloved, you know that I often called out to you to forgive the people who criticized me because they seemed justified in their judgments. This impulse arose during that time when you, in your great goodness, were helping me to learn not to offend you. I was trying to give up all the things I thought might displease you, and you responded, my beloved Lord, by beginning to open your treasure box to your servant. It seemed like you had simply been waiting for me to be ready to receive your divine jewels. Soon, you were not only giving them to me, but letting other people know that you had given them to me. No matter how obvious my wickedness, some people didn't realize how wretched I was. And they began to put me on a pedestal when they found out about these divine favors. This was quickly followed by a wave of criticism and persecution from another faction. I was more inclined to agree with the second group, so I didn't blame anyone for blaming me. In fact, I implored you, my God, to recognize how right they were. Here are some of the things they were saying about me. She's trying to make herself out to be a saint. She's introducing innovations without even having managed to comply with the observance of her own monastic rule. She is nowhere near as good and holy as the other sisters in her house. I must admit I don't believe I will ever attain goodness unless God himself gives it to me from his own goodness. She's actually detracting from the goodness of our community by replacing perfectly good customs with bad ones. At least she is trying her best to convey these negative teachings and she's capable of causing terrible damage. I'm not saying it was only my sisters who participated in the slander. There were other people, too. But those who accused me were innocent. They taught me things about myself. These must have been true things because it was you, Lord, who permitted them. Once, in the midst of this persecution, I was reciting the hours, and I came to this verse. You are righteous, O Lord, and your judgments are upright. What a great truth, I thought. For the spirit of evil has never had the power to tempt me to doubt that you, my God, embody every good thing or to question a single article of faith. Rather, it seemed to me that the more my faith transcended the mundane world, the stronger it grew. This thought enkindled my devotion. When I reflected on your omnipotence, I recognized your power to shower me with your majestic gifts. I have never doubted this power, but I still could not help wondering why you would choose to hold your blessings back from so many souls who serve you so faithfully and yet give them so generously to someone like me. Then, my Lord, you answered me. Stop meddling, you said, and just serve me. This was the first time I ever heard your voice, and it scared me. Later, I will say more about these spiritual voices. It would only be another digression to elaborate on this topic now, and I have digressed more than enough already. I hardly know what I've said. How could it be otherwise? My readers are just going to have to put up with me. When I reflect on the patience with which God has treated me, and notice my present state. I am transported all over again. I lose the thread of what I've been saying and what I meant to say next. May I always be so foolish. May His Majesty never again grant me the power to offend Him in the slightest degree. May I be consumed in the fire of prayer. He has abundantly proven His mercy by forgiving me over and over again for the ingratitude I have shown Him. When St. Peter was ungrateful, the Lord pardoned him once, but he has pardoned me many times. No wonder the spirit of evil was able to slip in and tempt me. In public, I was pretending to be best friends with the one whom I was treating like the enemy in private. How blind I was! 
Where, my beloved, did I think I could find a remedy other than in you? What foolishness! I ran away from the light just to stumble through darkness. Such proud humility. The spirit of evil convinced me to release my hold on the pillar and the staff that supported me and kept me from falling. I am making the sign of the cross as I write this. I don't think I ever passed through any danger as grave as the one in which the spirit of evil lured me away from prayer under the twisted pretext of humility. It made me question how someone as wicked as I could dare to approach God in this way. Wasn't it enough for me to recite the obligatory vocal prayers like everyone else? I didn't even do that well. To attempt to engage in silent communion with God, the spirit of evil suggested was to display a severe lack of reverence and appreciation for all the favors God had shown me. It was right to think about these things and try to understand them, but it was very wrong to use it as an excuse to give up the practice of prayer. May you be blessed, Lord, who came to my rescue. It seems to me that this is the same way Judas was tempted, although the traitor did not tempt me quite as openly. Instead, what he did to Judas in one moment, he did to me little by little. For the love of God, let all who practice prayer be on the lookout for such deception. Know that my life was an utter mess when it didn't have prayer in it. What a fine remedy the spirit of evil offered me. What pretty humility. And what terrible agitation. But how could my soul be calm? It was drifting further and further from its true quiet. When I remembered the blessings and mercies I had received, the pleasures of the world looked disgusting to me. I am astonished that I could endure this. It was only hope that enabled me to go on. I'm not sure exactly what I was thinking at this time. After all, it was more than twenty years ago. But I do recall that I never abandoned my determination to resume the practice of prayer eventually. I was just waiting for the day when I would be free from sin. Oh, how far astray this hope led me! The spirit of evil would have gladly kept me hoping till Judgment Day and then delivered me straight to hell. The practice of prayer and spiritual reading revealed the truth about the bad road I was following. But even though I beseeched the Lord with copious tears, it was no use. I was too wicked. There I was, separated from prayer, amusing myself with trivial activities, exposed to a thousand opportunities to miss the mark, and with little help in sight. No help, actually, except for help in sinning. What else could I possibly expect besides what happened to me as a result of these conditions? A certain Dominican friar named Vicente Barron deserves the credit for waking me from this sleep. He is a learned man and worthy in the sight of God. He made me receive communion every two weeks, and I began to return to my senses. I became less and less attached to my wicked ways, although I didn't entirely stop offending God. Since I had not lost the path altogether, however, I picked up my progress and slowly, gradually advanced, repeatedly stumbling and picking myself up again. Anyone who does not fail to keep walking will eventually arrive at his destination, even if he's a little late. Giving up on prayer is the same thing as losing your way. May God, being who he is, liberate us. For the love of God, pay close attention to my example and learn from it. It should be obvious from this account that a soul may attain a state in which God grants her indescribable blessings and she can still fall. She needs to avoid placing herself in precarious positions. She should not trust herself. Reflect deeply on this. It is very important. Even though a favor definitively comes from God, the spirit of evil can deceive the soul afterward harvesting as much benefit from this gift for itself as it possibly can. It uses what it steals from us to hurt us. 
If we have not grown strong in the virtues and have not cultivated sufficient detachment from the world, we are vulnerable to these tricks. No matter how powerful our resolutions are, we may be too weak to stand up to these dangers. This is an excellent teaching. It's not mine, but God's. I would like to share it with ignorant people like myself. Even if a soul finds herself in an exalted state, she must not trust herself to enter into battle because she may not be equipped to defend herself. We need armor to protect ourselves against the spirit of evil. Souls at this stage have not yet developed the strength they need to fight against these wicked energies and stump them out. The soul clearly perceives the difference between worldly and divine things. She sees herself very close to God and experiences His love for her. This love inspires confidence, and the soul is certain that she could never lose the blessing she is enjoying. The divine reward is so clear, even in this lifetime, that she could not imagine trading something so sublime and pure for anything as crude and impure as earthly pleasure. This is how the spirit of evil tricks her. It uses her confidence to rob her of humility. That's when the soul gets into trouble. She believes that she has nothing left to fear in herself, and so she places herself directly in the path of danger and begins to give away her fruits with wild abandon. This ardor does not come from pride. The soul understands perfectly that she can do nothing by herself. Her generosity springs from unconditional confidence in God, but she lacks discretion. She doesn't notice that she's still a fledgling. She can leave the nest. God can take her out. But she is not yet ready to fly. The virtues are not fully developed, and she has not had enough experience to recognize danger. She doesn't know what harm can come from too much trust in oneself. This is what destroyed me. Because of the peril of overconfidence, we need to fall back on the counsel of a spiritual director. There are also many other reasons to engage in conversations with spiritual people. I truly believe that once God has lifted a soul to this height, He will never cease blessing her unless she totally abandons Him. But when she falls, she must be extremely careful not to use this as an excuse to give up on prayer. This is how the devil tricked me in the guise of false humility. I know I have said this already, and I would like to repeat it many more times. The goodness of God is greater than all the evils of which we are capable. Let the soul rely exclusively on this goodness. We may be well aware of who we are and of all the favors God has bestowed on us as punishment for our wicked deeds, but the moment we wish to renew our friendship with Him, God forgets our ingratitude. In fact, our transgressions make Him all the more inclined to forgive us. We are, after all, members of His family. We have already eaten His bread. Remember the Word of God. Ponder what He has done for me. His majesty began to forgive me long before I grew tired of forsaking Him. He never grows weary of giving. His mercies are inexhaustible. Let us never grow tired of receiving them. May He be forever blessed. Amen. And may all things praise Him. Chapter 20 Prayer of Pain I will need God's help in explaining the difference between the prayer of union and the experience called rapture. By the way, other terms for rapture are flight of the spirit, elevation of the spirit, transport, and ecstasy. Rapture has a huge advantage over union. It yields a more abundant spiritual harvest. The beginning, middle, and end stages of union are undifferentiated. They resemble rapture in that they are deeply interior states. But the phenomena associated with rapture are of a much higher degree, and their benefits are of both an interior and exterior nature. 
May the Lord explain these things for me now, as he has so skillfully done before. If God had not given me some understanding of how to do this, I would never have been able to say anything relevant on my own. Let's reflect on the last spiritual water. This divine rain is so bountiful that we are almost convinced the cloud of his majestic glory is present right here in the world. If only the earth were capable of receiving it. We spontaneously express our gratitude for the gift of his awesome grace by engaging in acts of kindness. While the soul is in the middle of thanking God, the beloved suddenly gathers her up, the way clouds draw the morning mist and pulls her completely out of herself. The divine cloud ascends to heaven, taking the soul along with it, and begins to reveal to her the heavenly wonders God has prepared for her. I'm not sure if this metaphor is apt, but the fact is, this is what happens. The soul no longer seems to animate the body during these raptures. It feels like the body's temperature is dropping. A tremendous sense of ease and delight accompany this growing coldness. At this point, the rapture has become impossible to resist. In union, we are still connected to the earth, so we have the choice to surrender or fight the experience. It may be arduous, but we can fend it off if we really want to. But in these raptures, there is no remedy. They rush upon the soul as swiftly and powerfully as a mighty eagle swooping down and bearing her aloft in its wings. Without giving us a chance to think about it or plan our escape, this cloud sends us soaring. We see that we are being carried away, but we don't know where. Even though the experience is delightful, our nature is still weak, so it scares us at first. We need to cultivate a courageous spirit and hone our determination to risk everything and abandon ourselves into the Beloved's hands. Whether we like it or not, we have already been transported, so we might as well go willingly. This experience has been so traumatic for me that many times I tried with all my might to resist it. I have been especially reluctant to yield to it when it has happened to me in public, and yet when I have been alone, I have been afraid I might be suffering from delusions. Sometimes I have been able to overcome it, but the struggle has left me drained, like someone who has been in a fight with a giant. At other times, it has been impossible to resist. Then, it has carried away my entire soul, and sometimes my head too and I have been powerless to hold myself back. Sometimes the experience has taken up my whole body and lifted it off the ground. I haven't levitated very often. The first time it happened, I was kneeling in the choir, waiting to go up to the altar and receive communion. I was immediately distressed because I realized how unusual the experience was, and I was afraid that everyone was going to start talking about it. So I ordered the sisters who witnessed it to keep it to themselves. Since I had been appointed as their prioress, they had to do what I asked. After that, when I felt that the Lord was about to enrapture me again, I would stretch out on the floor and ask the other nuns to hold me down. This occurred recently during a sermon on St. Joseph's feast day. Even though we tried to hide it, some noble ladies who were visiting saw the whole thing. I implored the Lord not to give me any more favors that involved an outward show. I was getting tired of being considered special. It seems that God, in His mercy, acknowledged my prayer. Although that last incident was not very long ago, I have not experienced another levitation since that day. Whenever I have tried to resist the onset of a rapture, it has felt like a powerful force was lifting me from the soles of my feet. I don't know what to compare this force to. It is far more cataclysmic than anything I've experienced in the previous stages of prayer. The struggle is so ferocious that it utterly wears me out. But in the end, fighting is futile. If this is the Beloved's desire, there is no power equal to His. At other times, His Majesty recognizes that we are declining His favor not from fear, but from true humility. 
He is satisfied to know we see that He wants to bless us with His grace and that we realize He is not withholding His blessing from us. In this case, the soul receives the same benefits as if she had given her complete consent. The effects of rapture are remarkable. One is the sheer manifestation of God's great power. Another is our utter inability to hold back the body any more successfully than we can hold down the soul when His Majesty desires to raise it. We realize that we are not our own master, but that there is a supreme master who bestows these favors on us. When we remember that we can do absolutely nothing ourselves, deep humility is imprinted on our souls. Still, I confess that this particular favor terrified me. If you don't resist, the same force that carries your soul away in rapture will elevate your body with equal gentleness. Yet, when you see yourself lifted off the ground and remain conscious enough to witness the event, the majesty of the one who can cause such a thing is enough to make your hair stand on end. And the fear of offending such an awesome God stays with you. This fear, however, is accompanied by a very deep love for Him. And when we reflect on all He has done for such a lowly worm, the love grows even deeper. He does not seem satisfied with bringing the soul to Himself. He wants the body, too, even though it is made of impure clay, because it is mortal and inclined to make mistakes. Rapture also leaves an ineffable detachment in the soul. All I can say is that this experience is of a different order than the other states of prayer. Its effects are not only spiritual. Once the spirit detaches itself from worldly things, the Lord seems to want to bring the body along. The soul begins to suffer a new sense of estrangement from the world. Life becomes more arduous. The pain that follows rapture is not something we can fabricate for ourselves. Nor can we simply let it go once we have felt it. Oh, I wish I could articulate this profound pain. I don't think it's possible to put into words, but I'll try. This prayer of pain comes much later on the path than all the wondrous experience of visions and voices that I will tell you about later. The time that I used to spend in prayer was filled with those delightful blessings. Now, although my prayer time is not entirely devoid of those delights, it is primarily spent in pain. Sometimes the distress is more intense, sometimes less so. I'd like to tell you about the times when it is most severe. Later, I will speak about those great loving impulses I used to experience when the Lord was on the verge of transporting me. I see now that the feelings associated with rapture were very physical compared to the purely spiritual experience of this more advanced degree of prayer. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I make this distinction. I'm not suggesting that the shock that accompanies the onset of rapture is painless, but it is a pain that is shared by body and soul. This purely spiritual distress that I'm telling you about causes a terrible desolation in the soul. We do not play an active role in the prayer of pain, yet we are often overcome by an unexpected pang of desire that instantly permeates the whole of the soul. This longing wearies the soul, loosening her bonds to this earth. She rises far above herself and above all creation. God strips the soul of everything. Even if she wanted to, she could not find anything or anyone to keep her company in this desert. But she does not want companionship. She wants only to die alone here in the wilderness. She tries to speak, but she is mute. If someone speaks to her, it's pointless. No matter how much the soul may try to get away, she cannot escape this solitude. When it seems to me that God is furthest away, He suddenly communicates His magnificence in the strangest ways imaginable. His ways are inscrutable. I don't think anyone who has not experienced this could possibly understand. God does not offer this communication as a consolation. 
He is trying to show the soul that she has good reason for growing weary in the absence of a blessing that encompasses all blessings. The flame of the soul's desire is fanned by this divine communication, and it makes her solitude feel even more solitary. From the heart of this desert, the soul witnesses her delicate and penetrating pain, and she cries out as the royal prophet David cried out, I watch, and I am like a sparrow alone on the rooftop. Maybe King David was feeling the same desolation when he wrote that. Although I suspect that, being a saint, he experienced it on a much more profound level. This verse pops into my mind at times like these, and I think it perfectly echoes my own soul's lament. It's comforting to know that there are other beings who have experienced this radical solitude. The fact that some of these beings are as exalted as David is even more consoling. And so it seems that the soul is not connected to herself, but perched high on a rooftop, removed from herself and from all created things. I think she is far above even the highest part of herself. At other times, the soul's need is so great that she wanders around asking herself, Where is your God? I should mention that when that line from the psalm would come to me, I had only heard it in Latin and didn't know its translation in Spanish. Later, after I had learned its meaning, it comforted me to see that the Lord had brought it to me without my having anything to do with it. I also used to recall how St. Paul said that he was crucified to the world. I'm not presuming that these words apply to me. I know they don't. But it seems to me that the soul in this state experiences a kind of crucifixion. She receives no consolation from heaven, nor is she in heaven. She does not desire help from this earth, nor is she on earth. It's as if she were hanging between heaven and earth, finding no relief from either side. Eventually, the soul is given a heavenly knowledge of God. This divine understanding so far surpasses any earthly desire that it causes the soul even more anguish than before. Now she is so consumed with longing that it obliterates her sensory consciousness. But this intensity only lasts a short time. It's like the agony of death, except that it also carries with it such great joy that no comparison could adequately convey it. It is an arduous yet delightful martyrdom. The soul totally rejects even the most alluring worldly things. She knows beyond all doubt that she wants nothing but God. She is no longer attached to any particular attributes of Him, but loves Him as a whole. And yet, she does not know what she loves. I say she does not know because the imagination is incapable of conjuring up any imagery. In fact, none of the faculties function during the time this occurs. Whereas it is joy that suspends the faculties in union and in rapture, it is pain that suspends them here. Oh, Jesus, if only you could help me explain this to the man who ordered me to write this account so that he could then explain it to me. This is the state my soul is in all the time now. Whenever I am not occupied with something, my soul plunges into this yearning for death, and when I feel it coming on, I am afraid that I will never die. Yet as the pain engulfs me, I long to suffer like this for the rest of my life, even though the pain is so great that no one could possibly endure it. The sisters who have witnessed me in this state say that sometimes my pulse seems to stop, my arms become rigid, and my hands are so stiff that I cannot even clasp them in prayer. The next day my wrists ache and my whole body hurts, as if all my joints were dislocated. Sometimes I really think that if this prayer of pain continues, it must be the Lord's will to end it by ending my life. This suffering feels like more than enough to kill me. But I know that I don't deserve death. When I am in this agony, all I want is to die. I don't think about purgatory. I don't think about how my sins merit hell. I am oblivious to everything but my passionate longing to see God. This 
solitude in the desert of my soul feels better to me than any earthly companionship. The only possible comfort for a soul in this anguish would be to talk with someone else who has experienced it. But no matter how much the soul complains of her torment, no one seems to believe her. Her suffering is so acute that she no longer desires solitude. But she can't tolerate company either, unless it is someone to whom she can complain. The soul is like a person with a rope pulled tight around her neck. She is suffocating, desperate for relief. Her distress puts her in danger of death, and her desire for companionship seems like a sign of cowardice. Believe me, I know what it feels like to be close to death. My illnesses have brought me to death's door more than once. This spiritual distress is as serious as any fever I have ever endured. There arises an overwhelming desire for the soul and the body not to be separated. And so the soul calls out for help. She begs for relief. By expressing her pain and distracting herself, the soul seeks a remedy to help her survive. On the other hand, the spirit, which is the higher part of the soul, does not want to turn away from the grace of the pain. I don't know if I'm managing to make any sense here, but I strongly believe this is what happens. Do you see what little rest the soul can find in this life? The Lord used to comfort me and relieve my soul through prayer and solitude. Now these things only bring torment. Yet this torment pleases a soul so deeply, and she sees it as so valuable, that she desires this suffering beyond all the holy favors she used to receive. And she believes that this is the safer path because it is the way of the cross. This state of prayer carries a very special blessing with it. Even though the body experiences only pain, the soul both suffers and rejoices. The soul somehow derives exquisite joy from this acute pain. I don't know how this happens, but it does. I, for one, wouldn't trade this gift the Lord gives me for any of the others I will tell you about later. Remember, this prayer of pain comes after all the other blessings I am writing about. This is the favor the Beloved is granting me now. In the beginning, I was afraid. It almost always frightens me when the Lord gives me a new gift. Eventually, as I make progress, His Majesty reassures me. When I first started to experience the prayer of pain, God told me not to fear but to treasure this gift above all the others He had given me. The soul is purified by this pain. It is refined and polished like gold in a crucible. God dips our souls in the enamel of His grace so that we radiate His blessings. The prayer of pain purges our souls of whatever would otherwise have to be purged in purgatory. I always knew this was a great favor, but after God reassured me, I felt much better about it. My spiritual guide tells me that this is a good thing. Since I am so wretched, I always have something to fear, but I could never believe that this prayer of pain was bad. On the contrary, I was in awe of such a generous blessing, especially when I reflected on how little I deserved it. Blessed be the Lord who is so good. Amen. I seem to have wandered off the subject again. I started by talking about raptures, but this other state I've been describing transcends rapture. It has a transformative impact on the soul. Let's get back to raptures and enumerate their most common features. They often seem to drain the weight from my body and leave me exceedingly light. Sometimes I couldn't remember how to touch my feet to the floor. When the body is in rapture, it's like a corpse. It doesn't have the power to do anything for itself. It is frozen into whatever position it was in when the rapture came on, sitting, perhaps with open hands. It's rare to faint, although I have sometimes lost consciousness altogether. If the senses shut down, it's usually only for a short time. Rapture is supremely disorienting. While the body is powerless to perform any outward action, the soul is still able to see and hear things, even though they feel like they're coming from far away. At the height of the rapture, 
faculties are left behind in the wake of the soul's intense union with God. In those moments, I believe the soul fails to see or hear or feel anything but Him. But as with the prayer of union, the soul's total transformation in God only lasts a short time. While it endures, the faculties feel nothing and the soul understands nothing. Maybe the soul doesn't understand what's happening because God doesn't want her to know such things while she is still here on earth. He knows we are incapable of containing this knowledge. I have discovered this for myself. How is it, you may ask, that the raptures sometimes last for such a long time? And why do they happen so often? In my case, the rapture is not always continuous. Rather, I experience it at intervals. It's true that the Beloved often enfolds my soul and suspends my faculties for a while, but then He releases my senses and keeps only my will in captivity. The other two faculties behave like the small pointer on a sundial. They never stop moving. Unless, of course, the Son of Justice wants them to, and then He simply brings their activity to a halt. Complete rapture may only last for a moment. But the surge of power that propels this flight of the Spirit is so intense that the will remains absorbed for a while. Even when the other faculties begin to stir again, the will rules the body. Nothing the restless faculties do to try and vanquish the will has any effect. If the Lord wishes to suspend the faculties again, the will sweeps them back up into union with it. Whether or not we want to close our eyes, they close of their own accord. If our eyes stay open, we don't notice anything or register what we see. There isn't much a person in this condition can do. When the other faculties join the union, there is even less to do. Anyone who experiences rapture should not be alarmed if the body feels constricted for a few hours and the mind and memory are distracted. True. The faculties are busy praising God and trying to figure out exactly what just happened to them. But they are not even fully awake for this task. They are like people who have been asleep and dreaming for a long time and are having some trouble waking up. I've gone to such great lengths to describe this experience because I know of some people here in Avila to whom the Lord has been granting these favors. To an unlearned spiritual guide who has not gone through this himself, the enraptured person might appear dead. It's a shame what these people have to suffer when their guides don't understand them. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Since the Lord has already given you tastes of this rapture, you will know whether or not I have successfully explained myself. Although, since it's been quite a while since you've had an episode, you might not have observed its effects as much as I have. So then, no matter how hard I try to stir after a flight of the Spirit, it takes a long time until my body is able to cooperate. The soul has carried away its strength. But if a person is ill and suffering from racking pain before a rapture, he often returns to himself healthy and strong afterward. There is a mysterious medicine available to a person in such a state of prayer. Rapture teaches the body to obey the soul. So when the Lord wishes the body to share in the blessing, healing happens. If the rapture has been particularly intense, the person may go around for a day or two, or even three, with the faculties so absorbed that she seems to be in a kind of stupor. She is still more outside herself than in. When she has to go back to everyday life, she feels despair. Here the fledgling soul has shed its down and sprouted wings to carry her high. Here, Christ's banner is fully unfurled. It truly seems like the guardian of the fortress has climbed, or been lifted, to the highest tower to proclaim the name of God. She looks down on the people below with the perspective of someone who is out of harm's way, like someone who has been reassured of victory. She no longer fears danger. She almost craves it. Here the soul clearly sees that everything below is trivial and does not matter as much as she thought it did. Anyone who attains this height perceives many things. 
The soul doesn't want to want anything anymore. She is not interested in free will. She gives the key of her will back to the Lord. This is exactly the way I feel right now. Take it, I beg him. Behold, now the gardener is promoted to the position of steward. Her only desire is to do God's will. She doesn't want to be the ruler of herself or of anything else, not even of a single pear tree in God's orchard. If there is anything good here, she wants His Majesty to give it away. From now on, the soul desires nothing for herself. She wants to be in total harmony with His will and His greater glory. The truth is, if the rapture is authentic, all of these things I'm telling you about happen. If the benefits and the other effects I mentioned are not sustained, then I sincerely doubt that the experience came from God. I would suspect that they were the product of the kind of seizure St. Vincent warned us about. I have clearly observed that an hour or so after the rapture has passed, the soul is left with such a sense of freedom and mastery over all things that she doesn't recognize herself. She doesn't understand how she could be the recipient of such goodness. She clearly sees that it has nothing to do with her, but she also understands the tremendous value that each of these raptures carries with it. No one would believe this unless he had experienced it, so people don't believe the poor soul who reports on God's gift to her. After all, she used to be such a wretched creature. Now here she is, suddenly striving for things that demand the utmost courage. The soul is no longer content with serving her beloved in insignificant ways, but becomes intent on serving him to the fullest extent of her ability. Observers judge this as nothing more than temptation and foolishness. If only they could understand that these desires don't come from the soul, but from the one to whom she has handed over the keys to her will. Then they wouldn't be so surprised. In my opinion, the soul who has attained this state does not speak or act for herself anymore. Her sovereign Lord is taking care of everything. Oh God, help me! The psalmist was so right. And we will all be correct when we cry out with longing for the wings of a dove. He was clearly talking about the flight of the Spirit in that psalm. When the Spirit takes flight, it rises above all creatures and above itself, first of all. It is a gentle journey, a delightful odyssey, a flight that makes no noise. What power a soul has when the Lord brings her to this place. She sees everything without being caught up in it. How ashamed she feels of the time when she used to be enmeshed. She is shocked by how blind she was. What sorrow she feels for those who are still blind, especially if they are people of prayer who are already blessed by God. She wants to cry out and let them know how deluded they are. Sometimes she even does cry out, and then a thousand persecutions rain down on her head. People judge such a soul to be seriously lacking in humility, particularly if she is a woman. They point out that she is trying to teach the people from whom she should be learning, so they condemn her, and they have ample reason to do so. They can't possibly know the loving impulse that motivates her. There are times when the soul simply can't help herself. She is overwhelmed by the need to disillusion the people she loves and the desire to be liberated from the prison of this life. She recognizes that the life she used to live is nothing but the life of a captive. It wearies the soul to reflect on the time when she was so concerned about her reputation. She resents having been led to believe that what the world calls honor is honor. She sees that this is just a big lie and that we are all beguiled by it. She understands that true honor has nothing to do with illusion and everything to do with reality. True honor lies in discriminating between what is of value and what is worthless. It's a matter of judging something to be something and nothing to be nothing. 
everything that comes to an end is nothing and less than nothing and is not pleasing to God. The soul laughs at herself when she remembers having been so attached to money. Actually, I don't think I personally ever had cause to confess coveting money, but it was enough of a fault to have at least been attracted to it. If I could have purchased the good I now see in myself with mere money, I would have valued it more highly. But I see that I have only won this goodness by giving up everything. What can we buy with this money we want so badly? Is it anything of value? Is it something that lasts? If not, why do you want it so much? That which provides such empty relief costs us dearly. Often the only thing we buy with money is a ticket to the everlasting fires of hell. Oh, if only everyone would see money as worthless dirt. How harmonious the world would be then. How many lawsuits would be avoided if self-interest and pride of money were eliminated. What friendships would form among all peoples? I think this would solve almost all of society's problems. The soul sees how blind people grow in the face of pleasure and how all it gets us is worry and strife. What restlessness! What discontent! What a waste of energy! In this state of prayer, the sunlight is so bright that not only does the soul become aware of the cobwebs that shroud her, but she perceives even the tiniest speck of dust. And so, no matter how hard the soul tries to be perfect, once this sun truly shines on her, she will see herself as impure. The soul is like water in a glass. It looks very clear when it's in shadow, but the minute the light strikes, you can see many particles floating in it. This is an apt metaphor. Before the soul's experience of ecstasy, she thinks she is doing absolutely everything in her power to please God and not to forsake Him. But when she attains this height of prayer, the Son of Justice strikes her eyes and opens them. When she sees so many motes of dust, she wants to shut them again. She has not yet become fully a child of the mighty eagle who can gaze directly at the sun. In the short time that she can keep her eyes open, the soul sees herself as very muddy. She recalls that line in the psalm that says, Who shall be just in your presence? When the soul looks into this divine sun, its brightness dazzles her. When she looks into herself, the dust clouds her eyes and the little dove is blinded. So the soul is often left bedazzled, absorbed, and frightened. The wonders revealed to her make her swoon. This is where the soul gains true humility. She doesn't care if others say bad things about her. She has no need to say good things about herself. Now the Lord, not the soul, distributes the fruits of the garden. Nothing sticks to her hand. All the good in the soul is directed toward God. If she says anything about herself, it is only for His glory. She knows that nothing in the garden is her own. Even if she wanted to ignore this truth, she could not avoid seeing it. In spite of herself, the soul sees with her own eyes how God closes her eyes to the things of the world, only to open them to the truth. Chapter 21 Advice to World Leaders To wrap up what I've been discussing, I will remind you that the soul does not need to give her permission to be transported in this way. She has already surrendered herself completely to God. She has willingly delivered herself into His hands, and she knows that there is nothing she can do to fool Him because He knows everything. Things are different here on earth. There is so much deception and duplicity here. A certain person persuades you that he is your friend, and then you find out that it was all a lie. Who can live in a world so rife with deceit and betrayal? The more you care about worldly things, the more difficult it is. Blessed be the soul the Lord brings to an understanding of the truth. 
If only world leaders could enter this exalted consciousness, it would be so much more worthwhile for them to strive for this state of prayer than for all the power in the world. What righteousness would prevail in a nation like this? What atrocities would be avoided? Any man who reaches this stage has such unshakable love of God that any fear of risking his honor or his life falls away. This is an especially great blessing for someone who has the obligation to lead his community. Such a king would be willing to lose a thousand kingdoms if God would increase his faith by a fraction of a degree and give him the opportunity to shine a little light of faith into the hearts of the doubters. And rightly so. The benefits would be so much greater than worldly dominion, a kingdom without end. One drop of water from that place makes everything here on earth seem vulgar. Imagine if the soul were totally immersed in that water. Oh, Lord, even if you were to give me the authority to proclaim these truths publicly, no one would believe me. No one believed those who expressed themselves better than I have. But at least it would satisfy me to have a real voice. I would count my life as nothing if it meant that I could clearly communicate even one of these sacred teachings to the world. Who knows what I would do after that? I am not to be trusted. In spite of what I am, I keep having these irresistible impulses to speak the truth to political leaders. But since I do not have access to these men, I turn to you, my Lord, and beg you to make all things right. You well know that I would gladly forfeit all the blessings you have given me and transfer them to these rulers as long as I could remain in a state where I would never offend you. If they could experience what I have experienced, I know that it would be impossible for them to allow the violations they have been condoning. Oh, my God! Please help world leaders understand the magnitude of their responsibilities. You have singled them out. I have heard it said that when a powerful ruler dies, there are signs of his death in the heavens, as there was a sign in heaven when Jesus died. My heart quickens with devotion, my king, when I realize that you have provided these signs to show world leaders how important it is to walk in the footsteps of the Lord. I certainly am growing bold, aren't I? Please. Tear this up if it sounds bad to you. Believe me, I could say this a lot better in person if only they would listen to me. I sincerely pray for our leaders, and I would like to be of some help to them. Such an urge makes a soul reckless. I would gladly risk my life to gain what I believe in. Living is empty once we have seen the grand delusion with our own eyes and realize what suffering comes from walking in blindness. Once a soul has attained this level of prayer, she does not merely desire to serve God. His majesty gives her the strength to manifest the desire. The soul would not hesitate to try anything that might be of service to him. Any sacrifice for his sake feels like nothing, because she knows that anything other than pleasing him means nothing. The trouble is, that people as worthless as I am don't find many opportunities to do something useful. May it please you, my God, that the time may come when I will be able to repay you a speck of all I owe you. May it be your will, O Lord, that this servant of yours actually serve you in some way. Other women have done heroic things for love of you. I'm no good for anything but talk. This must be why you don't put me to work, my God. Everything with me adds up to nothing more than a bunch of wishes and words about how much I should be doing for you. The best of my intentions give me no relief, since they are always coupled with fear of failing you. Before you do anything else, good of all good, my Jesus, fortify my soul, then help me to help you. Who could bear receiving so much and giving so little? I don't care what it costs, my beloved. Please don't let me come into your presence empty-handed anymore. 
Shouldn't our reward be in proportion to our deeds? Here is my life. Here's my honor. Here's my will. I give them all to you. I am yours. Use me as you will. I know all too well, my beloved, how little I am capable of. But now I have reached you. Now I have climbed the watchtower, and I can see truths I could not see before. Now I can accomplish anything as long as you don't leave me. If you leave, even if only for a brief time, I will go back to where I was, which was hell. It's excruciating for a soul who has found herself in this place to return to the mundane world. This life looks like a farce. It feels like a complete waste of time to have to deal with physical needs like eating and sleeping. Everything wearies the soul, and she can't figure out how to escape. She sees herself as a prisoner in chains. Now she understands why St. Paul besieged God to free him from the body. Her cries join his, and she begs God to liberate her. This condition is so intense that it seems as if the soul were straining to break free of the body and go off in search of this freedom. No one else seems to be willing to deliver her. The soul wanders around like a slave sold into captivity in a foreign land. What distresses her most is that she rarely encounters anyone else to join her in her complaints and prayers for freedom. Everyone seems to want only to live. Oh, if only we could be more detached. If only we didn't derive our satisfaction from any worldly thing. Then the pain of living without the one we love and the yearning to live a true life would mitigate any fear of death. If a woman like me is so often brokenhearted in the face of my exile, I wonder sometimes what the saints must have felt like. The charity I have given has been tepid, and my deeds have not assured me of true rest. What did St. Paul and the Magdalene and others like them go through? The fire of love was blazing in them. It must have been a state of perpetual martyrdom for them. The only people who bring me any comfort are the ones I encounter who have the same desires as I have and accompany them with actions. I mention action because there are people who consider themselves detached and broadcast this fact. Long years of spiritual practice and conformity with religious dogma would suggest that they have attained some degree of perfection. But even from a distance, the soul can tell the difference between those who have nothing but words and those who have confirmed these words through action. She understands what little good the first group does and how much work the second group gets done. I have already told you about the fruits of the raptures that come from the Spirit of God. The truth is, some of these effects may be more and some less. What I mean by less is that in the beginning, some of the effects of rapture may not be proven with actions. This makes it impossible to prove their authenticity. Raptures cause the soul to grow in perfection. They banish every last trace of cobwebs. This takes time. As love and humility flourish in the soul, the flowers of virtue spread their perfume for the enjoyment of this soul and of others. Actually, the beloved can work such wonders in a rapture that the soul is left with almost no work to achieve a state of perfection. Only those who have tasted this experience will be able to believe what the Lord Himself gives to the soul at this stage. In my opinion, nothing we can do will bring us to this place. I am not denying that a person who makes a concerted effort on the spiritual path will, with the help of God, achieve some degree of detachment and transformation. There are many benefits to be gained by diligently implementing some of the methods taught by authors who have written about prayer but it will be a laborious process and will take much longer. In rapture, without our doing anything, the Lord lifts up the soul and transports her from this earth. Even if such a soul deserves these favors no more than I did, God gives her mastery of all earthly things. I cannot overemphasize my own lack of merit. I had almost none at all. 
Why does his majesty do this? Because he wants to. And he does it the way he wants to. It doesn't matter whether or not the soul considers herself to be ready. His majesty will prepare her to receive his blessing. Just because a soul has cultivated her garden well does not necessarily mean that she has earned rapture. Although it is absolutely true that anyone who takes good care of the garden and strives to be detached will be blessed. But sometimes it is God's will to display his great glory in meager soil. He so thoroughly prepares the ground of a wretched soul that she is incapable of turning back to her former life of offending him. The mind has grown so accustomed to dwelling on the real truth that anything less feels like a game of make-believe. Sometimes the soul laughs to herself when she sees serious men, men of prayer and religion, making a big deal about some minor point of dignity or honor that she has long since trampled underfoot. They claim that it is a matter of discretion, and that the more prestigious their status, the more good they can do. The soul understands they would do far more good in one day than in ten years if they thought a lot less about their authority and simply loved God. Thus, the soul walks a troubled path, bearing many crosses, but she experiences rapid growth. Her companions think she has reached the summit, but then God grants her new favors and she ascends even higher. The soul is his soul. He is in charge. He illuminates her. It seems that he is guarding her against offending him. He helps her to wake up in service of him. When my soul reached this sublime state, all the evil in me disappeared, and the Lord gave me the strength to walk away from my bad habits. It no longer bothered me to be exposed to temptation and to spend time with people who used to distract me. It was as if these occasions for error were not excuses for missing the mark at all. In fact, what used to do me harm was helping me. Everything was an opportunity to know and love God better. Everything reminded me of what I owed Him, and this prevented me from going back to the way I was. It all happened so quickly. I knew that I had nothing to do with my dramatic spiritual progress. His Majesty, in His great goodness, had blessed me with His favors and given me the strength to handle them. From the day the Beloved gave me my first ecstasy to the present moment, He has been increasing my strength. In His kindness, He has held my hand so that I would not turn back. It seems to me that I don't do anything now. And it's true. He does it all. I believe that a soul in this state could be in the company of any kind of people and not be thrown off course. As long as she receives God's favors with humility and gratitude, always bearing in mind that the Beloved gives them and that she herself does almost nothing, she will retain her equanimity. Even if people are unconscious and corrupt, the soul will not be disturbed or enticed. On the contrary, the experience will help her to grow. These souls have grown so strong that God has chosen them to serve others. As the soul comes nearer to God in this place, he communicates very deep secrets to her. With ecstasy come true revelations. With ecstasy come great favors and visions. All this phenomena humble the soul and fortify her. They dilute her attraction to the things of this life. They give her glimpses into the magnificent life the Lord has prepared for those who devote themselves to Him. May it please His Majesty that the boundless generosity He has heaped on such an ungrateful wretch serve as an inspiration to those who read this to give up everything for God. If the rewards His Majesty bestows on us even in this lifetime are so radical, Imagine what he has in store for us in the next. Chapter 22 Sacred Humanity If you will permit me, there's one more thing I'd like to say. I think it's very important, 
And if you think so too, you can draw on it whenever you need to give some advice on the subject. That could happen. Books on prayer suggest that the soul is ultimately capable of lifting her own spirit with tender humility and raising it above all created things. The authors acknowledge that this can only happen after the soul has spent years purifying herself, the purgative stage, and has begun to receive God's light, the illuminative stage. They admit that the flight of the spirit is a totally supernatural phenomena that God works on the soul, but they recommend ways in which the soul can contribute to her evolution in prayer. Here's what they say. Get rid of all physical images and contemplate pure divinity. Even the thought of Christ's humanity, they say, is an impediment to perfect contemplation. They use what Christ said to his disciples at the time of his ascension to support their theory. It seems to me, by the way, that if the disciples had faith that he was both God and man, as they did after the Holy Spirit came to them, his form would not have been an obstacle. After all, he had no need to speak these words to his blessed mother, did he? And she loved him more than all of them. The theologians I am referring to think that since contemplative prayer is entirely spiritual work, any corporeal thing can hinder it. Contemplatives, they advise, should try to think of God in a general way. He is everywhere, they say. We are immersed in Him. This is good, sometimes, but I cannot bear that we should withdraw completely from Christ or place His divine body on the same level with all created things and our own earthly miseries. May His Majesty give me the ability to explain what I mean by this. I don't mean to contradict this theory about contemplative prayer. These authors are learned and spiritual men, and they know what they're talking about. God leads souls by many different paths. It is not my place to meddle. I can only speak about the way God has led me and the danger in which I placed myself by trying to put some of the things I was reading into practice. I do believe, however, that people who have not passed beyond the stage of visions and raptures are inclined to think that formlessness is the best path. This is what I used to think. But there is a level of prayer that transcends union. If I had adhered to the practice of formless contemplation, I never would have arrived where I am now. In my opinion, this practice is a mistake. Maybe I'm the one who is mistaken, but I will tell you what happened to me. I didn't have a spiritual director when I was reading those books on prayer, and I thought I was getting somewhere on my own. Later, of course, it became painfully apparent to me that, unless His Majesty gave me some understanding through experience, books were not very helpful, since I didn't know what I was doing. So when I began to experience the prayer of quiet, I tried to banish all corporeal associations from my mind. I still felt too wretched even to dare to elevate my own spirit. I thought that would be presumptuous of me. I believed, though, that I felt the presence of God, and I did feel it. So I endeavored to recollect myself in His presence. The prayer of quiet is a lovely prayer. If God lends His assistance, it brings unspeakable delight. Since the fruits I derived from this prayer were so delectable, no one could possibly have convinced me to return to meditating on the humanity of Christ. I would have considered this only an impediment. O oh Lord of my soul and my highest good, O oh crucified Christ, I cannot look back on this opinion of mine without terrible pain. What was I thinking? I feel like I became a traitor. But it was a matter of sheer ignorance. I had been deeply devoted to Christ all my life. This effort to transcend His humanity came fairly recently, just before the Lord began to grant me all those raptures and visions, and I didn't keep it up for very long. I easily returned to my customary practice of praising the Lord, especially when I received communion. 
I wished I could keep a painting or a statue of him with me at all times, since his image was not as deeply etched in my soul as I would have liked. Is it really possible, my lord, that it entered my mind for even an hour that you can be an obstacle to my greatest good? Where have all my blessings come from if not from you? I cannot bear to think that I was at fault in this matter. It makes me so sad. I was only a victim of ignorance. And so you, in your goodness, decided to remedy the situation by sending me someone to correct this error. Later, you allowed me to see you so many times that I couldn't help but understand how severe my mistake had been. This moved me to convey this truth to everyone I could and to write it down here. In my opinion, this rejection of sacred imagery prevents souls who have already tasted the prayer of union from evolving beyond that experience and attaining radical spiritual liberation. I have a couple of reasons for thinking this. Maybe I'm not saying anything at all. But I learned this from experience. My soul was in terrible shape before the Lord flooded it with His light. His blessings were coming in small packages. Once I had opened them, it was over. I didn't have the companionship of Christ to sustain me through the trials and temptations that inevitably came up. The first reason I think it's a mistake to dismiss all images is that it shows a lack of humility. It's such a subtle lack and so well concealed that it could easily go unnoticed. Who could possibly be so proud and miserable that after he had spent a lifetime engaged in ardent prayers, penances, and persecutions, he would fail to feel anything other than joyous gratitude when the Lord allowed him to remain at the foot of the cross with St. John? I was that proud. I was that miserable. Only stupid people like me would be anything other than deeply grateful for this honor. When everything should have been going right for me, I made it all go wrong. Sometimes our health or our temperament keeps us from being able to dwell on the passion of Christ. It is excruciating. But what stops us from being with Him in His risen state? We have Him so near to us when we participate in the Blessed Sacrament. He is already glorified here. We don't have to gaze upon Him when He is weary, broken, and bleeding, exhausted by the side of the road, persecuted by the people for whom He did so much good, doubted by His own apostles. Who could bear to think about His suffering all the time? Behold Him free of suffering here, full of glory, about to ascend to heaven. As our companion in the most blessed sacrament, he strengthens us and gives us courage. It does not seem possible for him to leave us even for a moment, ever. Under the pretext of serving you, my beloved, I abandoned you. I did not know you when I was offending you. But once I came to know you, how could I have thought it was a good thing to reject you so persistently? What a bad path I was walking. I realize now that I was not on any path at all until you brought me back home to you. When I saw you beside me, I saw all blessings. Once I looked at you as you really were, standing before the judges, there was no trial I was not willing to suffer. Whoever lives in the presence of such a good friend and excellent master, one who stepped forward to be the first to suffer, can endure all things. The Lord helps us. He gives us strength and never fails us. He is a true friend. After my encounter with Christ, I clearly saw that God wanted me to receive His blessings through the sacred humanity of Christ, in whom His majesty is well pleased. I have learned this truth over and over again through experience. The Lord has told it to me. I have definitely seen that this is the gate I must pass through if I want His Sovereign Majesty to reveal great secrets to me. And so, even if you have reached the summit of contemplation, you can trust that if you take this path, you will walk safely. All the blessings we seek are available through this Lord of ours. He will teach us everything. 
All we have to do is look at the example of his life. Unlike worldly friends, this friend will never abandon us in our labors and our troubles. What more could we want than to have such a companion by our side? Blessed is the soul who perpetually keeps him near her. Think of the glorious St. Paul. It seemed that the name of Jesus was always on his lips. That's how close he held his Lord in his heart. Ever since I had this realization, I've been carefully considering the lives of some of the great contemplatives and saints. I see that they also took this path. St. Francis through the stigmata, St. Anthony of Padua with the infant, St. Bernard rejoiced in the sacred humanity, as did St. Catherine of Siena and many others. You would know this list better than I do. Of course, the path of turning away from forms must be a good one if so many spiritual teachers advise it. But in my opinion, it's only appropriate when a soul is very advanced. Until then, it is best to seek the Creator through His creatures. The ability to transcend the physical depends on the particular blessing God grants each soul. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the most sacred humanity of Christ, which should not be equated with ordinary corporeal things. I wish I knew how to explain this clearly. Once God decides to suspend the faculties, this presence is taken from us. Even if we desire to hold on to Christ's form, all forms fall away. We accept this. Blessed be such a loss that enables us to fully enjoy what we seem to be losing. Only then is the soul completely engaged with loving the one the intellect labored in vain to know. Then she loves what she did not understand. Then she rests in a joy she never could have experienced unless she had lost herself to gain herself. But I don't think it's right to give up the wholehearted effort to keep his sacred humanity present with us at all times. May the Lord grant us this blessed presence. Otherwise, the soul is left floating around in the air. No matter how filled with the divine she may think she is, she is completely ungrounded. Living human beings need human support. Remember, lack of support can lead to lack of humility. That's when people try to elevate the soul before God elevates it. They are not content to meditate on something as precious as Christ's sacred humanity. They long to be merry before they have worked with Martha. When the Lord wants to raise up the soul, even if it's the very first time she has ever practiced prayer, she has no reason to be afraid. But let's cultivate our consciousness. This minuscule lack of humility may seem to be nothing, but it does a great deal of harm if you're trying to advance in contemplation. Bear in mind that we are not angels. We have these bodies. It's crazy to desire to be angels while we are still on earth, especially if we are as earthbound as I was. Our thoughts generally need something to anchor them. It's rare for a soul to become so transported, so filled with God that she doesn't need any forms to hold her. During those times when it's difficult to maintain our equanimity, such as when we are negotiating business or enduring persecution or experiencing spiritual aridity, Christ is a very good friend to have. We can picture him as a man and identify with his weaknesses and his troubles. He keeps us company. Once we have begun to develop this habit, it's easy to find him beside us when we look for him. There will be times, though, when we are neither capable of finding Christ nor of transcending form. When this happens, it's a good idea to cultivate the detachment I've been talking about and not go rushing around in search of spiritual consolations. Embrace the cross unconditionally. This is the best thing. Christ was deprived of all consolation and abandoned in his suffering. Let's not abandon him again. He can support us far better than we can support ourselves. In his hands, we will ascend to great heights. When Christ determines that it's appropriate to remove himself, he will remove himself and allow his majesty to draw the soul beyond herself and beyond all forms. 
God is very pleased to see a soul humbly accept his son as mediator. He appreciates it when a soul loves his son so much that even when his majesty desires to elevate the soul to the highest level of contemplation, she questions her own worthiness. Depart from me, Lord, says the soul with St. Peter, for I am a sinner. I am a living example of this. It is the way God has led my soul. Other souls find a shorter route. I have discovered that humility is the ground of prayer. And the deeper the soul bows down in prayer, the higher the beloved will lift her up. I do not remember a single time when he bestowed his favors on me that I had not first been overwhelmed by my nothingness. His majesty has revealed truths to me that I could never have imagined, truths that help me to know myself. I believe that when a soul meddles in the prayer of union in hopes of furthering her own progress, she will quickly trip and fall. Unless her foundation is solid, she may think that she's doing something useful, but she's actually hindering her progress. I'm afraid such a soul will not achieve true poverty of spirit. True spiritual nakedness means putting down our tools and resting in aridity. Having already given up looking for earthly comforts, we now give up our search for consolation in prayer. The only solace we seek is participation in the trials of the one who lived a life of trials. The consolation this gives us should not cause us pain and agitation. This is what certain souls suffer when they become overly attached to their efforts to find devotion through their intellect. They think, if they're not always striving and laboring with the mind, they're failing. As if they had any control over God's blessings. I'm not saying they should not make every effort to be in God's presence. But if they can't even conjure up a decent thought, they shouldn't kill themselves trying. Who do we think we are? We are only his servants, powerless. But this is what the Lord wants. He wants us to acknowledge our powerlessness and behave like those little donkeys some people employ to propel the water wheel. Even though they are wearing blinders and have no idea what they're doing, they draw more water than the gardener can with all his busy labor. Our job is simply to place ourselves in God's hand. Then we can walk our path in freedom. If His Majesty calls us to His secret chamber, we should joyfully go to Him. If He doesn't, we should be content to serve Him through humbler tasks and not always try to sit down in the best seat. God cares more about us than we care about ourselves. He knows the best fit for each of us. Once we have delivered the whole of our will into the hands of God, why would we presume to direct our own life? In my opinion, our interference does more harm here than in the earlier stages of prayer. These blessings are supernatural. If a person has a bad voice, forcing herself to sing is not going to make it better. But if God gives her a good voice, she doesn't even need to practice. She just opens her mouth and makes music. Let the soul surrender to His will and trust in His great goodness. Let her always ask Him to grant us His grace. Once she has received permission to sit at Christ's feet, she shouldn't budge. Let her stay there as long as she likes, emulating the Magdalene. If she is strong, God will lead her into the wilderness. This explanation should be enough to satisfy you at least until you find someone with more experience and more knowledge than I have. If you encounter seekers who are beginning to receive tastes of the divine and think they are the architects of their own spiritual growth and gratification, don't believe them. How gloriously God reveals himself when he chooses to, entirely independent of our petty little efforts. No matter how much we try to elevate ourselves when God decides to carry away our spirits, it is like a giant lifting a piece of straw. We are incapable of resisting. Wouldn't it be strange if a toad believed it could fly of its own volition whenever it wanted to? 
It seems to me even more difficult and arduous for our spirit to lift itself up to God unless He chooses to raise us up to Himself. The desire to fly does us no good as long as we are weighed down with a thousand earthly burdens. It is true that flying is more natural to us than it is to a toad, but we have become mired in the muck and have lost our ability to soar. I'd like to conclude by saying this. Whenever we think of Christ, we should think of His love. It is with love that He has bestowed so many gifts on us. It is with love that God has given us such a sign and promise of His great love. Love gives rise to more love. Even if we are just beginning on the path and are still very wretched, let us strive to carry this divine love with us wherever we go and to increasingly awaken ourselves in love. If the Beloved decides to bless us by pressing the seal of His love into our hearts, everything will be easy for us. Heavy tasks will become light, and we will finish them quickly. God knows how much we need His love. In the name of the great love He revealed to us through His glorious Son, and in the name of the love Christ demonstrated for us at such a high cost to Himself, let His Majesty give us His love again and again. Amen. I just need to ask you one question. When the Lord begins to grant such sublime favors to the soul, when He places her in a state of perfect contemplation, for instance, shouldn't she become immediately and irrevocably perfect? Simply by virtue of the fact that someone who tastes such a blessing by definition loses all craving for earthly consolations, it seems like this should be the case. Why is it such a gradual awakening? The more raptures and other divine favors the soul receives, the more sublime are their effects and the more detached the soul becomes from the things of this world. The same Lord that blesses the soul with these experiences could sanctify her in an instant. Instead, He perfects her virtues little by little over time. Why? This is what I'd like to know, since I have no idea what the answer is. I do know there is a big difference between the degree of fortitude God leaves in the soul in the beginning, when the rapture is over in the twinkling of an eye and its effects are almost imperceptible, and the power instilled later on when the transport lasts much longer. I often think this must be because we are incapable of preparing ourselves all at once. The Lord steadily fosters the young soul until she has developed the resolution and strength of a mature being, capable of trampling all worldly things under her feet. What he did in a short time for the Magdalene, he does more slowly for the rest of us, in proportion to the effort we make to allow him to do his work in us. Let us not stop believing for a minute that God will reward us a hundredfold, even in this lifetime. Here's another metaphor that occurred to me. Since the divine favors more advanced practitioners receive are the same as those given to beginners, we could compare these favors to some common food that everyone eats. People who eat just a little are left with a good taste in their mouths for a short time. Those who eat more derive some nourishment from it. And the ones who eat abundantly draw life and strength. In fact, this last group eats the food of life so often and is so filled by it that no other food could possibly satisfy them. It is obvious to them how much good it is doing them. Their palates have so completely adapted to its sweetness that they would rather starve than eat anything else. Ordinary foods only detract from the exquisite taste this good food leaves in their mouths. Encounters with holy people are like this too. Such exchanges are far more beneficial when they occur over many days than when they last only one day. If our conversations are prolonged, we take on the qualities of our saintly companions, God willing. It all depends on what His Majesty wants and who He chooses to bless in what ways. The important thing is that anyone who begins to receive divine favors needs to make up her mind to detach herself from the world and cherish these blessings as they should be cherished. It seems to me 
that His Majesty is testing us to see if we truly love Him. First, He challenges this one, then that one. If our faith has faltered, He may reveal Himself with such sublime joy that it quickens our faith by offering us a glimpse of what is to come. Look, He says, this is only a drop in a vast sea of blessings. He leaves nothing undone for those He loves. Once he sees that they have accepted his gifts, he gives of himself without end. He loves all who love him. What a good beloved we have! What a good friend! O oh Lord of my soul, who has the language to explain when you give those who surrender to you? Who could ever express the terrible loss of the ones who attain this state only to lose it by holding on to themselves? I know that this is not your will, Lord. You prove this by visiting a dwelling as meager as mine. May you be blessed forever and ever. If you decide to share these teachings on prayer with other spiritual people, please, I beg you again, make sure that they really are spiritual people. If they are only familiar with one road or have gotten stuck halfway, they will not be able to understand what I am saying. God leads some people along a very exalted path right from the beginning. Then they think that everybody else should walk the same way, quieting the intellect, avoiding all forms and images. But by following these practices, some people end up as desiccated as dried-out husks. There are others who experience a taste of quietude and jump to the conclusion that they have achieved this on their own and can do it again whenever they want. Instead of evolving, these souls slide back. So, experience and discernment are always important. May the Beloved in His goodness grant us these qualities. Part 3. Visions and Voices Chapter 23 a new life. I'd like to return now to where I left off in the story of my life. I suppose I have digressed more than I should have, but that was only so that you would be able to grasp more easily what I'm about to reveal. From now on, this is another book of my life. The life I wrote about up to this point was my own. The one I have been living since I began to share the teachings on prayer is the life God has been living in me. This is how it seems to me, anyway. Otherwise, how could it be possible for so many bad habits and negative actions to have fallen away in such a short period of time? Praise the Lord who freed me from myself. Thus, when I finally became determined to avoid opportunities for error and devote myself to prayer, the Lord began to grant me His favors. It was as if all He wanted was for me to be willing to receive His gifts. His Majesty blessed me with the prayer of quiet on a regular basis and quite often gave me the prayer of union, which absorbed me for long periods of time. During those years, there was a movement spreading throughout Spain in which the devil was preying on certain women called Illuminists causing them to fall into serious spiritual delusions. I was terrified of this happening to me. But it's not as if I had any power to fend off the wondrous sweetness and delight I experienced in prayer. Besides, I was always left with this unshakable certainty that it came from God. When I observed that I emerged from these states strengthened and improved, it only confirmed my faith that they were real. But as soon as I became distracted, I grew afraid again. I wondered whether the spirit of evil was making me think that the experience was good. Maybe he wanted to suspend my intellect and deprive me of mental prayer precisely so that I would stop thinking about the passion of Christ or making use of my mind for spiritual purposes. I worried that I was losing instead of gaining. I did not understand contemplation at all. The more His Majesty shed His light on my soul, the greater grew my desire not to offend Him. 
my fear increased in proportion to my awareness of my vast debt to him. This anxiety intensified to such a degree that I was finally compelled to search for spiritual guidance to help me sort things out. I had heard about some Jesuits who had recently come to Avila, and I had always been very attracted to the Society of Jesus. I didn't know any of the members personally, but I was impressed by what I had been told about their way of life and the method of prayer they practiced. I did not consider myself worthy of speaking to them, however, or strong enough to follow their guidance. This made me even more anxious. Being who I was, how could I have a conversation with them? So I stalled for a while, struggling mightily within myself, shedding copious tears. I longed to consult a spiritual person and ask him to help me identify the states of prayer I was experiencing and to clarify things in case I was going astray. I resolved, again, to do all I could to avoid offending my God. I knew how weak I was, and my lack of fortitude scared me. I could not shake this fear. I procrastinated in reaching out to the Jesuits. God help me. What a terrible mistake it is to withdraw from good in the effort to become good. The spirit of evil seems to make himself especially troublesome when the virtues are just beginning to ripen. He knows that a sure cure for a troubled soul lies in consulting the friends of God, and he undermined my resolve to do this. I convinced myself that I was waiting until I had mended my ways, just as I had during that period when I abandoned prayer. I was so caught up in all my little bad habits that I didn't even see how bad they were. I may have spent the rest of my life finding ways to avoid reaching for a hand to pull me out of this quagmire if the Lord had not finally stretched out his own hand to me first. May he be blessed. When I noticed that my fear was escalating in proportion to the progress I was making in prayer, I couldn't figure out if my experience was very bad or very good. I understood that there was something supernatural about my prayer because I was not always capable of resisting these states, nor could I conjure them up whenever I wanted to. I thought to myself, all I can do is try to keep my conscience clean and avoid opportunities for missing the mark, even in small ways. I came to the conclusion that if the prayer came from the Spirit of God, I could only gain from the practice of purifying my conscience. Whereas, if the spirit of evil was responsible, my effort to make myself right with God certainly couldn't do me any harm. In fact, the spirit of evil would be the loser. And so, that's what I decided to do. But after a few days of striving and beseeching God to help me on my way, I realized that my soul lacked the strength to attain such perfection on my own. I still had some attachments. They were not so terrible in and of themselves, but they were enough to spoil everything. People were talking about a learned priest named Gaspar Daza in Avila. The Lord had begun to reveal this man's life of goodness and holiness to the world. I tried to make a connection with him through a mutual acquaintance, a saintly gentleman named Francisco de Salcedo, another citizen of our city. Don Francisco is a householder, but lives such an exemplary and virtuous life, and has such a prayerful and generous heart that his integrity radiates throughout the community. There is ample cause for Don Francisco's reputation for perfection. He has done many souls a tremendous amount of good. He has so many gifts that even his status as a married man cannot prevent him from using them. He is extremely intelligent and exceedingly kind to everyone. His conversation is never tedious, but always gentle and gracious, as well as honest and insightful. Everyone who talks with him feels delighted by the exchange. He directs all things toward the greater good of every single soul with whom he comes in contact. He seems to be entirely focused on doing whatever he possibly can to soothe and serve everyone he meets. It was through the diligent intervention of this blessed man that my soul was saved. I was in awe of his humility. 
I think he has been practicing prayer for almost forty years, maybe two or three years less than that, I'm not sure. He lives as perfect a life as his family state will allow. His wife is a great servant of God, charitable and angelic, so she does not hold him back in any way. In fact, God seems to have chosen her to be the companion of a man he knew would also be a great servant of his. Don Francisco and I happen to be distantly related. So Don Francisco arranged for that learned priest to come visit me. The two men were close friends. I was hoping to take this priest as my guide and confessor. When Don Francisco brought Father Daza in to speak with me, I was intimidated in the presence of such a holy man. I tried to tell him about my soul and my experiences in prayer, but he didn't want to hear my confession because he was too busy. Not long after that, Father Daza began to guide my soul with holy determination. He treated me as if I were much stronger than I was. And indeed, after the heights of prayer he knew I had experienced, I should have been strong enough to avoid offending God in any way whatsoever. When I saw how determined he was to get me to give up all those little flaws I was still caught by, I became deeply distressed. I did not have the courage or fortitude to transcend these things so immediately and so perfectly. I began to realize that his insistence that I die to all of my soul's attachments at once might be dangerous, and I decided to exercise more caution in our relationship. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I came to the conclusion that this priest's methods were not best suited to my soul. I could not make use of what he gave me because his gifts were appropriate for a more perfected soul. As for me, I may have been advanced in terms of the favors I had received from God, but I was a total beginner when it came to virtue and mortification. The truth is, if I had only had access to this one guide, my soul would never have flourished. When I saw that I could not do what he told me to do, I became so distressed that I nearly lost hope and gave up on everything. It amazes me sometimes to reflect that even though this priest had a special gift for beginning to lead souls on their path to God, it was not God's will for him to understand my soul and direct it accordingly. I'm starting to see that what happened was for my greater good, because it propelled me to get to know the holy Jesuits and call upon their wisdom. Around this time, I arranged with Don Francisco to come to the Incarnation and talk to me sometimes. His willingness to spend time with someone as wretched as I only confirmed his tremendous humility. He began to visit me and encourage me on my path. He told me that I shouldn't think I could give up all of my imperfections in one day. Little by little, he assured me God would do his work in me. He confided in me that he himself had been plagued for many years by all kinds of petty habits that he simply couldn't break. Oh, humility! What blessings you bring to those who possess you and also to those who come into contact with those who possess you. I truly believe I am right in referring to Don Francisco as a saint. Thus, for my benefit, this saint told me about his weaknesses or at least what his humility made him believe were weaknesses. In light of his station in life, these things were not imperfections at all. Because of my monastic vows, on the other hand, the same things would have constituted serious faults in me. I'm not telling you all this for nothing. It may seem like I am making a big deal of trivial things, but these things are of vital importance to a fledgling soul when she is first learning to fly. As they say, her feathers have not yet grown in and she needs all the help she can get. Still, I know that no one will believe what I'm saying unless he has been through it himself. It is only because I hope to God that you will help many souls that I even bother to mention it here. This holy man was my salvation. He seemed to know exactly what would heal me, and he had the charity, the humility, and the patience to stay with me even when he saw that I was not thoroughly rectifying my life. Gradually and with discretion, he showed me ways to conquer the spirit of evil. 
My love for him grew so strong that I looked forward to the days I saw him more than anything else, even though he did not come very often. When he went a long time without visiting me, I would worry that he was staying away because I was so wretched. As Don Francisco became more familiar with my extensive transgressions, he noticed a dramatic inconsistency between the favors God was bestowing on me and the imperfections of my character, even though I began to make some real improvement as our relationship unfolded. I told him about the experiences I had been having, hoping he could shed some light on them. These are states generally attained only by very advanced souls, he remarked. And you have convinced me that you are still impure. I am concerned that the only explanation for this discrepancy is that a bad spirit is responsible for some of your experiences. Although I cannot draw a definite conclusion about this. Still, he mused, everything you have told me about your prayer sounds very good. Our main problem, I think, was that I didn't know how to explain what I had been going through because God was only just beginning to give me some understanding of these states and I couldn't quite articulate it yet. Don Francisco's fears blended with the fear I was already feeling, and I became extremely distressed. I cried and cried. All I had ever wanted was to please my God. I could not persuade myself that the devil had anything to do with my sublime experiences. On the other hand, maybe my sins had made me so blind that I couldn't see the true source of these states. I started looking through books to see if I could learn some language to help me explain myself better. I found one called Ascent of the Mount. It gave a detailed description of the soul's union with the divine and matched my own experience perfectly. It said that in the midst of this state of prayer, all thinking ceases. That's just what I had been trying to say. When I enter into that place, I can no longer think of a thing. I marked the relevant passage and gave the book to Don Francisco. Please, Father, I asked him. Share this with Father Daza. Maybe between the two of you, you might be able to look it over and tell me what I should do. I will give up prayer altogether if that's what you think would be best. Why would I want to keep placing myself in harm's way? If I had made no progress after almost 20 years of practicing prayer and had only succeeded in getting myself ensnared by the devil, I might as well quit practicing. Yet the thought of giving it up made my heart unbearably heavy. I had already experienced what happened to my soul when I stopped practicing prayer. No matter which way I looked, I saw tribulation. I felt like a person caught in the middle of a river trying desperately to get back to the shore. Wherever he turns, he faces great danger. He's on the brink of drowning. This is a terrible trial, and I have suffered many like it, as you will soon see. Maybe it doesn't seem like an important issue to you, but it might be helpful in understanding how the spirit is tested. Spiritual directors need to be especially careful when they are dealing with women. We are more sensitive, and it can damage us to be told directly that the spirit of evil is the cause of our inner states. This can create terrible suffering. Yet women should seriously consider this opinion and turn away from any danger they may be facing. Also, they should be counseled to keep certain experiences a secret. Their spiritual guides should guard these women's secrets too. I am speaking from the perspective of one who has suffered a bitter trial in this respect. There are men with whom I have discussed my inner life who have not kept it secret. By checking my experiences with this one and the other one, they have done me great harm. They have spread private things about me that should have been kept private. These matters are not for everybody. And then they made it look as if I were the one who had broadcast these things. I believe it was not really their fault. I believe the Lord allowed this to happen to test me. I'm not saying, by the way that they disclosed things I had shared with them during confession. But these were men to whom I gave a full account of myself because I thought they might enlighten me. And instead, they betrayed me. They should have kept quiet. I never dared to conceal anything from these men. 
All I'm saying is that men should use more discretion in counseling women like me. They should encourage us, waiting patiently for the Lord to give them the help they need to help us. My excessive fear made me particularly vulnerable. If the Lord had not helped me, I would have been in big trouble. Given my weak heart, I'm astounded that more damage wasn't done to me. And so I handed Don Francisco a written account of my experiences in prayer and accompanied this with a verbal explanation. Since he was a layman, this was not a confession, of course. I simply made it clear how very wretched I was. Don Francisco shared all this with Father Daza, and the two men pondered with great charity and love what would be best for my soul. I waited for their answer with intense trepidation. I asked everyone I knew to pray for me during this time, and I prayed a lot for myself. Finally, one of the two men came to me and, with heart-wrenching anguish in his voice, informed me that they had come to the mutual conclusion that the source of my experiences was the devil. They advised me to consult the Jesuits. If I told them I was in trouble and asked them to come, they would certainly come. I was instructed to tell the Jesuits everything, all about my life and the states of prayer I had experienced. Offer a very frank confession, they said, so that the power of the sacrament may enlighten the confessor and he will be able to guide you correctly. They assured me that this order was very experienced in spiritual matters. Do whatever they tell you, they warned me, because your soul is in serious danger. This hurt me and alarmed me so severely that I didn't know what to do. All I could do was cry. I was sitting in the oratory in deep pain, wondering what would become of me. When I opened a book, the Lord must have placed it in my hands. I read the words of St. Paul, who assures us that God is very faithful, that he would never let those who love him be deceived by the devil. I found this profoundly consoling. I began to prepare for my general confession, writing down all the good things and the bad ones. I was trying to present the clearest account of my life I possibly could. I was determined not to leave out a single pertinent detail. I remember that after I had finished my account and read it over, I was struck by how much evil there was in it and how little good. I felt miserable. I was also deeply distressed that the members of my household would notice that such holy people as the Jesuits were coming to speak with me. By now, my own wickedness was a cause of terror, and I was afraid that unless I made a concerted effort to avoid any possible opportunity for error, things were only going to get worse for me. I made arrangements with both the gatekeeper and the sacristan of the Incarnation not to tell anyone about my special visitor. But it was no use. It turned out that when the Jesuit came to call for me, there was someone standing near the door, and she spread the news throughout the house. What fears and obstacles the spirit of evil places in the path of a soul who wants only to get to God. Father Diego de Cetina was a true servant of God and very wise. I knew he knew the language of the soul. After I had told him all about my states of prayer, he explained to me exactly what I was experiencing. He was very encouraging. These experiences definitely come from the Spirit of God, he assured me. But your prayer does not yet have a solid foundation. You need to return to your practice. You do not yet understand mortification. This was true. I wasn't even sure what the word meant. You should never give up prayer, but rather work very hard at it since God is granting you such special favors. Father de Cetina suggested that maybe God wanted to do good for many souls through me. He said other things like this, as if he had foreknowledge of all that God was going to do with me later. He pointed out that it would be a terrible mistake for me not to respond to the favors God was bestowing on me. His words impressed themselves into my heart. All in all, it felt to me like the Holy Spirit was speaking through him to heal me. His guidance was very humbling to me and seemed to transform me completely. What a marvelous thing it is to have your soul be understood by another soul. 
you should devote your daily meditations to a phase of the passion, Father de Cetina told me. For now, dwell exclusively on Christ's humanity and try to resist the experiences of recollection and bliss. Do not make any room for these altered states until I direct you otherwise. Father de Cetina left me comforted and reassured. The Lord helped us both to understand my situation and figure out the best path for me to take. I was determined not to stray from his guidance in the slightest degree. And I have maintained my resolve to this day. Praise be to the Lord who has given me the grace to obey my spiritual directors, even if I do not always do so perfectly. The Jesuits have always been my best guides. At this point, my soul turned a corner and began to make noticeable progress, as you will see. Chapter 24 Resisting the Gifts My confession to Father de Cetina soothed my soul. I felt prepared to do whatever it might take to reach God. Although my confessor did not pressure me in the slightest, I felt compelled to change many subtle habits. Father de Cetina did not seem to take these matters very seriously. He was far less concerned with technical details than he was with the love of God. But his emphasis on loving God inspired me all the more, because he gave me tremendous freedom and never coerced me. I spent almost two months trying with all my might to resist God's favors and gifts. The changes inside me began to show on the outside. The Lord was giving me the courage to endure things that people who knew me considered to be extreme. Even the sisters in my own house wondered if I was taking renunciation a little too far. Compared to the way I used to be, I can see why they were concerned. But compared to what I think my monastic vows truly require, these austerities fell short. By resisting God's gifts and favors, I gained something even better. Direct knowledge of God himself. I used to think that I had to be in solitude to receive the blessing of his presence in prayer. I would seclude myself and hardly dare to stir. Then I found out that solitude has nothing to do with it. The more I tried to distract myself, the more the Lord enfolded me in his sweetness. His glory seemed to surround me everywhere I went. There was nowhere to hide from his grace. My intense effort to repress these states was painful, but the Lord's desire to bless me and reveal himself to me overpowered my best intentions to resist. During those two months, he made his gifts and favors more dramatic than ever before, eradicating any last shred of doubt that I had the power to resist them. I renewed my love for Christ's sacred humanity. The foundation of my practice began to take shape, and the edifice of prayer settled into place. The austerities that my illnesses had prevented now became irresistible to me. The holy man who heard my confession speculated that maybe the reason God gave me such poor health was because I had not done enough penance, and so His Majesty had created some for me. Father de Sedina ordered me to do some austerities that made me exceedingly uncomfortable, but he assured me that they could do me no harm. I did everything he told me. It felt as if the Lord himself were telling me what to do. God gave this man the ability to direct my soul and gave me the ability to obey him. I became so sensitive that every time I began to offend God, even in the smallest way, I felt it in my soul. If I was holding on to some petty luxury or comfort, I could not recollect myself in prayer until I had given it up. I fervently prayed for the Lord to hold me in His hands. Now that He had connected me with His servants, I beseeched Him not to allow me to turn back. I felt that if I were to fall, it could damage the reputations of my spiritual guides. Around this time, Father Francis Borgia, who had once been the Duke of Gandia, came to Avila. He had given up all his worldly wealth and status to enter the Society of Jesus. 
Father de Cetina and the holy gentleman I've told you about, Don Francisco, arranged for me to speak with him. Father Borgia was renowned as a very advanced soul who had been given great gifts from God. He had sacrificed many things for God, and God had already repaid him even in this lifetime. Since I was making such dramatic progress in prayer, they thought it would be helpful for me to discuss these things with him. Well, after Father Borgia had listened to my account, he told me that my experiences definitely came from the Spirit of God. I see no reason for you to continue trying to push these gifts away, he said. I can see how this resistance has been an appropriate practice up to now, but it would be a mistake to continue it. The time has come to embrace all blessings. You should still begin each period of silent prayer by meditating on a phase of the Passion. But then, if the Lord transports your spirit, you must let Him take it. But you shouldn't try to make this flight of the Spirit happen on your own either. Since Father Borgia was so evolved, he knew the right medicine to give me and the advice that would be most useful. His counsel deeply consoled me. My friend, Don Francisco, was also very relieved to hear that my experiences came from God. This helped him to help me in many different areas. Right around this time, my confessor, Father de Cetina, was transferred away from Avila. I was heartbroken. I was convinced that I would never find another guide like him and that I was bound to slide right back into my wicked ways. It felt like my soul had been banished to the desert. I was inconsolable and filled with anxiety. I didn't know what to do with myself. A relative of mine arranged for me to go and stay with her for a while, which indirectly led to my finding a new Jesuit spiritual director. First, the Lord brought me into friendship with a young widow of a noble family named Doña Guzman de Ulloa. Doña Guzman was a devout practitioner of contemplative prayer and a very close friend of the Jesuits. I stayed at her house for many days, and she had me speak to her own confessor. Simply listening to the holiness of their conversation uplifted my soul. My new spiritual director, Father Juan de Pradenos, began to guide me toward greater perfection. Hold nothing back from God, he told me. Father Juan led me with great gentleness and skill. My soul was still very fragile. I was not strong enough to give up some of my friendships voluntarily. I didn't believe that I was offending God through these connections, but I was inordinately attached to them. It felt like it would be ungrateful for me to walk away from them. Pray about these relationships, Father Juan said. If you recite the Veni Creator, God will enlighten you about the best thing to do. One day, after I spent a long time in prayer begging the Beloved to help me please Him in every way, something happened that changed my life. I was just beginning the hymn when a rapture came upon me so suddenly that it almost carried me out of myself. It was the first time God had ever given me the gift of rapture, and it was so powerful that I could not possibly doubt what was happening. In the midst of it, I heard these words. From now on, I no longer want you to speak with human beings, but with angels. I was terrified. The transport was so intense, and the words resonated so deeply that I couldn't help but be afraid. Yet, once I adjusted to the novelty of the experience, the fear faded and I was filled with a sense of deep consolation. These words have been fulfilled. Since that day, the only people I have been able to form close bonds of friendship with are those I believe are loving God and trying to serve Him. If they're not, it's difficult for me to feel much affection for them or find any comfort in their presence. This has been something that is beyond my control. And it doesn't matter whether these people are old friends or even relatives. 